Lieber William Kentridge, lieber Dirk Luko, lieber Andreas Görgen, liebe Frau Kujo, meine sehr geehrten Damen und Herren, die große William Kentridge Retrospektive in den Deichtorhallen lässt uns in Abwesenheit des Künstlers und leider für lange, lange Zeit auch in Abwesenheit des Publikums das Atelier des südafrikanischen Künstlers betreten, das der Ausgangspunkt seiner Arbeit ist und, wenn man so will, ins Herz seines Denkens und äh, seines Nachspürens führt. Dieses Atelier bildet einen experimentellen Denkraum und damit das Zentrum der künstlerischen Tätigkeit von William Kentridge. Hier verschmilzt er Weltpolitik und Autobiografisches miteinander, lässt seine Bilder, seine Gedanken, seine Assoziationen entstehen, um uns Dinge erlebbar zu machen, die uns sonst vielleicht verschlossen bleiben würden. Kentrids Werk bewegt sich dabei stets im Spannungsfeld und im Dialog zwischen Magie und politischem Diskurs und knüpft daher an, an einen meiner Lieblingssätze von Theodor Adorno, der mal gesagt hat, dass Kunst Magie sei, befreit von der Lüge Wahrheit zu sein. Und so ist es mit Kentrids Werk oft auch. Die seine Werke kommen uns nach gerade magisch entgegen und lassen uns damit wahre Wahrheiten unseres Alltags, unseres Miteinanders erleben und spüren, ohne dass sie diesen Wahrheitsanspruch vor sich hertragen, sondern schlicht durch den Umweg der ästhetischen Zuspitzung, Positionierung und Spekulation uns Denk- und Möglichkeitsräume öffnen, die uns sonst vielleicht verschlossen bleiben mögen. Und es ist folgerichtig und hoch anerkennenswert, dass die Deichtorhallen jetzt in diesem hochkarätig besetzten internationalen Symposium versuchen, diesen Denkraum zu erweitern, um die Komplexität des künstlerischen Schaffens von William Kentridge aus unterschiedlichen Perspektiven zu durchdringen. Wie die Ausstellung eindrücklich zeigt, arbeitet Kentridge grundlegend interdisziplinär und nutzt fast alle Techniken und Genres. Und das Symposium, das äh, vor uns liegt, versucht das Gleiche. Auch es arbeitet interdisziplinär, nutzt fast alle diskursiven Techniken und Genres zwischen Kunst, Geschichte, Gesellschaft und Politik und soll Sichtweisen und Fragestellungen aus dem globalen Süden und dem globalen Norden zusammenbringen und soll damit einmal mehr deutlich machen, wie Kunst uns dazu inspirieren kann, uns mit wesentlichen Fragen unserer Zeit auseinanderzusetzen. Im Zentrum der Arbeiten von William Kentridge steht die wechselvolle Geschichte Südafrikas und damit verbunden auch die Folgen der Kolonisierung, die präzisiert analysiert und recherchiert werden in diesem Werk. Kentridge's Aufmerksamkeit gilt hier sowohl der kolonialen Unterdrückung der afrikanischen Bevölkerung als auch den sozialen und den politischen Verhältnissen der Postapartheid, geprägt von sozialen Ungerechtigkeiten, von Unterdrückung, von Flucht, von Vertreibung auf dem afrikanischen Kontinent. Er stellt immer wieder diese Allegorien der menschlichen Existenz und der Welt an sich in persönlichen und historischen Kontext. Und immer wieder stehen dabei die Beziehungen zwischen Europa und Afrika im Mittelpunkt und brechen unsere immer noch und immer zu häufig allzu eurozentristische Sichtweise auf diese Problematiken. Gerade deshalb passt übrigens diese Ausstellung auch so gut nach Hamburg. Denn Hamburg war als Hafenstadt über Jahrhunderte hinweg eine der einflussreichsten Kolonialmetropolen Europas. Hier arbeiteten Kaufleute eng wirtschaftlich mit den Metropolen entlang der Atlantikküste und den Handelszentren im Osten Europas zusammen. Mit der vormals zur Kolonialmacht Dänemark gehörenden Hafenstadt Altona und der Unterelbe-Region war Hamburg auch im transatlantischen Menschenhandel verstrickt. Die Hamburger Kolonialkaufmannschaft war es dann, die mit ihren Flottenpetitionen, wie es hieß, das Deutsche Reich dazu bewog, Kolonien zu gründen. Die Berliner Afrika-Konferenz 1884-1885, bei der hanseatische Kaufleute, Räder und Bankenkonsortien maßgeblich mitwirkten, war eine Initialzündung zur imperialistischen Aufteilung Afrikas unter den westlichen Kolonialmächten. Und es waren Hamburger Akteure, insbesondere aus Wirtschaft, aus Politik und aus Wissenschaft, daran beteiligt, ebenso wie an der Durchführung des Genozids an den Herero und Nama. Hamburg steht heute heute ganz besonders, in einer besonderen Verantwortung seine koloniale Geschichte selbstkritisch aufzuarbeiten. Das gehört aus meiner Sicht zu den wichtigsten erinnerungspolitischen Aufgaben unserer Zeit. Die historischen und die aktuellen Zusammenhänge gehören weiter erforscht und in die breite Gesellschaft vermittelt und immer wieder müssen wir uns dabei darum kümmern, Perspektiven zu brechen, herrschende Erzählungen von Geschichte zu erweitern, Perspektiven mit in diesen Diskurs aufzunehmen, um der Vielfalt der Welt, die sich auch in der Vielfalt unserer Stadtgesellschaft spiegelt, gerecht zu werden und aus dieser Vielfalt heraus ein gemeinsames Verständnis unserer Vergangenheit zu entwickeln, um dadurch eine gemeinsame Zukunft möglich zu machen. 
Ich bin froh, dass sich Hamburg nach langjährigem Engagement vieler verschiedener zivilgesellschaftlicher Gruppen, insbesondere der schwarzen Communities und der People of Color, bereits 2014 dazu entschlossen hat, sich seiner kolonialen Vergangenheit zu stellen, die in vielen Bereichen ihre Spuren hinterlassen hat und oft unterschwellig unser Denken immer noch beeinflusst. Aber spätestens seit der Debatte um das Humboldt-Forum in Berlin und um die Auseinandersetzung mit dem Umgang dazu, mit dem Umgang auch mit Zirkulation und Restitution von Kulturgütern aus kolonialen Kontexten, ist das Thema gesamtgesellschaftlich angekommen und dort gehört es hin. Ich bin dankbar, dass Andreas Görgen mit dabei ist, der auf der Bundesebene vieles in diesem Bereich angeschoben hat, viel auch mit den Ländern kooperiert und ich freue mich sehr, dass er zu diesen Perspektiven in seinem Grußwort sicherlich noch einiges mehr berichten kann, weil er wirklich einer derjenigen ist, die intensiv dabei helfen, die kulturelle Landschaft in Deutschland so mit den afrikanischen Akteurinnen und Akteuren zu vernetzen, dass dort gute Kooperationsbeziehungen entstehen können und hoffentlich ein Miteinander in der Aufarbeitung unserer Vergangenheit und auch ein Miteinander im Umgang mit dem kulturellen Erbe im Jetzt entstehen kann. In Hamburg arbeiten wir aktuell mit dem Beirat zur Dekolonisierung an einem entsprechenden Erinnerungskonzept, das die Aufarbeitung des Kolonialismus strategisch in der gesamtstädtischen Erinnerungskultur verantworten soll. Dieses Symposium ist ein wichtiger Beitrag in diesem Prozess, um unsere Auseinandersetzung mit unserem global verflochtenen kolonialen Erbe weiter zu vertiefen. Es steht im Zeichen des internationalen Dialogs, der für den Aufarbeitungsprozess aus meiner Sicht so essentiell ist. Und es lässt hoffentlich Komplexität und Widersprüche zu auf einem historisch gewachsenen Feld, das geprägt ist von Komplexität und Widersprüchlichkeit und das sich eindeutigen Zuordnungen entzieht und gerade deshalb so sehr unsere Aufmerksamkeit braucht. Ich möchte mich nochmal bedanken an dieser Stelle beim Auswärtigen Amt für die wirklich großzügige Unterstützung der Ausstellung und dieses Symposiums. Und ich wünsche Ihnen anregende Einsichten und inspirierende Diskussionen über politische Kunst, über Postkolonialismus, über Erinnerungsarbeit und manchmal auch schlicht über die Magie, die befreit ist von der Lüge, Wahrheit zu sein. Und das alles am Beispiel der wunderbaren Werke von William Kentridge, die Sie hoffentlich bald auch hier live in den Deichtorhallen erleben können. Sehr verehrter Herr Senator Brosta, sehr verehrte liebe Koyo Kuhu, sehr verehrter Herr Professor Luko, ich freue mich sehr, heute Abend bei Ihnen zu sein, obwohl ich nicht da bin, aber das geht uns allen ja wirklich dieser Tage so, dass wir versuchen, beieinander zu sein, auch wenn wir nicht da sein können, wo wir gerade sein wollen. Das war vor kurzer Zeit noch anders und so erinnere ich sehr gerne, liebe Koyo Kuhu, ein Dezemberabend im Jahr 2018, als ich zu Besuch war bei dir im Zeitsmocker und wir gemeinsam überlegten, wie wir denn die Museumskooperation zwischen Deutschland und afrikanischen Partnerinnen und Partnern verstärken können. Wir sprachen einige Zeit darüber und am Ende unserer Unterhaltung sagtest du, dass du keine Zeit mehr hättest. Aber vor allen Dingen sagtest du, dass sich ein Rundgang durch die neu gestalteten Ausstellungsflächen lohnen würde. Und sagte es mir, machte es mir eine Tür auf und sagte, ach, geh doch da mal rein, da ist gerade die Kentridge-Ausstellung. Und so kam es, dass ich mich in der Family and Friends Preview der Kentridge-Ausstellung wiederfand, die William Kentridge selbst geleitet hat. Ich danke dir nochmal an dieser Stelle sehr, sehr herzlich für dieses wunderbare Erlebnis. Aber vor allen Dingen danke ich dir, danke ich der Freien und Hansestadt Hamburg und natürlich dem Direktor der Deichtorhallen dafür, dass sie dieses Wagnis der Zusammenarbeit weitergetrieben haben. Dabei spielt eine ganz große Rolle, sehr verehrter Herr Senator Brosta, dass Sie in der Diskussion um die Auseinandersetzung mit der kolonialen Vergangenheit eine so wichtige Vorreiterrolle eingenommen haben. Ich erinnere noch sehr gut ein Kolloquium, im Frühjahr 2018 mit Ihnen gemeinsam, mit Achille Bembe und mit Frau Plankensteiner und zahlreichen Partnern aus Afrika. Ich darf an dieser Stelle an Ihre entscheidende Rolle erinnern bei der Ausarbeitung der ersten Eckpunkte zwischen Bund, Ländern und kommunalen Gebietskörperschaften zum Umgang mit Kulturgut aus kolonialem Kontext und natürlich an Ihre Unterstützung für das von Auswärtigen Amt, BKM und BMZ gemeinsam getragene Projekt einer Museumsagentur, die ja genau das verstetigen will, 
was Sie hier in exemplarischer Weise vormachen, nämlich eine Zusammenarbeit, die Zusammenarbeitsfähigkeit der deutschen Museen ebenso zu stärken wie in die Verantwortung für den Aufbau von kultureller Infrastruktur in anderen Ländern einzusteigen. Und ich danke Ihnen sehr, dass Sie es da an Unterstützung nicht mangeln lassen. An dieser Stelle, das sei erlaubt, möchte ich auch noch mal mich ganz, ganz herzlich bedanken bei Ihnen, Herrn Luko, denn mit dem, was Sie zusammen mit Koyokuru machen, tun Sie genau das, wohin sich unsere Museumsarbeit ja weiterentwickeln wird, nämlich Sie übertragen die kuratorische Verantwortung an Koyokuru und dadurch wird sich sicherlich auch Ihre Ausstellungshalle, wird sich Ihre Arbeit verändern und genau dieses gegenseitige Lernen zeigt ja, woran wir in den kommenden Jahren weiterarbeiten müssen nämlich an einem veränderten Verständnis davon, wie kulturelle Objekte ihre Agency, ihre Energie und Aura verbreiten können an unterschiedlichen Orten. Das ist eine gemeinsame Verantwortung. Und nochmals dieser gemeinsamen Verantwortung wollen wir uns annehmen. Ich darf an dieser Stelle und abschließend an die sehr fruchtbaren Diskussionen erinnern, die wir zurzeit mit Nigeria haben wo wir von der archäologischen Aufarbeitung über das gemeinsame Training der nächsten Museumsmanager bis hin zu einer Beteiligung am Aufbau eines Museums einen Weg gehen wollen, der weiter reicht als die Frage der Restitution von Objekten, der nämlich auf die gemeinsame Verantwortung von kultureller Infrastruktur hinweist. Und darauf freue ich mich sehr. Und jetzt freue ich mich in allererster Linie auf den Besuch, zunächst virtuell und hoffentlich später auch real, Ihrer Ausstellung. Vielen Dank. Good day, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Koyo Kuo. I'm the executive director and chief curator of Zeitz Mauka. Good morning, distinguished speakers. Dear Senator Brosta, dear friends, colleagues, and cooperation partners. Dear Professor Dirk Luko, dear Annette Siebert, and last but not least, dear friend, Dr. Andreas Görgen. It is my absolute honor to welcome you to this occasion and a moment created to reflect on the magic and power of the work of one of the most prolific and the most engaging artists of his generation. This is of course on the occasion of the run of uh, Why Should I Hesitate Putting Drawings to Work, the exhibition by the highly esteemed William Kendridge at Deichtohallen. We've been through a very difficult year and we continue to, to go through a very difficult time. At the end of 2019, Just six months after I joined the directorship of, uh, of Zeitz Moka, I had the pleasure to welcome two friends in, uh, in Cape Town. The first visit was Andreas Görgen, who visited in August 2019. And the second visit was uh, Professor Duk uh, Dirk Luko, who visit later that year. During that time, we have had the pleasure and the honor to host the biggest, the largest exhibition to date of William Kendridge. The COVID-19 pandemic came as a surprise. I mean, the effects of the pandemic and how it's continuing to play out on cultural institutions and particularly museums came at the, as a big surprise a year ago. At that time, Deichtel Holland and Zeitz Moka had already agreed to work together and to, work, to make the, the show, William Cambridge show available and possible in Hamburg. I really thank you very much for this, Dave Loco, for your tenacity and, uh, and for, your, for your support. I like to joke that I think that the only museum cooperation that took place in the midst of the pandemic at this scale for an exhibition of this scale and for an artist of this stature was the one between Zeitz Moka and Deichtohalle. 
Of course, I have no statistics and I have no figures to back that, but it's a nice idea to think about. We are really pleased to be able to co-host, as I said, the largest survey made to date. We are presented in this very important exhibition with highlights of William's 40 year career from 1976 to present, focusing mainly on his process and studio practice. The exhibition reflects on the manner in which history shapes contemporaneity and the future and cross examines the shifting hegemonies of power. William has often used South African history as an important starting point, but expands on this to highlight broader universal complexities. At this very symposium over the next two days that you'll be sitting together, to reflect, to think about the power, the politics, the engagement, the, the trauma, the, the sorrow, the, the joys of um, what William's practice translates and interprets out of his experience as a South African man. Over the years, Kendrick has spoken extensively about how in the studio one explores the agency of making and how drawing is like a navigational tool that helps us to make a way through the world and constructs ourselves, ourselves every day out of all the different impulses, memory, dreams, pressures that come to, and pressures that come to us. This way, the work is very much demystified and laid bare. I find it quite intriguing, this drawing, connecting, dismantling, referencing, and rewriting in order to probe into important historical questions and dismantle physical and psychological barriers, especially since this exhibition has come at the beginning of my tenure as executive director and chief curator at Zeit Smoker. At a moment where I am, I am deeply rethinking the very idea of an art museum on the continent and questioning the ways in which we as cultural producers, we as curators and, uh, and, uh, and staff of, uh, of this organization, and particularly in light of the seismic shift that the pandemic has brought in our sector, why, how can we continue our work in a completely changed environment, institutional environment? And I think this is where something that is really also perceivable, uh, perceivable in the work of, uh, of, uh, of William Kendridge is relationality. We are sitting here today because people relate. We are sitting here today because people work together. And we are sitting here today because those people will relate and work together and find intellectual, political, professional affinities, cultural workers, art producers, curators, museum directors, artists, exhibition managers, respect each other, work together, consider each other in order to make these kind of experience accessible and possible for the, for the audience and for the public at large. So, I am deeply uh, pleased and honored to bring Zeit Smoka, the museum cooperation between Zeit Smoka and Dieter Hallen to fruition to such an important exhibition like Why Should That Hesitate of William Kendridge between Cape Town and Hamburg. I am utterly sorry that this important, the, the timing is not propitious for me to be with you in Hamburg, 
but I'm convinced that this symposium will expand your knowledge and your love of, uh, of William Cambridge practice as much as this uh, exhibition really strengthened, advanced, and grounded the museum cooperation between Zeitz Mocha and, uh, and Dr. Hallen in Hamburg. Thank you very much for your attention. Lieber Senator Broster, lieber Herr Görgen, liebe Koyo Kuo, liebe Teilnehmerinnen und Teilnehmer des Symposiums, meine Damen und Herren, ich begrüße Sie ganz herzlich zum Symposium, das Werk von William Kentridge zwischen Magie und politischem Diskurs. Es wird aufgrund der Pandemie digital veranstaltet und ist ab dem 12. April 2021 über unsere Website abrufbar. Das Symposium findet im Rahmen der Ausstellung William Kentridge – Why Should I Hesitate? – Putting Drawings to Work statt die das Werk des südafrikanischen Künstlers, Filmemachers, Theater- und Opernregisseurs erstmals umfassend in Hamburg würdigt. Die in Kooperation mit dem Zeitz Moka of Contemporary Art Africa in Kapstadt präsentierte Schau bietet einen Überblick über das Gesamtwerk des Künstlers und stellt die bisher größte Präsentation seines Övers dar. Gezeigt werden 180 Arbeiten aus über 40 Jahren künstlerischer Produktion in den verschiedensten Medien, von Druckgrafik über Stop-Motion-Animationsfilme, Videoarbeiten, Skulpturen und Collagen, Tapisserien bis hin zu raumgreifenden Performance-, Theater- und Operninstallationen. Die Magie der Kunst von Wilhelm Kentrisch beruht darauf, dass sich all seine Werke auf einen Ursprung zurückführen lassen, den der Zeichnung. Jedes seiner Bilder ist zugleich eine Suche nach dem Bild. Die Drawings for Projection, kurze animierte Filme, die er von 1989 bis 2011 produzierte, machten ihn in den 1990er Jahren bekannt. Gezeichnete Spuren werden erstellt, ausradiert und wieder gezeichnet. Dadurch bringt Kentridge ein haptisches Element, etwas Warmes, Handgemachtes, ins technische Medium des Films. Dieses erhält plötzlich eine andere, ja fast physische Präsenz. So eröffnet sich ein Universum aus Kohlezeichnungen und Schattenrissen, ein Drama der Geschichte, in dem afrikanische Traditionen und europäische Avantgarde Vertrautes und Fremdartiges in einer einzigartigen künstlerischen Klimax verschmelzen. Zugleich spiegelt das Werk von Wilhelm Kentritt schonungslos die ganze Ambivalenz des kolonialen Erbes Südafrikas wider, im Spannungsfeld zwischen verheerender Apartheid, Staatspolitik, Industrialisierung und dem Niedergang lokaler kultureller Landschaften in Südafrika. Kentridge's Werk lädt dazu ein, darüber nachzudenken, wie tief das diskriminierende Kolonialsystem auch in der europäischen Geschichte verwurzelt ist. Angesichts der Bedeutung seines Övres ist die Halle für aktuelle Kunst der Deichtor in Hamburg mit ihren mehr als 3000 Quadratmetern Ausstellungsfläche der ideale Ort, um sein Werk mit einem speziell für diese Schau entworfenen Design von der Brüsseler Bühnenbildnerin Sabine Tollnissen entworfen zu präsentieren, und so ein breites Publikum in Deutschland anzusprechen. Im Rahmen des Symposiums, das vom Auswärtigen Amt der Bundesrepublik Deutschland gefördert wird, möchten wir die künstlerische Rolle, politische Dimension und poetische Kraft des Werkes von William Kentridge würdigen. Folgende Themenfelder sollen diskutiert werden. Wie wird das Werk von William Kentridge künstlerisch rezipiert und welchen Einfluss hat es auf eine jüngere Generation von KünstlerInnen? Des Weiteren wird die Aufarbeitung der Kolonialisierung Südafrikas maßgeblich berücksichtigt, insbesondere ja vor dem Hintergrund, wie erwähnt, der deutschen Kolonialgeschichte und der Verantwortung, die Hamburg als Hansestadt in dieser Hinsicht trägt. Wir betrachten das Melancholische und das Wandelbare im Werk von Wilhelm Kentridge und gehen auf die besondere Rolle der Musik in seinem Övre ein. Wir bieten Ihnen eine Führung durch die tiefbewegende, sinnliche und gesamtkunstwerkartige Ausstellung an, mit ihren Wendungen ins Surrealistische und Theatralische. Abschließend lädt William Kentridge uns nach Johannesburg in sein Studio zu einem Studio Walk ein, eine besondere Geste des Künstlers an sein Publikum. Das Symposium wird in deutscher und englischer Sprache die Panels ausschließlich in Englisch stattfinden. Für uns geht mit diesem Symposium ein großer Wunsch in Erfüllung, nämlich Werk und Wirkung der Kunst von William Kentridge in seiner Komplexität, persönlichen Anteilnahme und visionären Dimensionen zu beleuchten. An erster Stelle gilt mein Dank William Kentridge für die ausgesprochen engagierte und inspirierende Zusammenarbeit. Besonders danken möchte ich auch allen TeilnehmerInnen des Symposiums. 
Wir freuen uns sehr, mit den Panel-Teilnehmerinnen und Teilnehmern aus Europa und Afrika das Werk von Wilhelm Krentrich zum Ausgang lebhafter Betrachtungen und Debatten werden zu lassen. Für die großzügige finanzielle Förderung des Symposiums sowie der Kooperation zwischen Deichtorhallen und Zeitz Moka danke ich ganz besonders herzlich Andreas Görgen, dem Leiter der Abteilung Kultur und Kommunikation im Auswärtigen Amt, sowie Mario Sauda, dem stellvertretenden Referatsleiter für Kultur- und Medienbeziehungen, ebenfalls im Auswärtigen Amt. Desgleichen danke ich der Behörde für Kultur und Medien Hamburg, namentlich Kultursenator Carsten Broster, für die Bemühungen, Ausstellung und Symposium auch unter Corona-Bedingungen ermöglicht zu haben. Ich bedanke mich ebenso herzlich bei Koyo Kuo, Direktorin des Zeitz Moka, für die Möglichkeit, die Schau als Übernahme von Kapstadt nach Hamburg reisen zu lassen. Ganz besonders herzlich bedanke ich mich bei Annette Siewert, Ausstellungsmanagerin der Halle für Aktuelle Kunst und ihrer Assistentin Cosima Grosser für die hervorragende Zusammenarbeit bei der Konzeption, Textredaktion und intensiven Betreuung dieses digitalen Symposiums. Ebenso herzlich danke ich Stefan Köhler für die wissenschaftliche Beratung bei der Zusammenstellung der Teilnehmenden. Ich danke schließlich Dominik Nürenberg für die technische Umsetzung und Amin Motaleb Sadeh für die künstlerische Produktion des Symposiums. Ich freue mich jetzt, Sie gemeinsam mit meiner Kollegin Annette Siewert durch das Symposium zu führen und wünsche Ihnen eine interessante und spannende Konferenz. Hello, my name is Annette Sievert. I'm the exhibition manager at the Hall for Contemporary Art at the Deichterhallen. And I'm very pleased to welcome you to this first panel in the context of our comprehensive online symposium on William Kentridge. The significance of the political in the work of William Kentridge is the title of this panel. We have invited a group of artists and cultural workers from a younger generation to discuss the meaning of the Kentridge oeuvre in general and specifically for their own work. Participants are Tammy Langtry, she co-curated this exhibition at its original venue at the Zeit Smoka in Cape Town, and the three artists, Lindeka Campi, Robin Rode and Lerato Shadi, all of them from South Africa, with Robin and Lerato living in Berlin, Lindeka is based in Cape Town. The panel is moderated by Will Furtado, artist, freelance writer and deputy editor of Contemporary Ant, an online platform for reflecting and connecting ideas and discourses on contemporary and visual art, especially from South Africa. Due to technical reasons, Lynn Deka unfortunately could not join this panel, but she has sent a short keynote which is shown in the end of this panel. In his work, Kentridge consistently engages with historical, political and contemporary social issues. In this first panel of the symposium, participants discuss how Kentridge artistically represents this reappraisal of political issues. Another topic is to what extent Kentridge's oeuvre has been influential for a younger generation of artists as well as for their own artistic practice. The themes that are discussed are the body as site of political engagement, poetry and language, absurdity and playfulness as strategies to deal with the trauma of South African history. Another important question is if artistic practice in South Africa can be apolitical at all with the historical background of apartheid and the present situation where the society of the country is still the most unequal in the whole world. And now I hope you enjoy this inspiring discussion. Thank you so much, dear Will, for moderating this panel. Hello everyone and welcome to the first panel of the Digital Symposium about the work of Willem Kendridge. 
Between Magic and Political Discourse, organized by Daesh Tornhallen, Hamburg. My name is Wilfredo Furtado. I'm an artist, writer, and deputy editor of the art platform Contemporary And. And this panel will focus on the significance of the political work, of the political in the work of William Kentridge. The work of William Kentridge, Kentridge visualized for more than 40 years the social cultural effects of post-colonialism and apartheid from the perspective of his own country. Kentridge deals with topics such as social injustice, the history of South Africa, colonialism, family, refuge, and displacement in a wide variety of media. Much of his artistic practice always begins with drawing, which is the main medium and focus of the exhibition. In his work, Kentridge cons consistently engages with historical, political, and contemporary social issues. In this panel, we'll discuss how William Kentridge artistically represents this reappraisal of political issues and how his work connects with different generations of artists. I'm joined today by Taimi Langtry, Robin Road, and Lorato Shadi. Thank you all for participating and sharing your amazing practices with us. <clears throat> I will quickly um, read very brief biographies of um, which one of you first, starting with Tammy Langtree, who's a curator at, at Zeit Smoka in Cape Town. Um, working with artists in a team, they realize exhibitions which connect us more deeply with their worlds and make space for necessary conversations about ourselves and our collective history. She was also the co-curator of the Kentridge exhibition at Site Smoker before he traveled to Hamburg. Robin Road is a South African artist based in Berlin. He's a multidisciplinary artist who uses a variety of visual languages such as photography, performance, drawing, and sculpture to create narratives express, expressed through materials such as soap, charcoal, chalk, and paint. Coming of age in South Africa just after, just after the end of apartheid, Road was exposed to new forms of creative expression, not motivated by a political social agenda, but rather the spirit of the individual. And last but not least, Lerato Shadi is a Berlin-based South African artist whose work challenges common assumptions to critique Western notions of history and make visible that which is invisible or overlooked. Working across video performance installation and often employing repetitive processes she argues, she argues the importance of centering, not just including the marginalized body as main figure of narrative experience. By placing herself at the forefront of her work, Shadi deals with the, political, with the politics of cultural erasure and structural exclusion. The title of the exhibition in Hamburg is Why Should I Hesitate? Putting Drawings to Work. The practice of William Kentridge includes drawing, animation, tapestry, sound, music, poetry, dance, performance, opera, and so on. <laughs> <laughs> Almost everything. Uh, but many of you also work like this. Um, so what do you think is so particular about choosing, experimenting with, and combining different mediums when recreating histor historical narratives? And not necessarily just in one work, but also within the, the whole body of, of, of the work of one artist um, and your own practices, uh, including. Who goes first? Tammy, I'm curious what you, what you think, actually. Um, what is the importance of, repeat that, what is the importance of? What, what do you think is so particular about choosing um, the medium when um, recreating and telling or retelling historical narratives? Mm -hmm. So medium and historical narrative, like what, how do they work together and how do artists pick specific mediums to tell certain narratives or not? Like what is the, the relationship between the medium and, um, and the narrative? If I may, if I may just have a go, I think sometimes the narrative is what leads to the medium rather than the artist always having the medium uh, to lead into the narrative. So, so sometimes I think that um, the artistic expression comes from, from the narrative itself, 
within the narrative embodies the kind of medium already. So this is why I think William Kentridge is so uh, diverse because I mean, I think uh, William's, William's narratives are, qu are quite diverse and not always linked to South African history. Um, and I think because of that diversity of narrative, it extends itself into various mediums of art from film to live performance to opera pieces and so forth. So, yeah. But, but how would you say, Robin, that, um, that you mix, for instance, like performance and photography? Um, so you start with the <coughs> painting the mural first, and then you have um, extra like dancers, like engaging with the mural, and then you take a photograph of that. Like, why did you decide to have this particular process in telling like this story? Um, well, that came about through my own biography. It came through through uh, me first experimenting with uh, performance art while I was studying in Johannesburg. Um, and, that and that shift to performance, again, was, I think, uh, politically motivated because at the time of my, of my studies, um, I was very uh, ill-disciplined. I was really rejecting the, the notion of, of, of what the studio actually means um, in terms of that particular institution where I was studying. Um, I was one of the very few artists of color in that institution in Johannesburg. And I felt that it was very difficult for me to, to somehow fit into the, the programming of the, of, the, of the art school. So one of my, one of my ways of, of channeling my, my anxieties around identity and so forth was to uh, embrace, uh, you know, a kind of performance activity. And that usually took place outside, not inside the confines of the studio uh, of, the, of the institution itself. So I guess from that point of view, it was politically motivated for me to shift from the confines of the studio to a public space and then to embrace performance art at the time, which was not so much, it also came about from my own identity too, as someone who came from a, quite a gestural kind of community and a community that was very much engaging with different forms of narratives, a lot of humor and so forth, a lot of storytelling and so forth. And I felt that I could, I could somehow um, link all of these kind of narratives to, to aspects of art history. If I look at the performance art movements of the 1960s, for example, as a student, I remember looking at Dennis Oppenheim, for example, who placed his body in various kind of uh, um, moments of duress, and pressure and, and, and so forth, or the pieces of Vito Akanchi, we followed people around the city. And I felt, I felt that performance art in that context in that time was quite um, subversive. Um, so to embrace performance for me, it was quite a subversive act against the kind of dominant kind of institution. So that's basically how it, how it started and it just evolved from there to embracing lens-based lens media. And that came through beginning to realize that performance art needed to be documented. So the document then became important with its on video and then from video it went into, into photography because again, going back to my, my biography, I studied film very, very briefly in Johannesburg and my film school studies um, influenced my, 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 my photographic approach because I was always drawing the storyboards of the uh, student film directors and my job was a production design student. So I was drawing story, I was storyboarding the narrative of the student directors. And so, so I just took that process from my studies into my artistic practice. So it was a very organic shift uh, into all these various mediums. Um, rather than being overly conscious of all of it, it kind of just happened very naturally and very organically. And so if I... Would you, would you say that um, this mix of different mediums, like bringing different mediums together, has something to do with also like the history of uh, South Africa being so fraught and also like 
in a way like so so young that um, like that that's perhaps a way of like dealing with it that you have to break with some sort of like tradition and you, and you do it through you know different mediums bringing them together and like and breaking that also like tradition of just like using a painter just like just paints on a canvas and so on and so you come in and then you just use different things at the same time. Uh, I, I think it's um I don't think that everything is uh, is is politicized in that way. Mm -hmm. I think that. It's it's very it's very intuitive and it's um, and as I said it's it's the idea of the work of art leads itself towards a specific medium or a specific social activity uh, in the realization of the work of art um, and it's not always politicized. I'm also very much. Um, into aesthetics, you know, and I want to make seductive works and I have to figure out a way to navigate all of these mm -hmm. ideas. And, I, you know, I just also want to speak, um, you know, about William Kentridge here too, because, you know, with my last conversation with William Kentridge, um, you know, we were speaking about the idea of, of boredom and the idea of, of walking around the studio as like, a form of inspiration, not so much the political idea, but just this idea of progress of productive pro procrastination. So even when you are bored, you know that can lend itself to like a masterstroke of an idea. Um, so I think today I, I like to speak about those kind of points of points of view um, through my dialogue with William Kentridge, the dealing with absurdity, you know. How absurdity becomes a you know a starting point for a work of art, and, and not so much the framework of of, of, of a politicized. Uh, Tommy, you wanted to. Uh, yeah, sorry, um, Tommy, you wanted to add something. Uh, it's kind of gone adjacent now, but I, th I think I wanted to bring in the point of material memory or the memory in material, which I think Robin, you deal with when you talk to the wall, when you have a conversation with the wall sometimes, and Lerato maybe in different ways, the way you deal with language as a material, um, and less maybe about medium, but more about material memory. Um, I was just gonna bring that in as a point of conversation. Yeah, I think also what, um, I think Robin kind of laid it out really nicely, the idea of how, uh, almost that the material finds you. Um, and I think for me, because I've, I work with a lot of materials, it's the material finds me. Um, and um, as Robin and Tammy were talking and thinking about the material finding me, I was thinking, ooh, maybe it's also different for somebody who is a painter and then that's their material. It's not necessarily that the material finds them, that they, ha they, already, have, um, they already have that material. And to that, I also wanna add that for me, start working with performance also had to do with like an economic issue. It was super cheap because you really didn't need anything which is also working with wool. It was also very cheap. Uh, I could move it. I didn't need a, um, a big studio space for it. Um, and it's taken me a really long time to, I could even say that using neon was a challenge that I put to myself where I thought, if I had the budget, what would I do? Um, I remember seeing William Kentridge's works at Joburg Art Gallery, because he had a huge retrospective at JAG. I, I don't remember when. And funny enough, it's the same space that I saw Bernie Seals' um, Snow White in. I remember standing in that space going, oh my God, this is what's possible when you don't have limitations on your imagination, when you don't have budget limitations. And 
I think that was one of the first times where I thought, what could I do if, if I didn't have to worry about budget? If, and, and I think for me, that's what one of the things that there's been others, but one of the things that William Kentridge gave me was, was that it's like, what can you do if, or I could say that in that space at that time, it was the first time that I realized how my, my imagination and my art practice was really stunted by my budget. Mm -hmm. And it took yeah. me a long time to get to a point where um, I allowed myself to, I, I allowed myself to, to dream or imagine bigger than my budget. Yeah, Larati, you were saying that also because of the reasons you just um, um, explained. Um, you you did a lot of performances, and so you were obviously using your own presence, your own body, to create these performances. And um, putting oneself in the work is also something that William Kentridge does, um, as also Robin and many other artists, also in South Africa. Um, I think in South Africa we are, we just love we just love to put us. <laughs> Work. It's, it's, I don't know what it is, but uh, we yeah, have to claim the work, we have to be in the pieces. It's, it's, uh, it's a phenomenon, I think. It yes, is a, it is for a, sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, I I'm think for me, it has, it has more to do, for me anyway, I don't know about you, Robin, it has, it has a lot to do with, again, historical erasure or the idea that um, a lot of people that look like me had been erased and were not visible. and. I mentioned Bunny Seals, um, Snow White. It, it's, it was like super important to, to kind of have that physicality and that body be visible within that space. Absolutely. Or I have a Helen CBD here. Like that's a really important picture for me because she looks like a maid. She looks like my grandmother. And that's like really important to, to connect that that artistic excellence to, to a figure that looks like that. Oh, by the way, that's my great grandmother. So to connect this artistic excellence to this yeah. is very important for me. But and I would, would we say also that, of course, the, the, the political landscape of South Africa has almost not forced us, but it's, it's the strong, necessity for South African art almost to, 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 to have to, to engage with, that, with the notion of the body politic. It's very, very strong in a lot of work from Southern Africa, I would say. And maybe Tammy can, can, can maybe speak on that. I don't know if, you, if it's something that you also have observed, but South Africa is a very strong uh, 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 artistic uh, uh, influence of the body politic, you know, we, we quite a dominant theme for us. Absolutely. I mean, just as a thinking point uh, to this conversation, I, I wrote the question, can art be apolitical? Um, you know, can it afford to be? And especially the artists of the generation you're speaking to, Lerato, um, you know, William Kentridge, uh, Helen Sabidi, Dumile Feni, you know, is it possible for their work to be read apolitically? Um, but yeah, to your point, Robin, absolutely, the body politic, the body as the site of political engagement and questions and expectations. And then on the other hand, the erasure, the historical erasure of certain stories, oh, certain individuals. I mean, a lot of the um, provisionality in the way Kentridge approaches some of his work, I think, deals with questions of censorship, questions of how do you attend to history in that context and uh, in some way uh, make visible, in some way reconstruct, in some way um, recontextualize. Um, but yeah, I think the body politic performance and visibility um, is essential. I mean, working at Zeitsmoke at the moment, a lot of the exhibitions we're dealing with is multidisciplinary, but very much dealing with performance and the body. Um, yeah. We just recently put together Sinzeni Mahasela as well. We're working on Tracy Rose. So it's, it's this, this South African, I guess, canon, um, yeah. which, yeah, Kentridge 
uh, brings up very importantly. Um, if I if I well, if I can just add a bit, if I can add a little bit more to this idea of the body politic here, I think I hope you're following your questions in terms of me, the medium of the body and so forth. Um, but you know, also um, seeing William Kentridge in studio um, and the idea of the body being so so present in in his work, it's also very much the body is also very much an extension of drawing. For, for, for William Kentridge. And it comes, comes through very, again, very organically. It's not like something that's overly uh, thought of or, or, or is conscious of. It's just, it's just a natural thing for him to, to, to draw and to shift his body into the picture plane because the line requires that he does so. And, and this is what I really enjoy. This is... Uh, our connection too. It's just um, if you give myself a William Kent, it's just this idea of the, 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 the fundamentals of drawing and how drawing a line, making a mark is an extension of the body itself. So the body just naturally becomes part of the work. It's just an extension of the drawing field. And, and once uh, William does that, all the other political agendas follow him into the work of art, you know, it's something that just comes into it, but it's, he does it, he does it very, very organically. And it's quite, uh, yeah, it's quite uh, remarkable to see um, and, to, and to discuss, you know. I don't think you can even have a conversation without drawing, mm. you know. Um, I actually feel very lazy if I think too much about William Kentridge. Like I feel like because William is able to, to draw all the time. It's like, dude, like, don't you sleep? Like, how do you deal with jet lag? No, he works in the studio. It's like, dude, what do you do when you're like, I think like even like, he's probably doing any drawings right now. He's drawing right now. And why are you comparing yourself to William Kentridge? You know, no, he I'm not, I'm not miserably if he's comparing himself to you. No, no I'm, not, I'm, not comp I'm not comparing. I'm just speaking about how uh, drawing and the body and the output of it, it just happens very spontaneously and you can't even control it. Um, and when you do that, all these other histories and, and, and political ideas follow you into the work of art. Right. Would you say that drawing, for you at least, is a bit like um, automatic writing? Or how do you, how, how is your process of, of drawing and thinking? And also like thinking about- um, de Yeah, def definitely with me, uh, drawing is, is uh, is it definitely the root of my practice. Um, and I definitely have a lot of uh, constraints as well when it comes to drawing and especially with regards to scale. Um, so I hardly ever draw on small pieces of paper or, or, or I'm always needing to draw on larger scales. And this is why I probably embraced walls as my, as my canvas. Because um, I'm just really impatient when it comes to, to drawing on certain scale. And that's why I just, from a very early point, I just try to embrace large scale and uh, surfaces and walls as I just felt my, my mark making was a lot, felt a lot more freer. Um, so for sure, my work is, is centered on drawing. And then over the years, I began to look at how drawing can, can also, how different aspects of drawing can be investigated. Uh, can I make, can I, uh, with this idea, can I create a drawing that's more organic? Can it become more geometric inspired? Can it be a bit more mathematical? Can it, so I'm also trying to now investigate different aspects of what drawing can be. Can it also be um, a therapeutic exercise, drawing for you? Or? Absolutely, absolutely it is. And again, I just want to go again, uh, going back to William Kentridge and, and uh, this conversation we had about being isolated in, during COVID-19 and, and how making art in the studio becomes a, 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 an escapism tool or how drawing or working in the studio becomes a therapy, you know, for the, for the, for the mind and for the soul and so forth. 
So I, uh, yeah, I agree that yes, it is. It is an art making in general is quite, is very, very mm -hmm. pretty. This this idea of the um, therapeutic and the repetition, uh, and also like the poetic added to it, it's something that. Like for instance, like Lerato also engages with a lot in her in the, in the practice, especially like your your performances with the wall, like your durational performances, um, and there's also like a, a lot of poetry in 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 that. Um, what would you say is the role of poetry in telling well narratives, you know, historical, often also violent? Uh, what do you think is the role of poetry in in dealing with that story? Like as an artist? Um, I think for, I want to say for me, because for example, Robin and William um, use drawing a lot. You, you both draw. I constantly say I can't draw. This is the level of drawing <laughs> that I do. <laughs> <laughs> That's drawing. It's a beautiful drawing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's a masterpiece. Um, so, but poetry and and words and reading has been really influential in the or ideas has been really influential in the way that I make works, um, especially words of. Um, of black women, um, they've been, they've influenced a lot. Or their words and their ideas and the ability to articulate what I know, but I try to articulate with within my art making process. Because um, a lot of the times, I'm presenting works and I need to speak about it. And a lot of times I feel like, oh my God, now I, now I have to use words. Oh, uh, the people who, <laughs> the people who have, um, who have such a mastery at using words and they use it to a point where they are really articulate and specific. And every time they speak, it's about how to be more specific with their words. And for me, I feel that a lot of the times when I speak, it's about, oh God. So I have this idea, how do I make you get a sense of what it is where I'm at? So I feel as if my work is my poetry or my, my way of speaking. And I feel that that's where I'm most articulate because for me, I really get it. I get that, okay, these are the different layers that I'm working with. These are the different layers that are there. And if I try to speak about it, that times when I feel as if I speak, sometimes I speak about things in a way that, I speak about this in a way that closes off this. And I understand that there's a lot of people that are able to speak about this in a way that opens up this. Mm -hmm. So yeah, poetry has been. And how how do you make those decisions? Like what? How do you decide whether to use something that will close something else? And like what, what? And what do you decide? What's the more important thing? In in speaking or in making work? Um, in in making work, and and for instance, like using the words that you use in your works. Uh, sometimes I, I know they're very specific, like people's names, but uh, but not not always. And so, how do you how do you make these like these decisions, and like how do you make certain selections? Um, I I have a two prong process where sometimes there's I actually feel it. There is the gut decision, and then there is the head decision. So those um, those decisions are made within those two spaces. Um, yeah. So my gut also, um, for me, my gut has an intelligence that I don't always have the words to articulate where I, I think within my gut. For example, 
when Tammy was speaking about, um, when you were talking about the political of, of art, I, I was thinking and my gut had words. And later on as Robin was talking, I was thinking, ah, yeah, when, when you're asking, uh, can we make a political art? I thought, oh yeah, what I'm trying to say is also that it, it depends, you know, like when a black person makes an orange, it's a, it's a political orange. When a white person makes an orange, it's an apolitical um, orange. So I knew that when you were talking, but it took me a little while to be able to go, ah, maybe this would be a way to express that. Yeah. I hope that answered the question. <laughs> and, and Tammy, Tammy, is there anything else you could add with regards to how artists in South Africa use poetry to speak about, you know, historical um, narratives, particularly the, uh, the harder ones to tell? Uh, what could you tell us about poetry and difficult historical narratives uh, in the South African art scene? Well, I mean, I don't want to speak for the whole South African art scene, and I, I don't want to touch on what I think Lindeka would have contributed to this conversation. Um, and I also at some point want to go to Robin in this question, because I know there are poets, Don Matera, for example, who we can speak to. And so it's a sp particular generation, maybe, that has poetry that uh, there are canon of poets that we can call on and speak to in relation to a politics of South Africa. Um, I don't know as other generations of artists unfold where the poetry is at the center of that. I know there are some poets like Koleka Putuma who are trying to uncover um, maybe very difficult um, contexts around uh, being a woman in South Africa. But um, yeah, I would say writing and language is very important. And at this point, I saw a lot of artists dealing very in complicated ways with language. Um, which language, in what way, what is my memory to my own language? Um, this being an important element. So maybe not poetry specifically, but language, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I do think uh, that there is a, I don't wanna say generation, but this, uh, there are artists that are dealing with language in, in, a, in a really interesting and important and, and poignant way. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And when you were asking your question, well, I actually thought of Diana Furos, I've come to take you home, um, uh, which is a poem that's, um, that's credited as um, as bringing Sarah Badman back home. Um, sh should I give a context? Oh, no. <laughs> I'm, little... I'm talking as if we all know. <laughs> I'm not 100% sure. So yeah, a little bit of context, please. Um, Sarah, Sarah Badman's bones were overseas for, or remains were overseas for a really, really long time. And I think they were in France and the French would not, um, the South African government was having long conversations to try and um, repatriate her bones back home. And Diana Furos in a, uh, in a residency wrote this poem and it, it said that it's one of the poems that kind of moved the needle in, um, in convincing uh, uh, the Western powers that Sarah Badman needed to, um, to come home because what the poem did is, is humanized her in a way that um, she hadn't been humanized before. So it made her a person, a loved person. Yeah. And, and not a symbol. Thank you. We were speaking about language and and language is uh, is very much about what is said, but uh, also about what is what is not said. And there is this there is this line in um, Spivak's "Can the Subaltern Speak?" from 1985 um, that says that what is important in a work is is what it does not say. 
So it's not what he says, it's actually what he does not say. So what would you say um, that is perhaps not being said in the work of William Kentridge for multiple reasons, also because of the you know, historical reasons of perhaps things that he also could not have said, you know, like in the 70s and in the 80s. So what, what are some of the things that you could perhaps identify as um, things that are not being said for particular reasons? Um, if I may add a few points here, because uh, regarding William's work, right? Um, and this is just, you know, you know, one of the things that William spoke to me about um, was, was the idea of stupidity. And I think that as much as we can criticize or we start to size or philosophize about uh, the art that's being made or produced or being exhibited, um, what's not being said is how like stupidity actually becomes an inspiration for the work and how that's actually sometimes the backbone for, or, or, for a lot of what is being created in the studio. Mm -hmm. um, absurdity too, this, you know, he speaks a lot about the notion of the absurd to create uh, visuals that are, that are, you know, you know non-real. And that, or that becomes a kind of, that's, I think absurdity is probably, this is how I interpret your question in terms of what is not being said, what is not being said that the absurd is actually, you know, the kind of absurd that we're talking about here. It could be, it could be. Because and, you know, like he deals with a lot of. Okay, so the absurdity would be this idea of, of investigation, the, investigating the idea of animism, to animate an object, to when, you, when we, in animism, we would, we would make a dead object come alive. So the coffee, the coffee maker, the coffee machine, the artist an, animates it through, through projecting a life onto this dead object, therefore allowing the object to, 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 be, to be possessed, to, to develop a sexuality, for the, for the coffee maker to, then, to walk around or to become a, a protagonist in a narrative. You know, those ideas comes, to, you know, it's also his interrogation in, in, in the absurd. Um, and all these, all these things, you know, happen through, through just like procrastination. So I, I'm just, this is points of reference that I'm talking about since, from my last conversation with William and, and how, um, you know, language can be interrogated and it can be interrogated from places within ourselves that's, that's completely um, unconscious, you know, it comes through an unconscious impulse that leads to something that sometimes you can't always control. And uh, I think William's really good at channeling that, you know, kind of unconscious impulses and it leads to, to an investigation of language and and also going back to poetry, to the question of poetry. Because um, for me, too, poetry is a massive inspiration. Um, why also William, too, poetry is that you know, the words of poetry is very much to do with the imagination, uh, allowing the reader to imagine worlds that probably don't exist. Um, but more importantly, poetry embodies rhythm. And drawing requires a rhythm, too. Art making Processes of art requires a rhythmic impulse, uh, which I'm sure Lorato also experiences through curational performances or through, through repetitive performative actions. There's a rhythm to all of those kind of things, and there's a rhythm in words and in poetry too. So, um, what was it? Was I talking about? Was, was I? William is. I think I was. I think that's a wrap for me. Yes, it's like, <laughs> Is you know William well well enough? Have have you worked together before? Um, you know we have had conversations. We we try and have conversations. Um, we we have collaborated. Yes. Um, on uh, I did uh, William's uh, album. Okay. Uh, I did, 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 did a record with William. Um, he performed uh, a sonata by Kurt Schwitters from nineteen twenty three. 
And again, I mean, a sonata is a, is a deconstructive poem. Uh, in other words, words are, are senseless. So if I could sum up the form aspects of this poem, it's like, that's that's the poem and and again it's shows the poem again it's called a sonata mm -hmm. say it do it say the poem again. that's basically the poem. did you cut it short it's much longer yeah that's just the first five lines <laughs> <laughs> but again, it's, I, 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 you know, I'm here to put, I'm participating in the symposium because of all these ideas, these ideas of, of expressing the idea of the absurd and expressing the idea of language and how it can be deconstructed and where does those deconstructions lead us to politically? And I kind of like that, you know? And from a personal point of view with regards to poetry, um, yes, I've been working uh, 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 as a source material. I've been working up with with, um, with uh, a lot of uh, poets now who are in their late 70s or in the late 80s uh, who are somewhat political activists in South Africa. Um, I'm currently producing a body of, of abstract painting in my studio inspired by a book of poetry from 1985 called Fragments in the Sun by Iso Patel. Um, and I have a very personal connection to this book of poetry because my first art teacher, Clifford Charles, who's I think now living in London, um, he did the illustrations for this book um, back in 1985. So when I was given this book of poetry, uh, Fragments of the Sun, Don Matera, another South African poet, gave me this as a gift, only for me to discover that my first art teacher did the original drawings for this, for Issa Patel's Fragments in the Sun. And during COVID, really beginning of 2020, this book, Fragments in the Sun, has become my point of inspiration for my work in, in Berlin and in my studio, where I'm trying to engage with very brutal poems, like reflecting what South Africa was in 1985 uh, uh, and how interesting it is now that during, during this, in, Black Lives Matter uh, uh, movement in the United States and, and around the world, how, how a lot of these poems that dealt with trauma back in the 1980s somehow has a relation to what's happening right now in the world. And I think that's, that's where I think poetry is so interesting because we can relate to it through different aspects of time. Robin, um... The title of the exhibition uh, actually references um, the... Well, while you're doing that, I, I have a... Can I ask a question to Tommy? Yeah, of course. Um, I, we know that Robin has a, has a personal relationship with, um, with William and I don't have a personal relationship with William, but I've seen a lot of his work. And um, I'm not too sure how to ask this question or how to articulate it. So it's like you have probably had a lot of um, contact with William's work and you've spent a lot of time with the work uh, in the process of curating it and I'm trying to I'm trying to find what what did you find out about yourself or about the work or what has shifted in in your understanding or what has the work shifted um, within you as you've been working with it I'm not necessarily talking about just you or it could be you, it could be in terms of William's position in the art world and within South African, South African art world. And yeah, what has clarified? Well, um, I was lucky enough to go to a school that a high school where I learned art. Um, 
which I guess maybe for Will is a surprising thing, but in South Africa, it's not necessarily part of the curricula. Um, so I was lucky enough to go to a school that studied art and where I could study art. And um, so I was introduced to Kendridge's work at high school already. Um, it became part of, a, of a, an identity to, to art. Uh, Robin, your work, Lerato, your work. Uh, these became ways of finding myself or understanding myself as a post-apartheid kind of individual or generation. Um, so yeah, I, I think I've had a long uh, a relationship with your guys' practice um, and William back in high school. Um, and I think I had to try and find a South Africa in William's work and my South Africa in William's work. Um, mm -hmm. And that was a long process, but in working on this exhibition, it was incredibly amazing to go into an artist's archive to understand their relationship to our history as South Africans, um, our past, but most specifically because I had to look at the Felix in Exile series for like the millionth time in this exhibition. And I kept thinking about post memory you know, as a new generation, what, what do, how do I think about, or how do other generations think about our relationship to not just apartheid history, but violence and trauma, um, and how these things are generational, or how does generations kind of impact on each other to get to this point? So yeah, I, I thought a lot about post-memory, um, and I guess it does bring me to, to this, uh, the the necessary resuscitation of conversations of Black Lives Matter and what do institutions do and how do they um, how can they not how can they be apolitical can they be apolitical um, so I guess these are questions that I'm sitting in as kind of a younger generation working in an institution and and looking at the work um, historical positionality. I mean, Kendridge is very particular about the way he constructs um, art history and the way that we can look at ourselves as South Africans. But as Robin said earlier, how uh, there's a global context to the work that he makes and the way he interrogates history. Um, so yeah, it was, a, it was a lot. It was a very difficult process to go through, um, but a very engaging one. And yeah, I don't know if that answers your question at all. I think it does. It gives it gives me um, a feeling of um, of the kind of environment you were in, and I also, from what you're saying, I also understand that the questions that came up from working are not necessarily solved. It's a lot of um, it opened up uh, a lot because how do you solve ideas of post memory and uh, the position for how museums position themselves. So it sounds like it. You will probably look back on the experience and go, ah, this is how this. Um, look back on this experience and say this is how this experience has informed these these works that I've done. Yeah. So that's that's cool. And speaking of of memory, Tammy. Um, because you you know the the over William Kentridge so so well because of the exhibition, um, could you share with us um, perhaps some of the discussions that you had uh, from a curatorial point of view um, when it was decided that the show was going to well, travel first to to Germany and um, like what what kind of uh, points of discussions did you have and then what was important for you to deal with. Uh, with with uh, with such a specific work going to such a specific country like Germany. Um, so just to backtrack a little bit and say the the exhibition at Zeitz Mocha was envisioned in tandem with Novel Foundation. So there was already a kind of um, outline of what the curatorial framework would be, um, what elements were important for Zeitz Mocha 
in thinking about our large, our very small but big history, um, and then also thinking about the ways we're going to approach Kentridge's work. Um, we we did think about it in terms of drawing as the initiator, drawing as the protagonist, drawing as the inspiration for how the thought leads you. Where does the thought go? Um, and the simple gesture of sitting with a piece of paper, where can it, where can it lead you? Um, so that was really the inspiration and, and being able to start from, from like the 1970s uh, and working with a lot of local um, South African collectors and uh, longstanding supporters of Kentridge was amazing. Um, so for us, it was important to set up that uh, kind of more linear retrospective in the context of South Africa. Um, and, you know, for, for uh, teachers, school groups, um, this, this became interesting and important for them. We also um, kind of isolated and identified uh, the, the shadow, um, the procession and the shadow as an element of Kentridge's work that we wanted to spend more time with. So, so we had another floor dedicated to, to this um, and then as well as uh, looking at the video works, the drawings for projection series. So how do um, these static images become animated? How do they become um, larger than life? And how are these characters, uh, you know, portrayed? Uh, for Teichto Hallen, it was slightly different. The, the physical space is quite different. Um, they have a beautiful open area. So we were able to construct narratives slightly differently. Um, and uh, contextualize work slightly differently, which I, I, I enjoyed uh, working with, thinking it through it with Sabine Tiernison um, and William, obviously, and uh, the Daigto Holland team with Dirk and Annette. Um, that was really a, a great experience to imagine. Obviously difficult when you are online and just having to work through Zoom meetings and someone showing you um, Sabine had to hold her laptop in very awkward uh, angles to try and show us the floor plan and the dimensions uh, of various parts of the of the new layout. So um, with some difficulty, uh, but there were multiple conversations, as I might have mentioned before, of how do you translate something into another language? Um, uh, we were specific around writing text for different um, periods in William's work and so it was how does this idea translate to German which I think Robin mentioned earlier you know Kendridge's work is not new to being translated into different contexts and his work deals with such global uh, concepts and ideas and timelines that it's not impossible um, uh, but I, I like to think there were certain ideas that were very particular within a South African context that once you translate it into German uh, there just wasn't, and a net would phone con like you know what I don't know how to translate this word. I don't know what that what this means. Um, so some interesting obstacles, but I think Dirk was very particular about the context in Germany and and feeling that this exhibition would provide a lot of insight to um, the area, the community, um, not just about South Africa, but about global politics in a way, or global history and the way it's narrated. Um, yeah, I feel like I've spoken for a hundred years, but I, I think I that, that I think that's enough. also that's kind of you know the strength of William's work, and I it's interesting to observe to uh, uh, an artist that is actually you know trying to 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 reconcile with South African history sometimes forces you to look outside of your own geography, and William is very clear with that, you know. Um, and I think that's really interesting for me to, 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 to sometimes, how do we come reconcile with, with the politics of, of South Africa? We, it also helped to look outside and, and William would always look at Russian constructivism as a pure, as a, as a point of inspiration. Russian constructivism, Italian futurism, uh, the poem, poetry of Mayakovsky, you know, it's, it, it's all coming from outside to help him figure out what's happening inside. And I kind of like that too, that, you know, in order to understand the world within ourselves, we have to also go outside of ourselves and look at various other movements and 
and William has done it without shame. And that's really good because he then brings ideas back in and is able to then uh, uh, engage with that. And it leads to a different kind of exciting and interesting outcome. So yeah, that's just again, a point I wanted to bring back with regards to language and um, yeah. Yeah, coming, coming to terms with the uh, South African history seems to be um, something that William tries to engage with um, and, and that's something you see throughout the whole exhibition, um, particularly with uh, more sweetly played a dance um, in a sense that it, uh, with, it's, a, it's a very extensive seven panel um, installation project and projection uh, with um, yeah, with with, uh, with shadows and, and actors and, and sound. Well, it's it's a procession, um, which is very um, well. It's inspired by processions in 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 South Africa, and, and I don't think they are religious ones. I think they are uh, part of trade unions, if I'm not wrong. Um, but it's um, it's a, it's a beautiful, it's an amazing work. Um, and, uh, and it's very, it's very playful and, and playfulness is also very present throughout the whole um, exhibition. And playfulness, playfulness is also something that um, I see many artists in South Africa um, engaging with uh, Lerato um, in, your, in, your, in your exhibition at, at the Kindle. Uh, you had, um, well, which was uh, named after a song actually. And so, and you could hear the song in the exhibition as well. Um, which which makes you know it turns the turns the space uh, into something very playful despite being very serious, uh, and also with uh, with Robin's um, installations and performances, there's a lot of playfulness in how you play with other people as well. Um, and so to close, I'd like to speak about playfulness and the importance of it, uh, and also perhaps its connection with coming to terms with the history of or the, the recent history of South Africa. So could you, um, could each of you tell me a little bit more about playfulness, its role and importance in, in how you work and also um, in what you know from the uh, South African art scene? I, I don't know if you know how big that question is. Cause um, for example, we don't protest, we doi doi. Uh, when the cigarette ban was first put out, there was there was a viral thing about Zol, Zol um, that uh, that came out. There is there's a um, the there's a lot of times when when something is tragic, there's laughter and playfulness that comes out. So I think you you like instinctively. Put, put your finger on the pulse of something that you, you can't have known because you haven't really lived and experienced South Africa as we have, because playfulness does kind of permeate a lot of, of our experience, I think. And it, I think it also has to do with the history of apartheid. It has a lot to do with how we are number one in being the most unequal society in the world. So that sort of trauma and, 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 and how playfulness becomes a strategy at times of how to, of how to deal with that trauma. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's not surprising that that seeps into, into the art making process. Then that becomes, um, um, it be that seeping into the art make, making process becomes logical um, in a way, um, and then also becomes, for me anyway, more difficult to to speak about because it's not just a particular art making strategy. It is um, it is a a lived strategy. It is something that's been learned in how to deal with a certain environment, yeah. I can only agree with Lorato on that point that um, the playfulness inherited in, inherited in South African society comes from our traumatic history and sometimes you embrace 
humor and play as a as a coping mechanism uh, in 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 you know in tough or harsh political life circumstances. So it becomes a mode of escapism too. Um, you know, when you play, you don't always play with yourself. Sometimes you play with other kids, or other people. It becomes a kind of a social group formation of group identity tends to happen as well in this this notion of play. So yes, our our, our uh, political past has has somehow given birth to this very playful nature that's that's part of South African society. And yeah, I think sometimes human play is also a very interesting way to poke fun at various dominant uh, 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 structures. Um, and, and, and sometimes in, 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 in vague ways or in, in disguise, the ways humor and play becomes an interesting critique as well on, 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 on dominant structures and models and so forth. How so, carnival started, no? Excuse me? That's how, how carnival started in many places. Absolutely. So that's, so, you know, so human, human has a very strong root in South Africa in, in contemporary society for sure because of our, of our past. Tami, would you like to, anything, to say anything else? To Not me? necessarily. I think Lerato's gut was, was having chats with us on, on that response. And I can, I can completely agree. Um, I mean, in terms of politics, satire and humor is one of the strongest weapons against, against some kind of like violent rationality or violent assumption of the world. So yeah, I, I, I would just underline what they said. Then with that said, I'd like to thank you all so much for joining me and sharing with us your amazing practices in relation to the work of William Kentridge. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Lerato. Thank you, Tabby. Thank you, Lerato. Thank, thank you all. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Die Kunsthistorikerin und Kunstvermittlerin Stefanie Reimers nimmt uns auf eine kurze Tour durch die Ausstellung mit und liefert Ihnen Einblicke in das unerschöpflich vielfältige Werk von William Kentridge. Wir hoffen natürlich sehr, dass Sie vor dem Ende der Ausstellung, dem 1. August 2021, irgendwann doch wieder die Gelegenheit bekommen werden, die Deichtorhallen auch physisch zu besuchen. Jetzt aber erst einmal ganz viel Spaß mit der Online-Führung. Herzlich willkommen in den Deichtorhallen. Mein Name ist Stefanie Reimers und ich werde Sie jetzt durch die Ausstellung mit Werken von William Kentridge begleiten. Dieser Künstler William Kentridge ist 1955 geboren worden. Er studierte zunächst Politik und Afrikanistik, bevor er sich dann der Kunst zuwandte und später dann mit 25 Jahren 1980 nach Paris ging, um dort an der Theaterschule zu studieren. Und all diese Dinge, die ich gerade benannte, finden auch ein Eingang in das Werk von William Kentridge. Er taucht als Schauspieler, als Regisseur auf, als Zeichner, er stellt Animationsfilme her, also das ist das Spektrum, was uns gleich begegnen wird. Wo dem Betrachter gleich zu Beginn zwei Werke stark ins Auge fallen, auf der einen Zeichnung sieht man einen Mann, der einen Zeichenstift hält und gerade offensichtlich ein Selbstbildnis malt, denn ein zweiter Mensch hält ihm einen Spiegel vor. Dieses Werk heißt Domestic Scene, also die häusliche Szene oder aus einem Zyklus der häuslichen Szenen entnommen, wo William Kentridge sich beschäftigt mit dem Zusammentreffen von Schwarzen und Weißen im Apartheidsregime in Südafrika. Diese Begegnung findet im Haus statt. Der eine ist derjenige, der bedient, der andere ist der, der bedient wird. Und bezeichnenderweise ist dieses Werk aus Schuhcreme, dem Werkstoff der Dienenden, hergestellt. Daneben sieht man ein frühes Werk von Kentridge. Auf diesem Werk sieht man den Großvater des Künstlers, der eingewandert ist nach Südafrika, ein jüdischer Anwalt und zu seinen Füßen die Familie. Und eins der Kinder, was wir hier auf diesem Bild sehen können, ist der Vater von William Kentridge, Sidney Kentridge, der als anti apartheid in Südafrika sehr, sehr bekannt geworden ist, weil er unter anderem Nelson Mandela über viele Jahrzehnte vertreten hat. In den frühen Werken beschäftigt sich William Kentridge sehr, sehr stark mit dem Thema Apartheid. Das sind alles Arbeiten, die in den 80er, 90er Jahren entstanden sind. Frühe Zeichnung, aber auch Radierung, die wir in diesem Raum hier wahrnehmen können. Sehr auffällig in dieser Ausstellung sind auch die Einbauten aus nachwachsenden Rohstoffen wie beispielsweise Holz oder Kork, die natürlich in Absprache mit William Kentridge von der Bühnenbildnerin Sabine Teunissen entwickelt worden sind. Mit dieser Bühnenbildnerin arbeitet William Kentridge schon seit vielen Jahren zusammen. 
Wir gehen weiter durch die frühen Zeichnungen und kommen jetzt zu den Videoarbeiten, die hier in der Ausstellung zu finden sind. Die erste Videoinstallation, die der Betrachter hier sehen kann, ist eine Arbeit, die heißt Übü Tells the Truth aus dem Jahr 1997. Und wir sehen in einem Film, der besteht aus animierten Sequenzen und aus dokumentarischem Material, aber auch aus real nachgestellten Szenen durch Schauspieler. Wir sehen hier immer wieder den König Übü, der überlegt, ob er sich einer Wahrheitsfindungskommission hingeben soll. Dieser Film ist vor dem Hintergrund der Wahrheits- und Versöhnungskommission entstanden, die ab 1996 in Südafrika stattfanden, wo Menschen, die Gräuliches im Apartheidsregime erlebt hatten, Zeugnis ablegen konnten, Täter sowie auch Opfer sprachen vor dieser Kommission vor. Die nächste Videoarbeit, die der Betrachter sehen kann, ist eine Arbeit aus dem Jahr 2008. Brief heißt diese Arbeit. Wir sehen schwarze Papierschnipsel, die an Asche erinnern, die sich zu Bildern zusammenlegen und von, dem, von der Hand des Künstlers immer wieder durcheinander gewirbelt werden und sich wieder zu neuen Bildern zusammenlegen. Und dieser achtminütige Film wurde gezeigt in, der, in dem Konzerthaus La Fenice in Venedig, wenn das Orchester die Instrumente stimmte. Im selben Raum befindet sich auch eine große Zeichnung. Auf dieser Zeichnung sehen wir die Weltkugel mit einer Gasmaske, wo sich der Künstler mit der Kolonialisierung Afrikas beschäftigt und der Tatsache, dass die Truppen Mussolinis, die italienischen Truppen, dort Giftgas einsetzten. Die Videoinstallation, die wir nun betrachten können, stammt aus dem Jahr 2007 und heißt What will come has already come. Wir sehen eine Projektion auf einen runden Tisch, die uns verzerrt erscheint und in der Mitte dieses Tisches befindet sich ein Zylinderspiegel, der die animierten Szenen in eine Form bringt, sodass wir sie mit der visuellen Wirklichkeit in Verbindung bringen können. Wir sehen in diesem Film Gasmasken, wir sehen Menschen auf der Flucht, wir sehen Menschen, die angeschossen werden, Bomben, die fallen. Hier beschäftigt sich William Kettridge in einer assoziativen Weise mit der Kolonialgeschichte Italiens mit der Geschichte Äthiopiens, Abyssiniens beispielsweise und mit der Tatsache, dass Italiener oder dass Mussolini Giftgas in Afrika eingesetzt hat. Daneben ist zu finden eine Videoarbeit, die heißt Secondhand Reading. Dort sehen wir Zeichnungen, die in einen alten Wörterbuch eingezeichnet worden sind. Das Ganze ist eigentlich ein Daumenkino, was viel zu dick ist, um es so durchzublättern, weswegen William Kentridge also die einzelnen Seiten durchfotografiert hat, sodass eine laufende Bewegung zustande kommt. Und wir sehen dort immer wieder den Künstler selbst in einem weißen Hemd und einer schwarzen Hose, wie er ja, nachdenkend durch sein Atelier geht und wandert. 
Wir kommen jetzt ins Studio von William Kentridge, das in Anlehnung an das Atelier des Künstlers gestaltet worden ist. Hier werden die Werkprozesse gezeigt und offengelegt. An den Wänden beispielsweise Zeichnungen, die für die Animationsfilme von William Kentridge von Bedeutung sind. Unter anderem sehen wir hier auch ein Modell der Deichtorhallen. Nach diesem Modell ist die Ausstellung in den Deichtorhallen von William Kentridge eingerichtet worden. In diesem Raum gibt es eine ganze Reihe von Werken, die sich mit dem Thema der oberflächlichen Täuschung beschäftigen. Zum Beispiel die drei Schwestern, die so aussehen wie Bildnisbüsten, die aus Pappe hergestellt worden sind. Bei genauerer Betrachtung oder bei einem Anklopfen an diese Skulpturen stellen wir fest, es handelt sich um Bronzeskulpturen, also genau um das Gegenteil dessen, was wir vermutet haben. Und es gibt in diesem Raum auch eine ganze Reihe von Stereoskopen, die aufgestellt worden sind. Das sind Maschinen, die ein zweidimensionales Bild durch einen bestimmten Sehvorgang zu einem dreidimensionalen Bild werden lassen, was aber in der Realität hier nicht vorhanden ist. Wir gehen jetzt weiter in einen Raum. Die Arbeit, die wir hier sehen können, heißt More Sweetly Play the Dance und stammt aus dem Jahr 2015. Prozession von Menschen an uns vorbeiziehen. Wir sehen Priester und Musiker, die an eine religiöse Prozession erinnern oder an einen Festumzug. Wir können aber auch Elemente erkennen, die an eine politische Demonstration erinnern, wie beispielsweise Menschen, die Fahnen schwenken oder die politisch ihre Meinung offensichtlich zum Ausdruck bringen. Das Ganze erinnert aber auch stark an einen Totentanz, denn wir sehen tanzende Skelette. Der Totentanz ist ja ein Phänomen in der europäischen Kunst, was nach der Pestepidemie in den Kirchen beispielsweise auftauchte. Und wir sehen viele Menschen, die ihr Hab und Gut auf den Köpfen transportieren, was an Flüchtlingsströme, an Geflüchtete erinnern kann, die sich durch dieses Bild hier hindurchziehen. Also ein immerwährender Strom der Geschichte, der hier an uns vorbeizieht. In der Arbeit sehen wir immer wieder Schattenrisse und das erinnert sehr, sehr stark an das Höhlengleichnis von Platon. Das ist ein Vergleich, der sich auch in der Ausstellung immer wieder aufdrängt. Platon beschreibt den Menschen als in einer Höhle sitzend und das, was er wahrnimmt, sind nur zweidimensionale Schatten auf einer Wand. Wenn einer dann aber ans Licht dringt und versteht, wie die Dinge wirklich aussehen und sind und er in die Höhle zurückkehrt und sich erklärt, dann verlachen ihn die anderen, weil sie sagen, wir sehen doch die Welt, ja, das sind diese Schatten. Und diese Suche nach Wahrheit, das ist etwas, was in der Arbeit von William Kentridge überall immer wieder vorkommt, durch das Höhlengleichnis, durch Verweise auf das Höhlengleichnis, aber auch durch Apparate, die eine Täuschung hervorrufen, wie Zerspiegel oder Stereoskope. Und ganz wichtig ist natürlich dabei auch, immer wieder dem Betrachter zu zeigen, wie arbeite ich, wie gehe ich vor um diese Täuschungen, die in der Kunst vorhanden sind, dann auch sichtbar zu machen. Im nächsten Raum sehen wir eine Arbeit, die hat William Kentridge im Jahre 2016 realisiert. Triumphs and Lemons heißt diese Arbeit, also die Triumphe und Klagen. Ursprünglich 
bezeichnete dieser Titel eine Wand am Tiber mit einer Länge von einem halben Kilometer. Und hier hat William Kentridge verschiedene Stationen der italienischen Geschichte, von der Gründung Roms bis zu den Flüchtenden, die versuchen, Lampedusa im Süden von Italien zu erreichen, dargestellt. Hier in diesem Raum sehen wir sehr große Holzschnitte, sehr beeindruckende Holzschnitte. Auf einem Tisch davor sehen wir die Druckplatten, die für diese Holzschnitte nötig gewesen sind, um sie herzustellen. Zeichnungen, die die Anordnung der einzelnen Elemente wiedergeben. Und wir erkennen, dass diese Holzschnitte aus über 20 Teilen zusammengesetzt sind und nur mit sehr kleinen Heftzwecken befestigt worden sind, sodass man das Gefühl hat, man könnte die Reihenfolge oder die Anordnung der Bilder nachträglich noch etwas verändern. Wir gehen in den nächsten Raum. In diesem Raum sehen wir einen Film, eine Installation, Kaboom. Und in diesem Film sehen wir beispielsweise Menschen, die Gegenstände an uns vorbeitragen, die an den Ersten Weltkrieg erinnern, wie beispielsweise Gasmasken, Schiffe, Flugzeuge, Kanonen, Särge. Und in dieser Arbeit beschäftigt sich William Kentridge mit Afrika im Ersten Weltkrieg, da es vielen Europäern überhaupt nicht bewusst ist, dass im Ersten Weltkrieg zwei Millionen Afrikaner ja, für die europäischen Mächte kämpften und allein in Ostafrika eine Million Menschen durch diesen Weltkrieg den Tod gefunden haben. Der Ausstellungstitel Why Should I Hesitate bezieht sich auf den Ersten Weltkrieg. Und zwar ist ein afrikanischer Söldnersoldat gefragt worden, warum nehmen sie an diesen Kampfhandlungen teil? Und er antwortete, why should I hesitate? Warum sollte ich zögern? Denn ich bekomme zum einen Geld und zum anderen erwarte ich durch diesen Ersten Weltkrieg etwas für meine eigenen Menschenrechte tun zu können. In diesem Raum sehen wir riesengroße Wandteppiche, Tapisserien, die 2001 bis 2007 entstanden sind. Wir sehen schattenrissartige Menschen, die alle etwas transportieren, was uns daran erinnert, dass bis heute die meisten Waren tatsächlich zu Fuß transportiert werden. Und diese Menschen sind abgebildet vor alten europäischen Landkarten aus dem 19. Jahrhundert. Diese Videoinstallation beschäftigt sich mit dem Politiker Leo Trotzki. Die Arbeit heißt O oh Sentimental Machine und es geht um eine Äußerung von Leo Trotzki. Leo Trotzki sagte, der Mensch ist nichts anderes als eine sentimentale Maschine. Also programmierbar, aber am Ende kommt ihm dann doch immer das Gefühl dazwischen. Der Politiker Trotzki befand sich Ende der 20er, Anfang der 30er Jahre in der Türkei im Exil. Und William Kentridge hat hier eine Hotellobby nachgebaut, die an ein Hotel erinnert. In diesem Hotel hatte William Kentridge zur Istanbul Biennale dieses Werk das erste Mal gezeigt. Wir kommen jetzt in den Lesesaal, in den Reading Room. Alles in diesem Raum, die Teppiche, die Regaleinbauten, die Bilder, die Lampen, die Tische, erinnert an die gute alte Zeit. Wenn wir uns aber die Welt um 1900 angucken, aus der diese Referenzen ja stammen, kann man sagen, das ist eine Zeit voller Brutalität gewesen, wenn man an den Kolonialismus oder auch an die Arbeitsbedingungen der Menschen in Fabriken denkt, dass diese Menschen vermutlich nicht von einer guten alten Zeit sprechen würden. Die 
die nächste Arbeit heißt Notes Towards a Model Opera und hier bezieht sich William Kentridge aufgrund des Titels und auch aufgrund verschiedener Passagen, die hier auftauchen, auf die Modelloper, die Ende der 60er, Anfang der 70er Jahre entstand, aufgeführt worden ist infolge der Kulturrevolution in China. Und hier geht es um das Thema Kolonialismus, diesmal in Bezug China-Afrika, das Verhältnis von China und Afrika, das wird in dieser Videoinstallation beleuchtet. Der letzte Raum der Ausstellung heißt Drawings for Projection und hier sind eine ganze Reihe von Filmen von William Kentridge zu sehen, aus beispielsweise auch den 90er Jahren in seiner ganz besonderen Animationstechnik, wo William Kentridge also nicht 24 Bilder pro Sekunde neu zeichnet, sondern in seinen Kohlezeichnungen jeweils Teile verwischt und ausradiert und neu einzeichnet, sodass sozusagen die Vergangenheit, der vorherige Zustand in diesen Animationsfilmen über die ausradierte und verwischte Zeichnung nach wie vor erkennbar ist. Dabei sind auch Werke wie zum Beispiel Felix in Exile, die auf der Documenta in Kassel aufgeführt worden sind. Wir konnten das vielfältige Werk von William Kentridge hier in der Ausstellung kennenlernen, seine verschiedenen technischen Ausdrucksmöglichkeiten von der Zeichnung, Radierung bis hin zur Videoinstallation. Wir haben ihn als Schauspieler erlebt, andere Schauspieler, animierte Filme, dokumentarisches Material, was er in seine Installation mit einfließen lässt, bis hin zu Tapisserien, bis hin zu Wandteppichen. Und das große Themenspektrum von William Kentridge konnten wir kennenlernen. Die sozialen Ungerechtigkeiten, Kolonialisierungen, dann natürlich die Apartheid, die eine große Rolle in seinem Werk spielt, bis hin zu den totalitären Regimen, mit denen er sich beschäftigt. I'm very pleased to welcome you to our second panel titled Possibilities to Overcome Colonial Continuities. Taking William Kentridge's socially, politically and historically committed work as a starting point, we have invited five important thinkers and cultural workers to this panel. The artist George Adriakbo from Contunu, Benin and Hamburg, the journalist, activist and founder of the initiative Decoloniale, Nadja Ofuate Al-Azhar from Munich, the art historian Nina Möntmann, professor of art theory at the University of Cologne, my dear colleague Barbara Plankensteiner, director of the Mark Museum am Rotenbaum Kulturen und Künste der Welt here in Hamburg, and the historian Nick Shepard, associate professor of archaeology and heritage studies at Aarhus University. They work either from African or European backgrounds. We asked them to state their point of view on the process of decolonization of society today, specifically within the field of cultural production. Global anti-racist political and social movements such as Black Lives Matter or Roots Must Fall have ignited an overall social dynamic. Thus, questions of the decolonization of cultural institutions have moved into the very center of political discourse. Projects of provenance research, restitutions of objects from colonial contexts, and cooperations between African and European museums are only a few of the many aspects in the search for a new ethics of humanity and culture. What challenges do these developments pose for the fields of international contemporary art and curatorial practice? How can new perspectives be initiated and progressive social structures be created as new platforms for human experience and cultural exchange? How can cultural institutions develop and organize practice-based work in ways that form a dynamic exchange with civil society?
The panel is introduced and moderated by Cape Town-based historian Siraj Rasul, senior professor of history at the University of the Western Cape, where he also teaches museum and heritage studies. He has previously chaired the scientific committee of the International Council of African Museums. Siraj Rasul has published widely in the fields of political biography, museum and heritage studies, memory politics and visual history. Among many other publications, he has co-edited The Politics of Heritage in Africa, Economies, Histories and Infrastructures, and is co-author of Unsettled History, Making South African Public Pasts. Thank you so much, Siraj, for moderating this event. Now, I wish you an interesting time listening to the five keynotes of our participants on this panel. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this conversation, to this panel discussion um, on what is a very interesting occasion of this exhibition by William Kentridge uh, in Hamburg, unfortunately under conditions of lockdown, um, an exhibition that I was fortunate to see in some form in Cape Town in uh, which was probably 2019. Uh, why should I hesitate? Uh, putting drawings to work. Um, interestingly conceived and organized by Zeitz Mocha, Museum of Contemporary African Art in Cape Town, a very interesting new kind of museum in a city such as Cape Town. An exhibition that focuses on drawing, but always in relation to a multimedia artistic practice involving film, montage, sculpture, installation, the puppetry arts, opera, theater. Uh, and over some decades, as all of you will know very well, Kentridge's work has dealt with such questions as uh, mining, labor, exploitation, capital, uh, family, colonialism, displacement, more recently time and a large project on phonography and sound recordings of prisoners uh, from camps in uh, Germany during World War I. Um, his work has always been, I suppose, socially committed, uh, politically committed, but speaking about politics, not in the narrow sense, in the wider sense in which he addresses uh, a number of wider social questions. Um, he's also committed to addressing questions about the politics of knowledge, as we see in his recently created Center for the Less Good Idea. His work takes place at the intersection of public museums and shows, commercial galleries, art fairs, and private museums that do public work. Um, this is work that is socially committed. Uh, this is a, a, a socially committed uh, practice uh, that is conducted through, through artwork. And it is, it is enormously opportune and appropriate that we hold this discussion today, which takes place at a time of tremendous upheaval, introspection, repositioning by many museums in Germany and elsewhere in Europe. In spite of the relentless formation of the Humboldt Forum, almost out of time and in a world of its own, museums have been seeking ways of confronting colonial legacies. Some think that those legacies are in the past with colonialism seen as a period that ended and which left collect and which somehow left collections as legacies, while others have pointed to the enduring nature of the colonial in knowledge systems, in disciplinary arrangements, but also in forced migration and in the politics of Europe's border. This is a time of different and even contested strategies of provenance research into violent pasts, of embarking upon international partnerships for sharing, 
the digitization of collections, and elsewhere also of preparing for real restitution. These museum contests also take place in relation to wider anti-racist struggles in Europe and North America, hashtag Black Lives Matter, hashtag Roads Must Fall, uh, struggles that have involved the toppling of, uh, of monuments that celebrate owners of enslaved people. But also these happen at a time of the rise of neo-fascism and of renewed efforts by, by states such as in the UK to label all of these efforts at transformation as cancel culture. I have already put a series of questions to you. Uh, what are the meanings and the legacies of the colonial? How is it possible to challenge and even overturn the legacies of colonialism? And how can one do this through museum partnerships and digitization, through collecting, art making and exhibitions, um, through filmmaking and anti-racist work in a European society marked by overlapping racisms through NGO work, through new museum strategies of decentering, through multi-sided committed scholarship and scholar activism in Europe and in Africa. We have such an interesting uh, assembled panel who are going to talk about these issues with us. I will introduce each one of them very briefly. Um, each one of them is qualified in their own way to talk about these issues and has been involved in addressing these questions through their work. George Adeyagbo is a Benonese sculptor known for his work with found objects. From Cotonou, Adeyagbo studied law originally in Abidjan before moving to France to continue his studies. He returned to Benin in 1971 and began creating installations and environments. And since the 1990s, he has held exhibitions in many places and has received a number of prizes, such as the Prize of Honor at the Venice Biennale in 1999. Adeyagbo gathers the material for his art wherever he travels and thinks of his method of work, of assembling and arranging objects and artifacts as in some ways archeological, he also addresses larger questions as well of the placement of African art, questions of colonialism. Today, he lives and works, it see, I think, between Cotonou and Hamburg. And he is excellently placed to talk to us. So basically, and because we are trend, I'm, George uh, will make his statements in French and I will translate little by little. So uh, we started to discuss actually on the question of uh, restitutions about uh, est-ce que les œuvres d'art prises par des missionnaires, des colonisateurs qui sont dans le musée de l'Europe doivent être retournées à leur origine? Comment ça va? Hein? C'est-à-dire, c'est-à-dire aujourd'hui, mais quand on parle de la restitution, c'est-à-dire qu'on en doit à des personnes qui parlent de la restitution doivent bien réfléchir. Mmh. Et quand je dis mais ils doivent bien réfléchir, et que mais dans quelles conditions ces missionnaires avaient eu ces œuvres. So with people talking about restitutions, we have to think or go into details uh, who, what were the conditions under which these objects were collected by missionaries and colonizers to read this up. Chaque chose a sa propre vie, sa propre biographie. Selon les philosophes Bruno, les tour, la tour et Georges Corbert, les choses peuvent déterminer leur trajectoire, leurs itinéraires. D'un côté, les œuvres d'art de l'Afrique sont des victimes des missionnaires et colonisateurs qui les ont qui les avaient amenés sans l'accord des propriétaires. De l'autre côté, selon Clomer et Latour, les choses 
ont instrumentalisé les êtres, les êtres humains pour les faire voyager et migrer, comme par exemple les bactéries lactiques, ont selon la tour utilisé Pasteur pour devenir connu dans le monde. Mm -hmm. L'africanisme et le panafricanisme. Okay. So everything has its own life, its own biography. According to the philosophers Bruno Latour and George Kupler, things can determine their trajectories, their roots. On one hand, the works of art of Africa are victims of missionaries and colonizers who brought them, who took them without the agreement of the owners. On the other hand, according to, to Kubla and Latour, things have instrumentalized human beings to make them travel and migrate, as for example, lactic acid bacteria have, according to Latour, used Louis Pasteur to become known in the world. Pour des expositions, j'amène des masques, j'amène des peintures. Mais les conditions dans lesquelles j'arrive à avoir ces masques, ces sculptures et à -dire, et réaliser ces peintures, je suis le seul, je suis le seul qui, qui sait le pourquoi. Mm -hmm. So George, he, he, he brings also, he displaces or makes objects and things migrate. He brings them from Benin to exhibition venues and de même avec moi les masques, les, sta les, les statues, les costumes de Egungun que je vois au Bénin m'interpellent, me demande de leur attribuer un rôle dans mes installations et par conséquent je les envoie avec les peintures, les choses que j'ai trouvées à la plage pour les expositions et les amener à Shanghai, Stockholm. Paris, Philadelphie. Et si l'œuvre est achetée, ça reste, l'œuvre reste dans les salles d'exposition de ces institutions. OK. Like, likewise with me, the masks, the statues, the Egon costumes that I see in Benin call out to me, ask me to assign them a role in my installations. And consequently, I sent them with the paintings and the things I have found on the beach to the exhibition venues, may it be Shanghai, Stockholm, Paris, Philadelphia. If the work is purchased by the institution, they remain in the exhibition spaces and storage walls. Monsieur Kierke, à dire, toutes, mes, toutes les expositions auxquelles on invite, pour laquelle je, je suis invité, ce sont des œuvres, et que ce soit des masques, qui doivent faire partie de ces installations, raison pour laquelle je parviens à les avoir. So he has them, he has this, he brings these objects because they, they have to be part of this installation that I make for a place, a site-specific installation. Donc ces, ces statues, ces masques, ces sculptures que j'ai introduit dans mes installations, mais je me demande le pourquoi, c'est-à-dire euh, l'État béninois peut demander à ce que, c'est-à-dire les musées because also if you are consequent the, the Benin government could ask the museums that have bought my works my installations could ask the, the those countries that have bought my installations to return the sculptures back to Benin which is quite a complex situation but concerning the objects that are in the collections European selon moi Je propose, de, je propose qu'on invite les artistes, chercheurs, penseurs à travailler avec ces objets dans les collections européennes selon. Hello. Uh, Stephen, we, we lost you for about three minutes. Yeah, okay. Translation. Regarding the works of art that are in European collections, in my opinion, it is not necessary to return them all to their origin. The question who controls the narration on these objects, either in writing or in form of exhibitions, is more important. I propose to invite artists, researchers, thinkers from African countries to work with 
uh, objects in European collections according to their knowledge and feeling towards these objects and thus free them from the routine of European thought and knowledge production. À ce but, Stéphane et moi avons créé une résidence d'artistes thématiques à Hambourg. Elle s'appelle Exploration à Rambert. C'est-à-dire renverser les rôles des explorateurs et des explorés. Dans ce cadre, actuellement, nous avons Amina Azoubir, une artiste algérienne qui est à Hambourg et en collaboration avec les commissaires du musée MAC. Elle est en train d'explorer les collections des photos des dites ethnologues faisant voir les femmes souvent nudes avec ses collections, avec ses, avec ses collages, et déconstruire le regard masculin sur ces ethnologues. De ces ethnologues. OK. Euh. To this end, George and I have created a thematic residency in Hamburg. It is called Reversed Exploration, to reverse the roles of the explorers and the explored. In this context, Amina Zubir, an Algerian artist, is now in Hamburg and in collaboration with the curators of Mark, with, uh, she is exploring their collection of photos of the so-called ethnologists of often naked women, humiliating photos, and de deconstructing the humiliating male gaze with her collages. In the last, last paragraph, John. Chacun et chacune de nos invités crée une affiche avec cette découverte en beau et un message qui est imprimé à 20 000 exemplaires qui sont distribués comme publicité, comme publicité dans les journaux quotidiens. Je répète, la régie du discours doit retourner dans les mains de ceux des cultures d'où les objets sont arrivés. Mm -hmm. So to finish up, we just wanted to mention each of our guests in Hamburg in this residency creates a poster with examples of their discoveries in Hamburg and a critical message about decolonizing um, Hamburg. And it is printed in 20,000 copies and then inserted into newspapers and distributed as advertisement, like uh, in a capillary way. I repeat, the control of the narration must return in the hands of those of the cultures who were the objects of the objects arrived, from where the objects arrived, to counteract the epistemic violence that occurred through the appropriation of these artworks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, George and Stefan, um, for that input. We have very pleased to have with us today Naja Ofuate Alazard, an African German editor, curator, cultural manager activist, public intellectual, whose work practice involves increasing vis the visibility uh, of people of African descent, the acknowledgement and the historical contextualization of their long presence uh, in Germany, of their intellectual and artistic practices and contributions in Germany and Europe and beyond. She is deeply invested in enabling transnational exchanges uh, between Africa and its global diasporas, as well as space making for people of African descent in the historical and contemporary narratives and realities of Europe. Uh, importantly for us, since about 2017, she has worked as CEO or co-CEO and artistic director of the Black Empowerment Advocacy Forum, Each One Teach One, a good South African struggle phrase that we learned from the students. Each One Teach One, Eyoto, which is based in Berlin. She co-founded and directs the Literature and Arts Festival, Afrolution, which, and, which annually convenes and mixes the most influential voices in African and African diasporic arts academy and activism, a curatorial approach she has termed triple A, 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 A. Since 2020, she has been the project leader of the 
interventions segment within the collaborative pilot project Decoloniale Memory Culture in the city of Berlin. Um, for a long time, she has been publishing, filmmaking, curating, producing events around themes such as European German colonialism, its structural consequences, uh, imageries and representations of blackness in media, education, and the pub public realm. And she is also focused on empowerment, advocacy for people and by people of African descent. Okay, so, well, thank you. Thank you again for the invitation. It's lovely meeting some of you for the first time and seeing some of you again um, after a long, much too long break. So <clears throat> just in brief, I think I'm going to, if we give us five minutes, I'm gonna try to hopscotch a little bit through some stations of my work uh, to illustrate some of uh, the perspectives of my work, but also mainly focus on uh, the project Decoloniale Memory uh, Culture in the City that you alluded to. Now, um, as you already um, initially said, I'm doubling uh, these days as CEO, or co-CEO and artistic director of Each One Teach One Ayoto, which is a black empowerment platform in Berlin. Uh, it hosts the library with a collection of about 8,000 titles. Um, by authors of African descent. Um, Iyoto, amongst others, conducts youth work, anti-discrimination counseling, engages in political advocacy on city, state, federal, and EU level, and hosts large networking and cultural events. Since last year, Iyoto also hosts the Competence Center for Anti-Black Racism, which mainly works in the field of education. And I think all this uh, did in detail is also important for the conversation we are having here. Um, however, since I started publishing in the early two, 2000s, linking the German and European colonial past with contemporary structures of living, dying, positioning, creating, resisting, feeling, working, thinking, et cetera, particular from a um, perspective of populations of African descent uh, has been at the core of my work. And this hopscotching through some stations of my career thus illustrates uh, uh, this. One good example, for example, is uh, the, re the film series uh, Remix, Africa and Translation, which is a four part series shot in the former German colonies in Africa. So we visited Togo, Cameroon, Tanzania, Namibia, also Ghana, uh, which was licensed. The film series was then licensed in 2017 by the, by the Federal Agency for Civic Education, BPB, Bundeszentrale für politische Bildung. Um, later, we can maybe also uh, share uh, that URL with you because you are able to download all four films. Each film segment is about 45 minutes long and you can translate it, it, it can be subtitled. Um, because uh, at that point we shot in 2016 and then 2017, it was licensed. Um, we were already deeply entrenched in conversations of, about uh, colonial continuities. And uh, what sparked my interest was really to travel uh, 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 on the African continent and be in this inquiry with thinkers, with activists, uh, with academics on how German colonial history has affected uh, their particular uh, territories and how it still does. So that was uh, Remix Africa and Translation. Now, currently I'm also serving as a, a project lead in a, a pilot project called uh, Decoloniale Memory Culture in the City. Um, now everything is relevant uh, from my point of view about this project. Um, let's start with the location. Uh, our project space is located at Wilhelmstraße 92. Um, this project space uh, thus is situated uh, right where the former sites of the German Reich uh, Chancellery and the Foreign Office were situated. And this is where the envoys of the European powers, the US and the Ottoman Empire convened for the so-called Berlin Africa Conference in 1884-85 at the invitation of the German Reich uh, and the Republic of France. Under the chairmanship of uh, Reich Chancellor Otto von Bismarck, this is where they reached an agreement about the rules for the colonial partitioning of the continent and thus also the exploitation of Africa. 
reclaiming this historical site is of utmost importance uh, to the project Decoloniale Memory Culture and the City and the starting point for dealing with German colonialism in a new collaborative and decentralized manner. Um, the underlying premise of the project is that although not always visible, the colonial past is omnipresent. This can also be said about the reverberations of uh, colonialism that emanated from Germany into the world. Berlin wants to face its responsibility as former colonial metropolis and capital of the German Reich. This is the reason why we have launched the Decoloniale Memory Culture in the city in January 2020 as a cultural project to critically address the history of colonialism and its consequences. The project situates colonialism as a system of injustice, which was always met with the resistance of the colonized peoples, a resistance that too often has been rendered invisible or belittled in Western discourse. The project picks up on the ever louder demands of, uh, for consistent change of perspective in the post-colonial memory culture in Germany. As a participatory solidarity project of historical political education and in cooperation with experts and activists, we have made it our goal to globally research the past and present of anti and colonial matters in Berlin, in the remaining federal territory and in Germany's former colonies and to make them visible online in all their entanglements and that's a digital mapping. Colonial history is also always a global history of interdependence. Stories around lives, locations, objects, and institutions connect Europe with Africa, Asia, Oceania, Australia, and the Americas. I think um, my five minutes are up. I could continue going, but we can also pick up maybe later at some of the details of the project. Sirai, how do you feel about that? Is that good? We can, but if you have one or two more points to make, please go ahead. Let me see. Let me scan my notes briefly. Uh, well, maybe it's important to say that it's an initiative by three NGOs, uh, which is IOTO, then the Initiative of Black Peoples in Germany, um, and Berlin Postcolonial, whom I think you are very familiar with, right? Uh, with Christian Kopp and uh, Mboro. Uh, and fourthly, the fourth partner is a museum. It's the foundation of the City Museum of Berlin. So that's one of the firsts, you know, to have such a collaborative engagement of civil society with state stakeholders. Um, and maybe just in brief, uh, the three segments of the project. So you have decoloniale histories uh, or stories, uh, which is the digital digital world map that is uh, under the responsibility of Berlin Postcolonial, which is a very, um, it's, it, well, we flipped it upside down. Um, it's, it points southwards uh, and we are mapping uh, Berlin's uh, entanglements with the rest of the world. And we're mapping the city of Berlin as such. Then we have representations, which is the segment that works with museums and also um, uh, forges exhibitions in, in collaboration with uh, district museums in Berlin. And the fourth one is interventions, which is the segment that I'm responsible for. And that is about uh, performativity and discursive elements in a nutshell, and a think tank series that I can later maybe remark on a little bit more. Thank you very much, Nadja, that's, that's great. We are pleased to have Nina Muntman with us today. Uh, Nina, Nina is professor of art theory at the University of Cologne. Um, she's a curator, and she's also one of the PIs at the Global South Study Center at the University of Cologne. Before Cologne, she was Professor of Art Theory and History of Ideas at the Royal Institute of Art in Stockholm and Curator at the Nordic Institute for Contemporary Art in Helsinki. And she's currently working on a book titled Decentering the Museum, Contemporary Art Institutions and Colonial Legacy. And Nina and I have been doing some work together in the last uh, six months or so, um, because one of my legs is I also have an affiliation at the University of Cologne. 
Thank you very much, Siraj. And also thanks to the Deichtorhallen for the invitation. Um, it's great to participate in that event um, <clears throat> together with some of you I already know and others I was always keen on meeting. Um, I will use my five minutes to, first I would like to refer to the title of our panel. I don't think we can, we can overcome colonial continuities and we shouldn't because colonization in tandem with global capitalism still constitutes the current world order and decolonization is a process that has been going on for different durations in different parts of the world. The specific local contexts differ widely as do the institutional constituencies when we are talking about decolonizing museums and other cultural institutions, which may be private, public, located in different, very different local conditions. Therefore, decolonization is an ongoing process with shifting constellations and not a state that can be achieved once and for all. Thinking about the process of decolonizing museums, I would like to focus on three aspects, which are um, objects, knowledge, and audiences or publics of museums. Objects are necessarily at the center of decolonizing processes in anthropological museums because the provenance research and restitution processes, negotiations and debates are linked to stolen objects in the collections and archives of the museums. And even if objects have not been plundered, they are stemming from a context of injustice, which makes them allies of colonial oppression. That's why they also require attention. What art and cultural institutions without a collection, mainly smaller institutions and organizations can afford, the contrary, is to think decolonization beyond objects, which means to start off from ideas about an epistemic decolonization, about creating new forms of knowledge, and in that context, use objects not at the center of attention, but invite objects as arguments, as carriers of memories, of local and communal narratives, and as references to create situated knowledge. <clears throat> knowledge is an important dimension and of central concern because we are still in an epistemic colonial time when it comes to primary languages, access to education, canonized knowledge, power structures within institutions of knowledge production, political and cultural parameters. So epistemic decolonization is a central part of, of what we have to think of when we talk about decolonizing museums. Besides epistemic hegemonies, there is a colonial legacy of how to run an institution. Confronting these aspects would include attempts to decolonize collections, infrastructures, and curatorial policies. The white infrastructures Nick Mirzov has been writing about are also of male infrastructures racist infrastructures, ableist infrastructures, and so on. That's why I um, often use the term decentering instead of decolonizing when I talk about contemporary art museums, because decentering also includes decolonizing, but also implies feminist, um, et cetera, practices and sensitivities, publics. Benedict Anderson introduced the founding narrative of the early museum, the modern Enlightenment Museum, as a tool in the context of nation building, a tool to create the narrative of a superior nation, which Anderson calls an imagined community. This also imagines the world order from the perspective of the colonizer. Such a public institution is constitutionally open to everybody, but in fact provides a limited and encoded accessibility that confirms the bourgeois and patriotic subject as the ideal citizen. The museum long lost the bourgeoisie as its main peer group. It was superseded by the global consumer, the paying visitor of a corporate art institution. So where are we standing now? I think a crucial question at this point is, who can be the peer group for a new decentered museum? How can we imagine a new museum from the perspective of these new peer groups, these post-national, post-consumerist new communities, and together with them? New public functions of the museum have to be conceived and established beyond contemplation and, con and consumption, 
and maybe also beyond objects. Thank you so much, Nina. That was spot on. Before I hand over to my colleague, Barbara Plunkensteiner, who I've had the pleasure of working with for maybe about uh, 13 years or something now. Um, uh, she is the director of the Museum am Rottenbaum, World Cultures and Art, Mark, since April 2017. And you will all have witnessed how under her leadership, the museum started a process of repositioning itself and attempting to decolonize itself that also led to its change of name. Before taking up that position, she was the Francis and Benjamin Benenson Foundation Senior Curator of African Art at Yale University Art Gallery, New Haven, Connecticut. And before that, she served for many years at Welt Museum. Um, and even when it was under different names, where she served as deputy director, chief curator, curator of the Africa collections, uh, and where she had an important uh, impact in the repositioning of the museum and rethinking its permanent collection. And you will be very aware of a well-known exhibition, Court Arts from Nigeria, in which she was lead curator and for which she edited the accompanying handbook. She also uh, curated African Lace, a history of trade, creativity and fashion in Nigeria, uh, which she co-curated and for which she co-edited the accompanying catalog. Uh, she has researched widely and published a number of books and articles in the field of African art, material culture, history of ethnographic collections, museum anthropology. And she is co-founder of the Benin, Benin Dialogue uh, Forum. And uh, together with, uh, uh, she's the, uh, uh, Prince Gregory Akinzua, who is co-chair of its steering committee. And one of the outcomes is the Digital Benin Project launched uh, a few months ago in October 2020, uh, which is carried out by an international team based in Hamburg, Benin City and the US and coordinated by the MARC under her direction. We're very pleased to have our colleague uh, Professor Dr. Barbara Blankensteiner to address us. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Raj, for the kind introduction and thank you for the Deichterhallen for organizing this talk. And it's a great pleasure to be in this group and um, speak a little bit about uh, the work we are doing. Um, um, in my statement, I just would like to tell a little bit uh, of what we are trying to do. And uh, Nina Mundmann already addressed that um, the museum work uh, we are doing and many other museums is like a constant process. So we are constantly um, developing ourselves. And I think that's maybe one of the uh, major changes that uh, have been going on in our museum field um, in the last years that we do, uh, we, we really have to uh, work differently. And we also have to imagine uh, a completely different uh, museum futures of which we are not yet sure where it will lead to. And particularly for museums with, uh, if I may say so, with an ethnographic tradition like uh, the museum that I'm uh, director of. Um, and we are, um, we are basically in the, in the process of searching uh, and um, addressing also publicly our role in society and what kind of future we could have in, in the society. 
I don't agree with Nina Muntman that the objects that we, we, we should be in uh, a museum without objects. I'm a very object centered person and you heard that already a little bit from my CV. I'm, I'm a scholar. I, I am very much interested in the historic African art um, and material culture. And I think um, the collections we have are uh, um, very relevant. Um, from various perspectives. And I think this is also shown in the actual debates we have in European society about colonial history and colonial heritage um, that circle around our collections and our museums because we are considered to be the um, uh, focalization of an ongoing debate that you addressed in your introduction, um, uh, Siraj. And that's also uh, in a way overwhelms us because um, our structures, our conditions in which we work um, are uh, not made uh, to, to, uh, uh, to um, really answer to that in a manner we should. And that's something I would like um, to address uh, because I think it's not our muse only our museum, but um, I can uh, say also the other ethnographic museums in Germany are embarking on a really deep going uh, process um, uh, uh, of uh, decolonization. And um, it is a challenge for all of us. Um, and um, because we're working on certain structures and with certain expectations um, and we have stakeholders that have you know, sometimes uh, contradictory expectations um, that we have to address. Uh, so, for instance, in our museum, you know, our museum is situated in a colonial building. So basically, we are working in a colonial monument. Um, and uh, that also kind of frames uh, our work and what we are doing. Um, so uh, there are many um, aspects that uh, uh, we, we have to consider because a museum like ourselves is um, many things at the same time. We are an exhibition hall, we are an archive of objects, but also of historic documents that are relevant. Uh, for research and uh, on colonial history, but also many other aspects relating to our collections um, and to the creation and situation of uh, museums. We also have a very relevant photographic uh, collection, a huge photographic, historic photographic collection. And um, Stefan Köhler uh, addressed that and Joshua Diakbo uh, with research that is being done uh, in this uh, photographic archive at the, same, at the moment. We are also an event space. We are an educational institution. We are a site for public discourse and we are a research institution. And in some respects, also a commercial enterprise that's expected from us in, in, the, uh, in, 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 in the political framework. You know, we have to generate income to, um, uh, to support our work. Um, and uh, I have to say, we as an institution, we are a rather small institution. We are not really equipped to fulfill all these roles uh, that um, are uh, relevant uh, today. And um, so um, it is uh, particularly at the moment, our role of an archive is prevalent because we, uh, you know, we are, there's so much provenance research going on. Um, uh, we want to open our archives. We want to be transparent. We want to give accessibility uh, to our collection. We want to embark in collaborative research um, transcontinentally with many communities. Um, we want to um, address all these issues that are very relevant in dealing with the colonial heritage. Um, and um, so we are struggling to accomplish um, all this while at the same time functioning as an average museum with producing exhibitions, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that is something that is a huge challenge for us, but also um, um, we, um, it's, uh, um, also very important, I think, uh, to um, uh, another challenge that we are experiences, uh, experiencing and which also um, uh, addresses this um, idea of the future museum um, in a certain way is that we also navigate, you know, between um, a sort of a 
political activism and on the other hand um, uh, uh, balanced knowledge production and uh, dissemination in a way as an educational institution and I think that's something that is very um, uh, um, uh, is, is uh, something that um, also in our conversation is uh, very uh, important. Um, yeah, so and also for many of uh, my uh, younger colleagues and myself as well, I mean, our museums um, are sort of symbolic for this whole um, uh, uh, colonial entanglement we are still living in. And um, uh, there is uh, really a sincere wish um, of the people working in these museums or in our museum, you know, to make um, our museum uh, a space of healing and of this course uh, about this and opening it up to um, uh, other perspectives on our collections and um, give room uh, for that um, as well. And this is, you know, and also, um, so we we are in a in a moment where we try to address all this and also to physically you know enable uh, it um, and uh, that from the perspective of a museum kind if I may say so uh, particularly in Germany that has been underfunded under um, not being represented in the cultural public discourse for a very long time. Um, and so um, I think also uh, this um, whole um, discussion uh, going on and the debate in our society is also offers um, a new opportunity to create a different kind um, of institution. And um, I think that uh, the, the, the objects play a central role in this um, and how uh, we uh, research them, you know, we engage in provenance research, uh, we, we engage in collaborative uh, projects, we try uh, to finance fellowships in our institution so that people from uh, the countries um, of descendant com communities or countries of origin can uh, do and follow their own uh, research interests on our collections that we then uh, can um, uh, um, uh, that flow in in our work etc cetera, etc cetera. so I think that's um, uh, all what we are trying to do and many other museums of our kind. Um, and uh, also I think uh, very relevant for our museum that we are trying to uh, accomplish also that we undergo a diversification pro uh, process that um, includes our staff, um, uh, our program and our audiences um, uh, at the same time while we are um, uh, also collaborating transnationally with many communities um, and institutions. And um, we uh, also, uh, a very important subject for us is um, colonial history and coloniality, um, as I uh, said, and we are trying to um, also address that in exhibitions and programs. Um, so for instance, uh, in mid-April, we had to postpone because of Corona. We will open an exhibition that is particularly um, uh, geared for the target group of families and young people uh, about uh, colonial history and our entanglement with uh, colonial history, but also uh, the entanglement of uh, Hamburg, and Douala. Uh, so it's uh, on an example on the history uh, and life history of um, uh, a Douala king and um, that and uh, that uh, resisted uh, colonial rule, German colonial rule in Cameroon and uh, the legacy uh, he left um, and uh, also how relevant it is uh, for our future and for our contemporary society. Um, and um, it also re relates to our collection and it is a collaboration with um, uh, representatives uh, from the family uh, in uh, Douala. 
uh, and also with local um, uh, groups uh, of the civic society um, uh, and artists that uh, address uh, the subject. So we have several perspectives and collaborative efforts uh, all concentrated in this exhibition. And this is a, an experiment for us. And we so we also see our educational role here in addressing such subjects that are underrepresented um, in the school um, curriculum because it's a, a specific addressing uh, young people so also this kind of work we are trying to do um, yeah there is much more to say it might be a little bit uh, uh, confused I have so many notes <laughs> which I'm looking at but um, I think most relevant is that we are in a constant uh, process maybe just finally because you mentioned the digi digital project um, uh, this uh, is an international project something that uh, digital benin um, uh, is i think it's situated here in hamburg also because um, hamburg played a relevant role and under and not very much known a role in the uh, um, uh, in the, um, I don't remember the English word, in the, uh, how, uh, in the distribution of uh, these uh, looted artworks um, from the former um, kingdom of Benin. Um, and um, the project aims to uh, uh, digitally reunite um, all uh, the Benin collections that are dispersed worldwide, uh, but also with the uh, archival documentation and photographic um, uh, archival records that are available and it will be a, a, a platform for research and for knowledge dissemin dissemination and also a very relevant um, uh, uh, online site uh, for our Nigerian partners that have asked for this for a very long time to get an overview what's out there in the world. Um, and um, uh, so this is just a special project that we uh, have been embarking um, in collaboration with many museums and institutions worldwide and in Nigeria. Thank you very much, Barbara. Then next up, we have a longtime colleague of mine, uh, Nick Shepard, now of Aarhus University, where he is in the Department of Archaeology and Heritage Studies, uh, and formerly of the University of Cape Town in, uh, in African Studies, perhaps the foremost historian of archaeology uh, in South Africa, um, and the author of a number of works on uh, decolonial linguistics, on uh, the shadow of Cecil John Rhodes, of, uh, of her questions of heritage in Cape Town. Thank you, Siraj. Um, it's lovely to see you all and uh, to be part of this distinguished panel. I began my career in South Africa in the 1990s. At the time, there were three events or interventions that shaped my thinking around curatorship, the museum as institution, and questions of history, memory, and representation. And I think these three events did that for many who were part of my generation. The first was a research intervention. The publication late in the decade of Siraj Rasul and Martin Legasic's Skeletons in the Cupboard, an account of the widespread, widespread trafficking in human remains of people described as San or Bushmen carried out by self-styled collectors, researchers, and institutions in the opening decades of the 20th century. This remarkable book established the history of the museum as a history of atrocity. It also established the foundational violence of disciplinary practices in archeology span and anthropology, rooted in racial science and in a speculative interest in black bodies and in what Rasul and Patricia Hayes described as practices of hyper-focalization, this kind of intense objectifying form of the gaze. The second intervention was a curatorial intervention, an exhibition in 1996 by a young curator, Pippa Scottness, called Miscast, Negotiating the Presence of the Bushman. 
Scottness turned the Iziko South African Museum inside out, divulging its contents across the way in the South African National Gallery. She established a kind of museum of the museum, focused on disciplinary practices of collecting and curating and the savagery of colonial sciences. I remember the peculiar hush that characterized the exhibition, the smell of resin from the spotlit body casts that accentuated the exhibitionary space. Spot Scottness's intervention came at a particular moment in South African public life, something of a confessional moment. This was the time of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. In retrospect, both the TRC and Scottness's intervention have drawn criticism. Perhaps in retrospect, we can look back on this as a flawed or failed confessional moment, but in some ways, no less revealing for all of that. The third intervention was the release of a remarkable cycle of animated films by William Kentridge between 1989 and 2003 called Nine Drawings for Projection. Films like Monument, 1990, Mine, 1991, Felix in Exile, 1994, and History of the Main Complaint, 1996, established a repertoire of images and illusions that form an indispensable commentary to this febrile moment in South African history. Many people have commented on the way in which the films address questions of history and memory through the famous practice of the erasure of the charcoal drawings, for example. They also address the ability of art to implicate us, to speak to registers outside of distanced analytical research. They articulate what it means to dwell under and after the shadow of apartheid, where history becomes a kind of geological or archeological presence. And I think of the short film, Mine, in particular. They also established a quality of feeling and, or affect in which the pressure of history takes the form not so much of the dead hand of history, but rather of a kind of hauntedness. So very briefly, colonial continuities in curatorial practices and possibilities to overcome these colonial continuities. I understand coloniality as a form of deep inscription in disciplines and institutions. I understand it to be part of their archive in a Foucauldian sense, to be part of their DNA, if you will, and to be manifested in at least three aspects of conventional curatorial practice. These aspects are number one, taxonomy, number two, immobility or stasis, and number three, distance. So to say a very few words about each of these things. First of all, taxonomy, the drive to arrange things in boxes conceptual, typological, and chronological boxes, but also physical boxes. For me, the very image of this drive or logic is the stacked cardboard boxes of human remains on the shelves of the Iziko South African Museum store. The archeological intervention consists in the ordering of the material remains of the past and of time itself into an ever more intricate series of boxes. This severs the relationship between phenomena and chops up the continuity of time itself. A second aspect, immobility or stasis. The most profound and uncanny aspect of the museum as institution is the presentation or staging of immobilized bodies and objects. Movement is evacuated from the frozen tableau of the museum. The metonymic effect is of the stopping of time itself. It places the museum under a kind of a spell, which takes the form of a logic of deathliness. Re to reference the work of decolonial thinker Nelson Maldonado Torres. 
And then the third aspect of conventional curatorial practices, which speaks to their inbuilt coloniality, is distance. Conventional curatorial practices set up an essential distance between the viewing subject and the object being viewed. We are not touched by the object that we are spectating, but remain distanced, abstracted, and uninvolved. In South Africa, these three curatorial logics, taxonomy, immobility, and distance, also typified the logic of apartheid, which categorized and divided people, which immobilized them and placed them in separate boxes and created a distance between them. A certain kind of white gaze on black bodies migrated, as it were, from the museum as institution into public political life. Or perhaps more correctly, the same deep logic, coloniality, informed both curatorial practices and public political life. And in fact, this is what I'm suggesting, that there's a kind of deep logic which links museum curators, colonial administrators, and apartheid officials. Coloniality here takes the form of an embedded enduring logic. In conclusion then, how do we overcome these colonial continuities? I think the decolonial move is to invert these logics, to turn them on their heads. Instead of taxonomy, which boxes things and divides one thing from another, we need to emphasize relationship, continuity, and connection. Instead of immobility, we need to look to mobility, movement, and life. And instead of distance, we need the refusal of distance, involvement, implication, immediacy, and connection. Thank you so much. We have some argument in front of us that that if we enable a reconnection through the presence of, uh, of African artists and African, uh, African people to be, to be brought close to collections in European museums, to rethink them, to try and prize them out of their colonial categories, and authenticate them that that might be a strategy of working. We have the idea of decentering because the challenges inside of European museums and other museums generally are, are much deeper and the, the correctly stated, the, the notion of decolonizing that many people tend to use today conjures up an idea of a singular revolutionary event that will occasion a fundamental transformation. Uh, and we know from, from, from Naja's work how complex it is, how much organizing it takes, how many different mediums you need to come at this with, and how many partnerships you have to create. This is a, a program of partnership that needs to create the proximities it needs to create the relationalities, um, but which cannot be a neo-colonial uh, project. It cannot be a form of, of reordering the colonial uh, museum and giving it some kind of new legitimacy. The, the task of changing the museum from being a fundamental part of the infrastructure, the international infrastructure of colonialism and what some people are calling white infrastructure is not an overnight revolution, but ongoing work, including epistemic work, work attending to disciplines, attending to colonial categories, so that this is a, a project that we have to do together. But in order for this work to succeed, in European museums. We need to make sure that we, that on the African side of the equation, that we begin to bring to bear even more pressure than ever before on European museums, on our 
on our curator colleagues in these museums with whom we have much work to do. We have much work to do to change the meaning of the object and even to change the location of those objects. So I want to thank um, George, Nadja, Nina, Barbara, and Nick for their thoughts today. And I also want to thank, to thank our hosts, uh, Dominic and others who brought us together in the name of, uh, in the name of William Kentridge. And before we, we close, uh, Stefan and George wanted to make an announcement. Sitting in front of uh, the installation that George made for the Kindle, and uh, hopefully we will open March 27, 28, if if uh, Corona rate uh, infection rates permit. And the show, which is called La Lumière qui fait le bonheur, it is light that brings happiness, is open if it's open until the end of July in Berlin at the Kindle Museum. So. And you can see as George here integrates objects from Benin and makes them talk with a hot water bottle and many other things. So please come and join the exhibition one day. So thank you for inviting us. Thank you so much, George. And uh, good, good, good luck with, with the, the exhibition. And thank you very much to everyone and over to Dominic. Ich freue mich sehr, Ihnen unseren nächsten Programmpunkt anzukündigen. Im folgenden Vortrag Wandelbarkeit und Melancholie über synchronisierte und verschobene Geschichtsbilder im Werk von William Kentridge geht die Kunsthistorikerin Angela Breitbach der Frage nach, wie Geschichte und Politik in der Kentridge-Ausstellung dargestellt werden. Ein großes Thema in seinem Werk sind Bilder der Migration. Sie erscheinen in Form von Holzschnitten, auf Wandteppichen und in filmischen Aufzügen von Schattenfiguren. Mit den Prozessionen machen sich die Bilder selbst auf den Weg, entfalten Bedeutungen aus ihrem Material und der körperlichen Performance. Flüchtige Bildwelten kommen über mediale Grenzen hinweg scheinbar zufällig zusammen. Sie verbinden sich und treten in Widerstand zueinander. Die Bildräume sind keine neutralen Behälter, sondern, so Angela Breitbachs These, dialektisch, wenn sie in widersprüchlichen Zwillingsfiguren dem Fremden, Anderen in sich Raum verschaffen. Angela Breitbach promovierte 2001 zum Thema Anschauungsraum bei Paul Cézanne und Hermann von Helmholtz. 2016 habilitierte sie zum Thema des Schattens im Werk von William Kentridge, Hans-Peter Feldmann und Winfried Georg Sebald. Angela Breitbach unterrichtet Kunst und Philosophie in Hamburg und lehrt an der Leuphana Universität in Lüneburg. Zurzeit arbeitet sie an dem ikonografischen Atlas der Bilder im Werk des Schriftstellers Sebald. Seit ihrem 2014 publizierten Gesprächsband Thinking Aloud mit William Kentridge veröffentlicht und forscht Angela Breitbach intensiv über den südafrikanischen Künstler. Ich wünsche Ihnen nun viel Vergnügen mit dem Vortrag. Lieber William Kentridge, lieber Dirk Lucco, meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, ich freue mich, hier im Rahmen des Symposiums der Deichtorhallen vortragen zu dürfen. Mein Vortrag behandelt die Wandelbarkeit und Melancholie der Geschichtsbilder im Werk von William Kentridge. Zwischen der Geschichte und ihrer möglichen Darstellung liegen unüberbrückbare Differenzen. Politisches ist kontrovers und lässt sich nicht eins zu eins abbilden. Reden über die Dinge, so fasst es Adornos Dialektik, enthält in allem ebenso dessen Widerspruch, der nicht aufzulösen ist. Wenn ich hier der politischen Dimension und der poetischen Kraft des Werkes von William Kentridge nachgehe, dann eben nur und gerade in meiner Darstellung einer Aufhebung der zwingenden Übereinstimmung zwischen den Bildern und ihrer Bedeutung. 
Die Bilder im Oeuvre von Kentridge sind ambivalent. Sie entfalten einen Sachverhalt oft in seiner Gegenbedeutung und gleichzeitig seiner Bedeutung. Zu fragen ist, ob die Bilder in ihrer materiellen und körperlichen Performance nicht nur Politik kommentieren, sondern auch politisch sind, in dem Maße, in dem sie selbst in Widerstand treten. Ob die Bildräume neutrale Behälter sind oder ob sie sich mit dem, was in ihnen geschieht, wandeln und davon lernen. Ob sie philosophisch sind, nicht nur in dem Sinn, wie sie über die Welt denken, sondern auch darin, wie sie sich in ihr aufführen. Das sind nicht zuletzt ethische Fragen. Ich behandle verschiedene Topoi der Arbeit, gehe dabei von einzelnen Kunstwerken oder Werkgruppen aus, die in der Ausstellung der Deichtorhallen zu sehen sind. Der Topos des Zeugen. Der Film Ubu Tells the Truth von 1997 Erstand, entstand nach dem Ende der Apartheid, als die sogenannte Wahrheits- und Versöhnungskommission eingerichtet worden war. Er gehört in den Zusammenhang eines gleichnamigen Theaterstücks von Jane Taylor zusammen mit Kentridge und bezieht sich auf Alfred Jarrys Figur des Königs Übü. Vor der Truth and Reconciliation Commission konnten die Täter die Wahrheit ihrer eigenen Verbrechen bezeugen. Davon gibt es Tonbandaufnahmen. Als Gegenleistung wurden sie von der Kommission begnadigt. Reue, Sühne und Wiedergutmachung waren nicht verlangt. Man kann sich denken, dass der Begriff der Wahrheit dieser Zeugenaussagen nicht weniger als zwei entgegengesetzte Positionen behauptet. Die Opfer oder ihre Angehörigen haben dieselben Verbrechen bezeugt. In einer Szene von Jarrys König Übü erscheint der Geist des toten Königs seinem Sohn und ruft zur Rache auf. Wo die Opfer nicht vergeben konnten, vergab der Staat an ihrer Stadt. Kentridge's Animationsfilm reiht mit weißen Linien auf schwarzem Grund Schlagbilder der Misshandlung und Folter aneinander die 1997 der allerjüngsten Geschichte des eigenen Landes angehörten. Eine dritte Rolle, neben Täter und Opfer, nimmt der Zeuge ein, in der Allegorie des gequälten Auges. Mit Anleihen bei Eisenstein aus dem Film Panzerkreuzer Potjemkin von 1925 und bei der Szene des durchschnittenen Auges in Bünuel und Dalis Kurzfilm Der andalusische Hund von 1929. Die Wahrheit der Geschichte versöhnt nicht, sondern quält vor allem die Opfer und ihre Angehörigen für lange Zeit weiter. Die Allegorie des Auges als Zeuge im Film ist auch ein Statement über die Medialität jeder Wahrheit. Der Zeuge hat durchgängig im Werk den Redner zum Antagonisten, der die Geschichte zugunsten seiner Egoposition auslegt. In einem einminütigen 16 mm Film von 1975 mit Titel Discourse on a Chair, bei dem, so erklärt Kentridge, die Einzelbilder im Miniaturformat direkt auf den Filmstreifen gezeichnet wurden, wird der Redner am Ende von dem Stuhl, über den er palabert, aus dem Ring gekickt. Die Dinge haben ihre eigene Wahrheit. Im Animationsfilm Monument von 1990 aus der berühmten Serie der Drawings for Projection wird der Redner ironisch eingeführt als Soho Extin Civic Benefactor. Seine Rede ein sichtbarer Redeschwall aus zwei Megaphonen bringt das Monument erst hervor. Einen Minenarbeiter, gebeugt unter einem schweren Felsbrocken auf seinen Schultern. Vordergründig wird ein Denkmal der Arbeit geehrt. Rhetorisch als Wohltätigkeit verkleidet wird aber, so der Plot des Films, die Unterdrückung selbst auf den Sockel gehoben. Dem Redner bei Kentridge ist nicht zu trauen, den Bildern gerade, weil sie ambivalent sind. 
Die filmische Installation mit Titel O Sentimental Machine, die 2015 für die Istanbul Biennale entstand, zeigt eine andere Variante des Redners. Der Revolutionsführer Leo Trotzki steht am Rednerpult, die linke Hand in der Hosentasche, mit der rechten gestikuliert er zur Rede, die er hält. Trotzkis Rede ist sein Beitrag für eine kommunistische Tagung in Paris, den er im türkischen Exil aufzeichnen ließ. Trotzki hatte, darauf basiert der Titel der Arbeit, die Vision, dass der neue kommunistische Mensch sich nach und nach zu einer gut funktionierenden Maschine, einer verbesserten Version seiner selbst umformen könnte. Das unkontrollierbare Emotionale werde dadurch, so Trotzki, nach und nach überwunden. Den Menschen dahingehend zu formen, sei die Aufgabe des Kommunismus. Zwölf Jahre nach der Oktoberrevolution wurde Trotzki aus dem kommunistischen Russland verbannt. Er ließ sich zunächst bis 1933 in Istanbul nieder. Danach ging er nach Frankreich, Norwegen, schließlich nach Mexiko wo er 1940 von einem sowjetischen Attentäter ermordet wurde. Dass dem Redner bereits hier im türkischen Exil das Wasser bis zum Hals steht, verbindet sein Bild im Film mit Jacques-Louis Davids totem Revolutionsführer Marat im Bade. Ein männlicher und eine weibliche Protagonistin in einem anderen Film derselben Installation stellen ihre Körper in den Dienst der Utopie Trotzkis. Sie verwandeln sich nach und nach in Maschinenmenschen auf Stativbeinen mit Megafonköpfen. Topos der ungleichen Zwillingsbilder. Anders als der narzisstische Redner, dessen Bild immer exakt mit sich selbst zur Deckung kommt, erfährt die Sekretärin im Pas de Deux mit ihrem Spiegelbild, dass ich eine andere ist. Die Bewegungen ihres Gegenübers sind erst symmetrisch und lösen sich dann komplett von ihr. Die Szene bezieht sich auf den Film Duck Soup der Marx Brothers aus dem Jahr 1933, in dem Trotzki in Istanbul war. Hier wird der Durchtritt durch den Spiegel in dem Moment möglich, wo das eigene als fremd erkannt wird. Das ist eine Schlüsselfigur der Dialektik des Sehens bei Kentridge. Bildliche Zwillingsfiguren, die gleichzeitig mit Identität und Verschiedenheit zu tun haben, finden sich in den stereoskopischen Fotogravuren im Raum des Studios und in dessen Motto Twins and their Doubles, das über die Zeichnung zweier Megafone in ein Heft notiert wurde. Welche Bedeutung haben die Bildzwillinge? Wie entsteht gerade in einer Ähnlichkeit, die zum Verwechseln ist, poetische und politische Dichte? Stereoskopie und Metapher Im Stereobild verdoppelt sich ein Motiv unter zwei verschiedenen Gesichtspunkten, dem des linken und dem des rechten Auges. Das Motiv bleibt also das gleiche, nur sein Bild geht zweimal leicht verschoben ins Hirn ein. Hier werden sie synchronisiert. Das Modell der zwei Blickwinkel auf eine selbe Sache, ihre Verschiebung und Synchronisation, mit dem Kentridge hier arbeitet, lässt sich auf Identitätsdebatten beziehen, wie sie auch in den Panels unseres Symposiums geführt werden. Diese Art des sehenden Denkens bringt die Dinge nicht auf den Punkt. Ihr steht als Gewinn das Räumliche selbst aus. Die dialektische Figur der Identität von Differenz hat als poetisches Pendant die Form der visuellen Metapher, die ich im Folgenden an internen und externen Werken erläutere. Hier ist sie auch bereits gegeben. Die zufällige Begegnung eines Mannes mit einem Nashorn geht natürlich auf Dürers Zeichner des liegenden Weibes zurück. Dürers Frau präsentiert sich bekanntermaßen als weibliches Objekt männlicher Projektion. In Kentridge's Oeuvre 
gibt es die bereits erwähnte Serie, die der Projektion ausdrücklich gewidmet ist. Die bisher zehn Animationsfilme Drawings for Projection, die in einer Nische am Ende der Ausstellung in den Deichtorhallen gezeigt werden, beziehen ihren Serientitel zum einen aus der Form ihrer Projektion an der Wand, zum anderen aus den Geschichten von Liebe, Reichtum und Macht, die in ihnen ausgespielt werden. Das Nashorn aus Papiermaché steht selbstbewusst auf dem Arbeitstisch der surrealen Montage. Im Raum der Papierbühne steht das kuriose Tier dem losgelösten Kopf des Betrachters als befremdliches alter Ego gegenüber. Bedruckte und beschriebene Papierbögen, aus denen es hervorgegangen ist, fliegen noch überall herum. Der von Duchamps Dürer Persiflage entliehene Titel der Arbeit ist Etant donné. Die gegebene Größe ist kein objektiver mathematischer Gegenstand. Sie ist die unmittelbare Begegnung des einen mit dem ganz anderen. Die Art des Sehens, die hier bezeichnet wird, trifft die metaphorische Form ineinandergefügter Vorstellungsbilder, ebenso wie die moralische Ebene der Integration von Differenz. Ich ist ein anderer, der andere bin ich. Der Konflikt gegensätzlicher Positionen im gleichzeitigen Bestreben nach Einigung kennzeichnet die Figur des Politischen. Zu den Protagonisten und Requisiten, die sich gegenüberstehen und auch die Seiten wechseln, gehören lebendige wie mechanische Figuren. Die menschliche Silhouette, die schwarze Katze, das Nashorn, die Nase, das Auge des Zeugen, aber auch die Kamera auf Stativbeinen. Die Schreibmaschine, Projektor, Telefon und Uhr, nicht zuletzt immer wieder das Megafon als Verlängerung des Redners und dessen Propaganda. Wie in Trotzkis Entwurf des kommunistischen Menschen gehen Körper in Maschinen über. Zu Adornos Dialektik, der Minima Moralia, die Kentridge gelesen hat, gehört die Denkfigur, dass eine Philosophie des Lebens im Nachdenken über dessen Verhinderung im mechanischen Zeitalter beginnt. Wer die Wahrheit über das unmittelbare Leben herausfinden will, schreibt Adorno, muss dessen entfremdeter Gestalt nachforschen. Ihr begegnen wir in Kentridge's Maschinenpoesien. In einer Filmsequenz der Installation O Sentimental Machine geht eine Nähmaschine in ein Megafon über und bewegt es im Rhythmus des Herzschlags. Für Dada und die Surrealisten hatte bekanntlich ein Satz des französischen Dichters Isodore Ducas alias Lautréamont aus dem sechsten Kapitel der Gesänge des Maldodor eine herausragende Bedeutung. Ein Jüngling, so die poetisch absurde Formulierung, sei Schön wie das zufällige Zusammentreffen einer Nähmaschine und eines Regenschirms auf einem Seziertisch. 1920 nahm Man Ray den Satz als Ausgangspunkt für die Skulptur mit Titel The Enigma of Isodore Ducasse, die eine mit Filz bedeckte und Bindfaden umwickelte Nähmaschine. Hier in einer Fotografie auf der Titelseite der Zeitung La Révolution Surrealiste vom 1. Dezember 1924. Bei Joseph Cornell ist die Szene ein Arbeitsplatz. Fragmente liegen herum, es wird geschnitten und zusammengenäht. Alle möglichen Begegnungen sind denkbar. Kentridge's Heartbeat Sewing Machine aus dem Film findet sich als Objekt auf einem Tisch platziert in der Ausstellung wieder. Während Man Ray hier in einem Remake von 1972 das Rätsel der visuellen Metapher inszeniert, etwas, das im Sehen stattfindet und sich dem Sehen entzieht, und Cornell in einer anderen Collage die Nähmaschine als männliche Projektion auf das weibliche Objekt als eine andere Junggesellenmaschine darstellt, ist sie bei Kentridge ein munteres, aktives Bild. Hier wird nicht gefesselt, nicht geschnitten, nicht genäht. 
Das rätselhafte Doppelobjekt lässt sich zu zwei Seiten auslegen. Dass das Herz eine stumme, willenlose Maschine sei oder dass selbst die Menschenmaschine über einen Herzschlag verfüge, Freiheit besitze, Widerstand leisten, ich sagen könne. Die zwiefache Vorstellung eines Lebens im Menschenkörper wird in der dialektischen Schwebe gehalten. Auf sie wäre Adornos bekannte Sentenz zutreffend, dass es kein richtiges Leben im Falschen gebe. Topos des Todes An der acht kanal video installation mit Titel More Sweetly Plays the Dance lässt sich darstellen, wie die poetische Kraft des Werks und dessen politische Ikonologie zusammengehören. Die Arbeit führt in eine existenzielle Form des dialektischen Umschlags hinein. In Südafrika, so erläutert Kentridge, ist es üblich, dass der Bischof einer christlichen Kongregation seine eigene Blechbläserkapelle unterhält. Im Totentanzmotiv seit dem 14. Jahrhundert treffen alle Schichten vom Kaiser, Fürsten und Bischof bis zum Bettler im Totentanz zusammen. Der Tod spart keinen aus. More Sweetly Plays the Dance kommt von Paul Celans Todesfuge, wo nicht dem Tanz, sondern der Tod süßer gespielt werden soll. Dichter und bildender Künstler platzieren ihre musikalisch konnotierten Werke in die Lücke zwischen hier und dort. In dieser Lücke, drüben hinterm Dorfe, steht auch der Leiermann aus Schuberts Winterreise, die Kentridge bewundert, der er einen Teil seines Oeuvres gewidmet hat. Die Allegorie des Todes tritt ebenfalls als Zwillingsbild hervor, im Umschlag ihrer Bedeutungen. In ihrem Bezug auf Selan enthält die Arbeit die sadistische Seite der Allegorie. Dada Masilo im Spitzentanz mit Gewehr, Gewalt im Gewand klassischer Schönheit. Gewalt, die schön ist. Die Rolle des Todes als Peiniger, Meister aus Deutschland, fällt hier wieder dem Kanzelpauker zu, der Wahrheit besitzt und Recht behält. Er überträgt sein Bild in zwei Randfiguren. Rechts zieht einer, der dem Befehl untersteht, seinen Karren. Links äfft ihn der falsche Bruder nach oder anders gewendet, der echte Bruder, der die Falschheit entlarvt. Diktatur fordert beides heraus, Unterwerfung und Widerstand. Die physische und intellektuelle Gewalt findet ihr negatives Echo in versehrten und an Infusionsschläuchen hängenden Figuren der Prozession. Der existenzielle Aspekt des Todestanzes bringt das friedliche Bild des Todes mitten im Leben hervor. Die Figuren durchschreiten die acht Projektionswände scheinbar kontinuierlich. Dabei treten sie bei jedem Bildwechsel kaum merklich über eine Schwelle ins nächste Bild. Der Graben von hier nach da wird ständig überschritten. Seine Zeit fällt nicht erst auf das Ende des Lebens. Das Sinnbild des Todes mitten im Leben macht die menschliche Existenz ganz. Die Kunst des synchronisierten und verschobenen Doppelgängerbildes, die Kentridge betreibt, ähnelt der Geschichte selbst, die von merkwürdigen Übereinstimmungen und Widersprüchen, von Brüchen, Rissen und falschen Verbindungen durchzogen ist. Politische Ikonologie auf dem Wege des visuellen Denkens ist eine dialektische Methode, in der Bilder Wahrheit verbergen und aufdecken, wenn sie Mimikrie mit ihrem Gegenbild betreiben. Topos der Migration. In einem Ausstellungsraum kommen wandernde Figuren als analoge Bilder in verschiedenen Techniken zusammen. Ihr Material und ihre Ausführung tragen jeweils eigene Konnotationen ein. Menschen tragen Betten, Stühle, ganze Hausstände auf dem Rücken. Eine Serie großer Wandteppiche trägt den Titel Porter Series, Serie der Träger. Gabriele Guercio 
hat in einem Aufsatz über die Tapestries gezeigt, dass Teppiche, die zusammengerollt und mitgenommen werden können, kulturgeschichtlich selbst eine nomadische Form darstellen. Bilder auf dem Weg sagen etwas über die Menschen auf dem Weg, die auf diesen Teppichen über Landkarten eines französischen Schulatlanten aus dem 18. Jahrhundert abgebildet sind. Auf suggestive Weise, schreibt Guercio, beschwören Kentridge's Tapestries ein Szenario menschlicher Bewegung und Nähe in einem weltumfassenden Maßstab. Der Porter with Chairs vor einer Landkarte von Norwegen und Dänemark, der für das Plakat unserer Ausstellung genommen wurde, tut einen großen Schritt über Hamburg hinweg. Der Redner im Film von 1975 hatte einen Stuhl in Grund und Boden geredet. Der Bildner ist ein Träger, der sich dem Material und seiner Last unterstellt. Die Pylon Lady, eine vogelige Dame auf Beinen aus Leit Leitungsmasten, schreitet durch Deutschland und seine angrenzenden Länder im Süden und im Osten, so der übersetzte Titel der Landkarte. Sie ist einmal mehr ein beschädigtes Übergangswesen zwischen Mensch, Tier und Technik. Ihre Herkunft von ausgerissenem Tonpapier über einem vorgefundenen Druckerzeugnis bleibt im gewebten Bild erkennbar. Die Teppiche werden in Margaret Stevens Tapestry Studio, das 1963 in Swasiland gegründet wurde, hergestellt. Im Medium definiert sich als durchlässig, von den Zeichnungen angefangen, verbunden mit Druckgrafik, Collage, Tanz und Schattentheater, im Austausch zwischen Kunst und Kunsthandwerk. Auch das Medium ist ein Nomade, ganz passend zu den Bildern von Menschen auf dem Weg, die Schwellen überschreiten und sich selbst immer als andere erleben. Die Print-Collagen mit Titel Lampedusa zeigen ebenfalls Menschen auf dem Weg, auch die Boat People. Sie bestehen aus bis zu 30 Holzschnitten auf unterschiedlich großen Papierbögen, die vor Ort unter einer Transparentfolie, die ihre Lage markiert, zu den monumentalen Trägerfiguren erst zusammengeschoben werden. Den Vorgang zeigt ein Video in der Ausstellung. Eine Verbindung vom Poetischen mit dem politischen Zeitgeschehen ziehen die ausgestellten Druckstöcke Flood Woodblocks. Die lose abgelegten Holzstücke halten das Bild des Schiffbruchs in sich. Vergleiche mit Caspar David Friedrichs Eismeer und Jerichos Floß der Medusa werden aufgerufen, zumal das Wort Medusa in Lampedusa enthalten ist. Ertrinkende klammern sich im offenen Meer an Treibholz. Etymologisch kommt Scheitern vom Zerbrechen von Holz in Scheite. Die Druckgrafiken aus diesen Holzstücken kehren den Zerfall um, nicht ins Leben zurück, wo Menschen alles aufgeben mussten oder auf der Überfahrt ertrunken sind. Ein Gedenk ihrer Brüche und Risse treten die monumentalen Schattenfiguren mit Titel Widows of Lampedusa, eine Form des Nachlebens an zwischen Verlust und Erinnern. Sie übertragen sich der Betrachterin als wandernde, untote Bilder. Verlust und Erinnerung. Woher kommt bei dem etablierten Künstler Kentridge die Empathie für Menschen, die alles verloren haben? Im Interview mit Koyo Kuo, das im Katalog abgedruckt ist, tritt er dafür ein, dass Menschen einfühlsam verstehen können, was nicht ihre eigene Erfahrung ist. Kentridge's Bilder sorgen, ruhelos und heimatlos wie sie sind, selbst für ihre Übermittlung. Ihre schockhafte, lückenhafte Erfahrung legt Zeugnis ab von der mühsamen Konst Rekonstruktion der Erinnerung. Adorno mokiert sich über das Wort Migrationshintergrund, wenn er 1944 im amerikanischen Exil bemerkt, das Vorleben des Immigranten wird bekanntlich annulliert. 
Hier ist es die geistige, heute ist es die geistige Erfahrung, die für nicht übertragbar und schlechterdings artfremd erklärt wird. Die nicht verdinglicht wird, die immer bloß als Gedanke und Erinnerung fortlebt. Sie heißt Hintergrund und erscheint als Appendix der Fragebogen nach Geschlecht, Alter und Beruf. Zitat Ende. Die Kehrseite ist der Wunsch nach Anerkennung des beschädigten, geschändeten Lebens, nach der Übertragung der fortlebenden Bilder, die man als Heimat mit sich trägt. Kentrichs Familie hat eigene Migrationserfahrungen. Ein Großvater ist um 1900 aus Litauen nach Südafrika ausgewandert. Teile der Familie leben in Kanada und London. Kentridge reist einen großen Teil des Jahres für Performances, Ausstellungen und Vorträge um die Welt. Die Differenz von Heimat und Fremde ist überdies tägliche, tägliche Erfahrung eines Lebens in Johannesburg, wo das ehemalige Geschäftszentrum der Goldstadt aufgegeben und in den Vorort Rosebank verlegt wurde. Im Stadtzentrum von Johannesburg haben sich um 2015 Kriegsgeflohene aus umliegenden Ländern, vor allem Simbabwe, völlig verarmt in offen gelassenen früheren Geschäfts- und Bankhäusern niedergelassen. Auch wenn die demokratische Nachapartheidsgesellschaft jetzt einen gesunden Mittelstand erlebt, bleibt das provisorische Leben geflohener Menschen krasser sichtbar als hier in Europa. Kentridge's prothesenhafte Figuren sind Sinnbilder politischer Gegenwart. Sie bilden Allegorien eines beschädigten Lebens, die nicht zuletzt deshalb leicht zur Betrachterin hinüberwandern, weil er und sie die eigene unsichere Existenz in ihnen antrifft. Tränen Der Film Kaboom ist eine Armee von zwei Millionen afrikanischer Träger im Ersten Weltkrieg gewidmet, die von den jeweiligen Kolonialherren gezwungen wurden, deren Kriegshandlungen auf dem afrikanischen Kontinent zu begleiten. Es gab am Ende eine Million Opfer, hauptsächlich Zivilisten. Der Ausstellungstitel Why Should I Hesitate bezieht sich auch auf diese Arbeit, das verpasste Zögern der rekrutierten Soldaten einem Krieg gegenüber, der nicht ihrer war. Im Film geht ein breiter Wasserfall langsam und stetig über die Fallkante ins Bodenlose. Wasser nimmt immer den einfachsten Weg des geringsten Widerstands. Der Wasserfall erinnert mich auch an überfließende Augen. Das Entsetzen des Zeugen wandelt sich. Er trauert um den Lauf der Geschichte. Die Frage nach dem Warum bleibt unbeantwortet. God's opinion is unknown. Für das Handicap des Betrachters hat Kentridge eine Prothese erfunden. Das Emotionale, so der Plot der Arbeit aus Sentimental Machine, verkörpert sich in der Allegorie des überlaufenden Auges. Der überlaufenden Augen. In der poetischen Maschine eines Tränenfängers, dessen Leitungen offenbar nach unten zum Herzen führen, wird das melancholische Auge zum bewahrenden Organ der Geschichte, wenn es auch selbst der unsicherste Zeuge ist. Bewahren Der Reading Room ist ein Raum des Bewahrens. Neben ausliegenden Katalogen, die den retrospektiven Charakter der Ausstellung unterstützen, 
erinnert eine Schrankwand mit Regalen und Schubladen an die Form der barocken Wunderkammer mit Bildern, verschlüsselten Sinnsprüchen, Kästen und Schachteln, eine Kuriositätenkammer, in der Absonderliches und Seltsames aufgehoben wird. Denkfiguren sind nicht wissend. Ich habe hier ein paar von diesen Karten in der oberen linken Ecke vergrößert. Nicht wissen, verschieben, zögern, zittern, träumen, das Ende offen lassen. Die Wunderkammer legt die allegorische Betrachtung ihrer Objekte nahe und lädt ein zu einem nochmaligen Gang durch die komplexe Ausstellung mit einem Blick, der hinter den Bildern die Sinnbilder sieht. Ich hoffe, ich konnte etwas von den Vektoren zeigen, die das Oeuvre von Kentridge auf Uneindeutigkeit anlegen. Die Frage nach der Wahrheit, so zeigt dieses Werk, führt ihre Rückseite immer mit sich. Bilder adaptieren die Fähigkeit ihrer Motive, Schwellen zu überschreiten. Themen der Migration verbinden sich mit Wanderung und Übertragungen in der Form. Die Bildräume sind daher keine neutralen Behälter, sondern wechseldeutig und selbst durchlässig für das, was in ihnen geschieht. Die Störung, Zerrissenheit und der Zwiespalt der Bilder von William Kentridge Ihre Verschiebung in der Synchronisation, eben die Strategie des dialektischen Bildes, behauptet jenen Ort, an dem das Politische und das Poetische wirkkräftig zusammenkommen. Vielen Dank. Now I have the pleasure to introduce you to our panel three, which takes a close look at the interaction between music and visual arts in the work of William Kendridge. The very prominent participants of our last talk in this symposium are the artist William Kendridge himself, directly from his studio in Johannesburg, Georges Delnon, the artistic director of the Hamburg State Opera, Markus Hinterhäuser, the artistic director of the Salzburg Festival, and last but not least, Philip Miller, composer from Cape Town, who has cooperated with William Kentridge on many musical projects. Among the various artistic disciplines within William Kentridge's work, music has always played a very special part. Kentridge uses sound and music in his animated films, in theater pieces, in performance lectures, in his opera stagings, and in his multimedia installations. In some of Kentridge's works, the relation between sound and image even becomes the main focus of his artistic reflections. The film and song cycle, Paper Music, composed by Philip Miller, is an amazing example of this practice, and it is going to be one of the topics in this conversation. Besides paper music, the panel will look at William Kentridge's productions of operas, like Alban Berg's Lulu and Wozzeck, and his staging of the song cycle Winterreise by Franz Schubert. During the event, excerpts of these fantastic productions are being shown. The panel is moderated by the Hamburg-based journalist and art historian Melanie von Bismarck. Melanie von Bismarck has worked as an editor in the field of film and television and as a freelance cultural journalist for Northern German broadcasting, as a writer for various cultural institutions and as host of many cultural events. Thank you so much, dear Melanie, for moderating this talk. Now I wish everybody a pleasant and interesting time with this panel. Hello and good afternoon to everybody who is listening to us, to all our viewers, to the third panel of this symposium about the work of William Kentridge. And thanks so much to all the speakers who join us. Markus Hinterhäuser from Salzburg, George Delnon from Hamburg, Philip Miller from 
Cape Town, and of course, William Kentridge from Johannesburg. Thank you that you're all here. We are going to talk about and on the interaction between music and image in the work of William Kentridge. And I'd like to introduce the speakers very briefly. Of course, I start with William Kentridge, but I do not have to introduce him. Instead of this, um, some remarks on what we are talking about. As you all know, um, in his work, many artistic disciplines come together. Visual arts like drawing, film, animation, sculpting, and performing arts like dance, music, and theater, and also the literary arts, science, philosophy, politics, history. Mm, the relation between sound and image plays a crucial role in this, and sometimes it becomes even the subject matter of his artistic reflections. Also with us is Philip Miller. Hello, Philip. Hi, hello. Philip is an internationally acclaimed computer, a composer and sound artist based in Cape Town. He lived for many years in Johannesburg. And as William Kentridge himself, he experienced the hardened, difficult years of fight against apartheid, which is also reflected in his musical work. Philip studied classical music, but part of his musical language is traditional music from South Africa. There are church choirs or the sounds from the street. There is a long artistic partnership between William Kentridge and Philip, which dates back, back to 1994. Philip Miller wrote the score for many of William's animated films and for most of his performances and concerts, which afterwards usually become multi-channel installations. I also warmly welcome Markus Hinterhäuser, who since October 2016 is the artistic director of the Salzburger Festspiele. He invited William Kentridge to stage Alban Berg's opera Wozzeck at the Salzburger Festspiele which became a big success and was staged last year at the Met in New York. Markus Hinterhäuser also performed as a solo pianist and chamber musician. Markus Hinterhäuser also performed as a solo pianist and chamber musician. And he was artistic director of the Wiener Festwochen from 2014 to 2016. And in these years, he could win William Kentridge for another highly acclaimed project, the staging of Franz Schubert's song cycle, Die Winterreise. Markus Hinterhäuser accompanied the singer Matthias Görner on the piano, and we will talk about it, and we, we will hear some parts of it. And last but not least, welcome to George Delnant. Since 2015, he's the artistic director, intendant, as we say, of the Hamburg State Opera, and the Hamburg Philharmonic State, State Orchestra. Born in Switzerland, he did opera stagings in Europe, America, and Asia. His stations as artistic director include Koblenz, Mainz, and the Theater Basel from 2006 to 2015, where he won the award Opera House of the Year two times in a row. George Dernan has always been an advocate of interdisciplinary art forms. And he is, as I know, a big admirer of the work of William Kentridge. Um, and I'm very happy to have you here with your expertise. So the first round, I would like to, to start. I would like to ask you a question which you are welcome to answer in more detail. And I would like to begin with you, William. Music pervades your work, your animated movies, the multidisciplinary performance installations. But everything starts when you are all alone in the studio drawing. Is it this early in the process of creativity that music is involved, plays a role? I suppose that animated films, which is, and Filmmaking has been the heart of a lot of the work I've made. And this is obviously, in, its, in essence, something that moves through time. And music is another art form that moves through time. 
And over the last 25 years, Philip Miller and I have had an ongoing relationship which has to do with seeing how music changes what you hear and what you see changes what you, sorry, that the music changes what you see and what you see changes what you hear. So it's not as if the drawings are first made in the studio and completed and then Philip is asked to write music to the, to the film. It's very early on, after the first few weeks of work, when there's some fragments to show, um, Philip would come and we'd listen to many different kinds of music, some by Philip, some by other composers, to try to see what is the logic of the relationship between the music and the image. And very often we find that there needs to be a kind of, particularly with animation, a kind of motor somewhere in the, in the music that helps you actually see the flickering images in front of you. So it's, it's not, it's very much deep in the engine of what it is to experience the film. And that's developed from very early on. Uh, a little other question concerning this. Um, I uh, think I read somewhere, or I heard you saying that drawing is some kind of dance and that it is, of course, a movement. And that was uh, my uh, thought that it might be uh, provide a rhythmic structure already moving back and forth and drawing in the studio. So there is a movement. It's very, it, you know, drawing is a very physical uh, activity. It's, you know, it's, it's an embodiment from either the shoulders or the whole body or the elbow or the wrist, but it's very much, but it's also slowed down enormously. So it wouldn't really help to say, let me put on the piece of music we're thinking of using for this film and draw while that is playing. That doesn't, that doesn't work, particularly with animation where you may spend three days to do a 20 second piece of filming. Um, it's a different, it, it, it's not the same, it, it wouldn't help. You can't draw in time to the music and think then that the drawing will be in time with a piece of music afterwards. Mm -hmm. they, it goes through a whole, time gets sort of dis, dismantled in the studio and spread out and then gathered together and sent back out. So it's when it gets gathered together that one starts listening and seeing what the, what the image and the sound do together. But it is, you're right, it's a very physical activity. And in that sense, you might well, while moving, while thinking, this is the movement of an image of a piece of paper floating across a landscape, it does become both turned into counting, but also into a pulse that might be in the body. And then the key is finding a sound and the music or a rhythm that helps propel that piece of paper. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Philip, um, William just talked about your collaboration. Can you tell us when it started, how it started, how it developed? And I have another question you might answer in this. Um, are there artistic means you utilize in your music that can be compared with artistic means that William uses? Um, <laughs> If, if you understand what I mean. <laughs> well, as you mentioned, uh, we started off, I started, William uh, approached me to look at a film that in fact was a finished film, which was from the Soho Epstein series, Felix in Exile. And in fact, that had um, been certainly edited to, or certainly the, the, the kind of original soundtrack had been a slow movement of the Dvorak string quartet, I think in F, can't remember the opus. No, I don't know. And, and uh, what happened was that uh, in that beginning of that process where I did score so-called the film in a more traditional way with often in more commercial uh, surroundings or uh, methods, um, even in that film, which came, the music came at the end, What I, uh, I remember really very interestingly enough was that good. William had a piece yeah. of, of song that had been sung actually by the I late Marlowe. And uh, it was a piece, a piece of traditional, I think it was a call hymn. And he layered that. It was a decision I remember the time that he did. And I was quite sort of taken aback by my very nice formally written 
uh, string trio. And that for me was really the first time I understood also about the notion of collaging and layering. And so it's an interesting form. I often refer back to it because in fact, things changed a lot after that. And as William has said, the few, as projects developed and as we developed a kind of grammar between sound and image and a broad this relationship, um, this fascinating relationship, which is one always that surprises them what sound you use with what image and what image you use with what sound. It, it always is full of surprises. And I mean, I think another thing that happened in this process of learning, learning um, a kind of language together was that, um, and again, this was something interesting for me that William would say, well, this piece you've written here for an explosion of teacups, why don't we put this under an image of a of a uh, of a of a way to a, of a machine, and suddenly it was more interesting in somewhere else than what I had imagined. So again, things started to move, and that's certainly the notion also then of what you might want to call um, a kind of aleatoric. I don't want to use that word, the cage notion of aleatoric music, because it's not just throwing things on the ground and letting them fall, but starting to really um, try things in different places. Don't, I mean, you know, so there's a kind of level of which we're, we are playing without the specific answers and freeing oneself up from perhaps what you expect a sound or a piece of music should happen with an image. So that was, I suppose, how the process developed. Um, and then the kind of eventually the way of which one could eventually, so in a film like Other Faces, I remember very distinctly, this was also from the Soho Extreme series, seeing uh, these very evocative drawings of a particular bird, a kind of ibis that's in Johannesburg. It's called a hardy dog, which is based on its sound as a very screeching bird sound. And uh, I remembered seeing that and then immediately responding to that sound with a wonderful singer. And I'll talk more about the value of singing, the way I work with collaboration with singers and musicians, that I, we created a small bird-like sound for that bird that became an impetus for a lot of that film. So, um, and that sound sort of gets fed back to William and, and that's when there's this conversation. So perhaps I should stop there. <laughs> I see, it's not that easy. It's not one begins, the next finishes. It's all interwoven. Yes, exactly. It's interwoven. George, um, William Kentridge opera stagings comprise Monteverdi's uh, Ritorno di Lisse in Patria as a puppet uh, uh, play, I, uh, I remember. Um, with another name, Mozart's Zauberflöte, Shostakovich's Die Nase, Alban Berg's Lulu Berg's Wojcik, Wojcik. How did you experience these opera stagings and uh, what, is, what is, from your point of view, the very special thing about his opera stagings? So perhaps uh, f first I would like to excuse my bad English is still bad since 40 years, but uh, I do my best. Uh, perhaps to say I, I'm coming extremely from the theater and, and the music. And when I came to Basel uh, 2006, it was for me a, a new world because I, I, I met a lot of people like Sam Keller and Art Basel and all this uh, this museum um, world in Basel, and for me, it was really how do you say it? to to uh, something totally new. Uh, until there, I, I thought really in in theater or in opera, but never thought we could combine this sort of art with with our work. And for me, it was really something. I, I it's a thrill. It was a thrill, and so I I. Um, so uh, works from William Kentridge there the first time. Also in every Art Basel fair, there were uh, Kentridge to see and I was very fascinated. And so I, I be began to in be interested in, and of course I discovered that had he made operas and, and um, I thought 
And I think still now, when I, when I think about uh, head under load, uh, the head under load, he, he's really the one who can bring everything together like nobody else. And um, so in this Basel time, we, we did a lot of cooperation with Art Basel and we made a lot of interesting projects uh, with, with artists, uh, with uh, Hans Ulrich Obrist, who, who curated this. And uh, so, and as a funny story, I remember to, to, to understand things. Uh, I, uh, once in Basel, I, I phoned Mr. Kentridge. He, of course, didn't know who I am. <laughs> and I said, oh, I saw a lot of operas of you. And I had an incredible idea, Parsifal from Wagner. And then there were a long, long silence, a long silence. <laughs> and then he said, you know, I need pieces which there is a lot of action. <laughs> and then I understood, okay, this is, this is I, and perhaps I'm wrong, uh, yeah, but um, right. you remember? <laughs> but I do remember, and I, my view on me being the wrong person for Parsifal continues. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and but since then we talked, we talked several times, and I still hope we, we will do something together in Hamburg, perhaps. And uh, but for me, it's really the, the point. I, I never met somebody who can bring all these arts together like, like him. And I think uh, this is really a source uh, for a lot of artists. And we see it now who, who, who begin to, to use just in COVID times where we cannot uh, do normal theater for, for, for the audience, we begin to think about very new new thing for us, but for you, it's already <laughs> old things, but like, like animation, animation films, and uh, it became really a, a new optic also for, for opera. We are also doing a graphic opera now, uh, and this is the first time, and I think this has a lot to do with, with your work. I have uh, another question to you, George Denon, um, which I also want to ask Markus Hinterhäuser. When I think, look at you as, as uh, opera directors, and I see William Kentridge's opera stagings, I'm in the middle of a storm of signs. There is so much to see and so much to hear, and there are so many layers. And uh, I wonder whether for an opera director that he might be hesitating and saying, uh, this vivid animation movies, this liveliness draws too much attention away from the text, from the content of, of the opera. Is that so? Because I, me as, as a visitor in, in an opera, I have difficulties to understand the text always. Um, so, uh, and then comes William and, and it is, it is like, yes, it's a storm of science. What do you think as an opera? Is it, is it, is it a danger? Is it dangerous to get, are you a little bit afraid that it could tear the attention away? I think there is no good direction without risks. And uh, of course it's a danger, but it's a good danger. And I think that the really big difference between theater, opera, and, and for instance, film, is that uh, you are free to, to see what you want as audience. You can look at what you want to look. And it's, it's uh, uh, like a proposal of very, very different things. And they, you can put them together in your head when you see it, but you're very free. And, and uh, I think in, in the shows I saw from, from Mr. Kentridge, I felt very free. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I, I didn't have the feeling one is telling me what I have to see, you know, what I have to look at. So I find it's a very, very uh, big adventure. And uh, yeah, no success if you take no risk. Mm -hmm. Thank you, like George. If I can add something to that. Um, there is. At first, it seems that opera is always a, a form of excess. There's always kind of too much to take in, you're both listening and you're reading and you are um, looking at things in front of you. And so it's always a kind of an imperfect, bastardized viewing to take all these different things in. Um, it is a risk that there are too many images, but I would say this, that in every production we've done, 
between the start of rehearsals and the dress rehearsal, there's a constant reduction of taking bits of image and taking bits of animation and taking bits of film out till it feels that it's cooked in the right way. But some people like their food more underdone and some people prefer it more overdone. So for some people, there are too many images. And others, when you've taken things out, said, oh, you're crazy to have taken the things out. That was really an exciting piece. But it is a kind of tact to work out. You know, it's not images that illustrate the music or the text, but they're sort of at right angles to give you a different thought. The way one's mind does associate. You hear something or you see something and your mind doesn't just investigate that, but the sound or the image sets off a whole series of sideways thoughts. And so it's playing with the idea of a collage of associations that come into the work. And I think what Philip was saying about the surprise of taking music, we expect to work with one piece, with one image, with one kind of thing, and putting it with something very, very different, how often that gives a new impulse to, to hearing and to looking. Yes. Um, yes. We're extraordinarily adept, I think, as human beings to make connection as if it could mean this. Not to say we know what it is, but it could possibly mean that. To work with a kind of provisional construction of the, of the world. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's part of the, the overlay that's there in many of the works. Mm -hmm. Um, Markus Hinterhäuser, um, I would like to, to ask you about this. How do you feel about the operas? Before we start to talk about the Winterreise. Mm. About the operas from William Kent? Yeah, yeah, yeah. About what you, what you just said. Maybe, maybe I just, I just uh, put it straighter. Are there... Is it dangerous for, for, for the comprehensibility of, of the opera? To have these many signs. No, whatever, whatever I, uh, I saw, whatever I was privileged to see from William Cantrid's work uh, regarding opera, of course, there's a remarkable and huge visual information. But it's, I was never intimidated. It was so enriching for me. It was so vitalizing for me. I'm a musician. I'm not an expert of, of visual arts. I'm, I'm a true musician. Yeah, but. I need this kind of this kind of uh, vital situation. How do you deal with music? Um, what does it mean an interaction between between uh, a film and music? I mean, I've seen so many of these attempts to do that, and so many quite uh, problematic things. I've never had the feeling that the visual information uh, could be something. What you mentioned could be something dangerous. It's absolutely not dangerous. It's um, it's the contrary. It's on the contrary. It's something which gives an incredible, incredible view on what an opera, in this case, an opera, can also express. What an opera can communicate. Um, I mean, it's what it is about. I mean, when, whenever I've seen, whenever I've seen in the past and still when I, when I look at Kentridge's works, um, I feel, or I'm, perhaps even I know that they are extremely musical. I mean, William at the beginning said about the physical impact of drawing. Uh, music is essentially a sequence of tones. Music has to do with the sequence of tones, call it melody, call it whatever. Music has to do with the rhythmical quality. Music has to do with form, call it architecture in bigger works. And music has an, a very, very immediate emotional quality in the best cases. Um, and I see William Kendrick's work as, as an extremely musical work. I mean, there's this kind of, this kind of, um, I mean, these drawings, these films are dancing. Uh, the movement, the movement of the music is so, can be so close to the movement of the drawing. The drawing of the movement can be so close to the, draw, uh, to the movement of the, of the, uh, of the music. Uh, and I think there's, there's nothing, it's not a compliment, it's, it's simply what I, what I really feel about, about the interaction of, of film and music and music and film. In the best moments, in the very, very best moments, 
The music is watching the films and the films are listening to the music. This is an experience I had played quite often the winter in the in the Kentridge uh, setting and, and and I mean I for a couple of years I I practically lived in this in this environment and I I remember some of them uh, some of the performances Matthias Gern and I did very very vividly and very strongly and sometimes I mean I watch I watch the films while I'm playing and they have they have an influence on the way how you play. They have a very also sometimes a very spontaneous influence. They change my perception in the very nanosecond. Of course, I cannot I cannot constantly watch the films because I have to I have to do other things. Yeah, but but it's it's incredibly incredibly inspiring and it's it's something which makes me makes me hear the music in a different way. And especially the winter rise was was such a may I say such a personal experience for me also as a, as, a, as a musician as a pianist as a, as an interpreter, mm. and the experience I had with Wozzeck here, for example, in Salzburg, and uh, was different. But I mean, from the very beginning, the precision of William's view on Wozzeck, the precision on the time when Wozzeck uh, was was written, the, the how it was how it was situated in in in, in an, also in a, in a let's say historical context, the precision how to the characters of Wozzeck and Marie and all the all the Leutnants and whoever was was involved in this is involved in the story uh, was in, was incredible. And there was again there was a huge, huge and fantastic uh, visual impact, a visual information, but never disturbing, never intimidating, never, and I really don't like this, this, uh, this, uh, this word in this, in this context, uh, dangerous, absolutely not. Um, there, is, there is something which on, on this level of quality, uh, makes it possible to deal with music. I mean, and this interaction between film and music, as I said, is so special and so um, unusual also. The, 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 the way it's done, the way it's, uh, it's, it's realized is so unusual and, and close now. As far as I remember, my experience in Johannesburg working uh, with William Kentridge on the Winterreise, what you said before is that there is a, a huge, huge amount of material. There's this fantastic, there's this fantastic saying of a, of a very famous French writer, Paul Valéry, uh, and I try to translate these few words, uh, to think is to reduce. And I think this is this is also something. I mean, the 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 reduction that you spoke about, uh, William. This is something I, I also experienced in the work when we we were sitting in your in your in your studio. There is there is a, a huge a huge amount of possibilities, and then it's the the quality, the quality how how you define it in this very very moment. And we 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 worked on a. Certainly not on possible, <laughs> much smaller forms, on the smallest possible form, a song, which in the best cases, and Schubert is the best case of the songs, in the best cases doesn't need a very complicated way through your brain. It goes immediately to another region of your body. It goes immediately to the heart, the best moments of the songs. And these, these, these uh, miniature in a way, I think they were, they were very, I mean, for me, it was extremely, extremely enriching to, to see how an, a visual artist who is, in my view, one of the most musical visual artists I, I can imagine, deals with these, with these small forms and is able to tell an overall story with all the 24 songs and not, not, uh, not uh, deal with, with single things, but have, a, have an overview on the, on the whole cycle. This was really fascinating for me. I mean, okay, we have- Talk a little um, bit about, yeah, to say please. a little bit about uh, Winterreiser. And I mean, there have been two song cycles that I've worked on, which have given me enormous pleasure. 
The one you're talking about was Winterreiser, in which for me it was vital, your role, Marcus, as a kind of musical dramaturg to say, all right, this, this drawing, which had been done for a completely different purpose, yeah. can work with this film. And that, for me, it, was, it took a kind of, I was very reassured to have a musician and a musician, such a serious musician as yourself, to say, this seems so disconnected, but there is a connection which can go through. So that was the one song cycle. The other song cycle was the series of songs of called Paper Music, a song cycle uh, written by Philip Miller, which used some things we'd done years before, and then a whole series of newly worked pieces, which were real collaboration between musical ideas and visual ideas and putting them together. So the Schubert, the music was a kind of a given. And yeah. the other one, it was constructing the songs also. But both of them, I think the miniature form for me was a real pleasure. Animation by its nature is very hot, slow and so a three minute animation feels like a solid piece or a nine minute animation can feel like an epic. So the song form between sort of three and five minutes feels a very good match between the kind of drawing and um, that musical form. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it was in a lecture where you asked um, what made you think that Franz Schubert's music composed 1827 in Germany could possibly work with animated movies produced, created in South Africa today? So the is well, reason why it shouldn't uh, work. Well, one of the things about it, and this is something that Philip and I discovered 20 years before, which is that for a lot of the animated films, there needs to be a kind of a wheel turning, an engine turning somewhere in the music that helps it going. And the, the winterizer in almost all the songs, somewhere you can feel the walking of the man on this winter's journey. And so there's something somewhere, whether it's always not necessarily, but often in the left hand, something that helps propel it along. And then the fact of questions of loss, of grief, of despair, of hope, all the themes that are there in Winterreiser, you know, they're not exclusive to the early 19th century. They, they fit through. It also has to do with an early childhood memory of my father listening to Winterreiser that made them quite a, you know, it's a song cycle that was most familiar to me from childhood. So it was just, he'd play it on the gramophone after lunch and lie on the sofa listening to them. And so it felt, uh, it felt familiar, even though I didn't know which the songs were or what the songs necessarily uh, meant. Um, and we took, a, we took a chance. We'd say, let's see what happens. We tried. We had a very fascinating morning with uh, Marcus and Bernard Fokrul, who was the head of the festival in Aix-en-Provence at the time we were doing an opera. And we said, we know we want to work with a short form. Maybe it will be a song cycle. Maybe it will be a chamber opera. But let us look at what music does to the film. So I had with me on my computer 10 or 12 films, a lot of the films that Philip had written music for before and other films also. And we simply played different music and watched them. We from Janacek's series of songs to Eric Satie's film cycle, song cycles. And it was clear within the first few minutes of watching and listening to uh, some of Schubert that there was a kind of an affinity in the moment of watching it, that you felt, you know, without trying anything, there were moments of accord of the things that felt they were in sync. And when you have that kind of almost random placing of music and image together and they still work, then you know you're onto a good, a fruitful conversation. So you did choose one example from the Winterreiser that we could uh, show here? Yes, we can see. We can either watch it or we can watch part of it. It's the, the last song of the cycle, the Leierman. And the very sad one, the saddest yeah. song and this is, in the this history is from of the, the uh, This is from the performance, I think, in Aix-en-Provence. It's in Aix-en-Provence, yeah. And I'm afraid it still has the time code on the top right-hand corner, so we have to ignore that. Okay.
Yeah, but this was very this is very interesting because I mean what what we've seen now is uh, the last last song of Schubert's Winterreise. Um, this is the end in every every thinkable form, um, and there's something interesting because Schubert Schubert has very very reduced musical material here, extremely reduced, can't be more reduced. Uh, there is something happening in the piano, which which is is a constant constant layer in a way, and above this constant layer, there is the story of this of this Liarman, which Matthias Gerner tells in total freedom. You could say it's totally irregular in a way, which is fantastic because the piano is much more regular. It has to be regular, but in between. These, uh, these, uh, these very, very modest things in the piano in between, uh, there is this freedom. And this freedom is also in, is, is very much related in a, for me in a very, very mysterious way. Uh, this freedom of Matthias Gern is singing the story of this, uh, this, this man uh, and the, the movement, this kind of procession which apparently could be felt as strange to, to what, is, what is telling this last song of Schubert, which is absolutely not the case. Um, this, this is also very irregular what is happening, what is happening uh, in, this, in this movement of these, of these people walking somewhere, don't know where, coming from somewhere, don't know from where, going to in another, I don't know, it has it is so, so many things. Which which um, um, has to do with associations with personal things. It is 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 a is fantastic. I, I haven't seen this for years now, and I was very I was very because it's a it's a parallel composition. William Kentridge did a really parallel composition, but it it speaks. I mean, it, I, I, this is this is the moment where which I which I tried to describe, uh, and I remember this now very well that I was I was really because this is not very demanding for the piano. I was constantly watching, watching this procession there while I was playing. Um, and Matthias couldn't see it, but he knew the film very well. And this is, this is, this was, this is one moment which shows me that the Winterreise is so, such a universal story. Uh, it's not related to a geographical um, parameter, to a, to a local thing. It's, it's so, so, so much more. And you can have this, this, this procession, which is for sure has to do something with Africa, um, certainly not with, with Vienna, certainly not with Austria. But still, I mean, there's a communication. There is, they, they speak to each other. And this is so moving. William, would you like to comment yeah. it? Yes, I would. I mean, the, this was one of the things that we said, here's a piece of film that was done for a very different, which was done from Refusal of Time, a project, uh, project done with many people and Philip as a composer. And it was a journey of people towards a black hole at the end of the series. And so it had a very different music in, that Philip had written in um, Refusal of Time. And for me, it was interesting to say, here one takes one thing that's the same, in this case, the image, and it has a very different music, and how does one then see it? Um, and that was one of the interests in, in Winterreise, seeing familiar works that, one, that I've, my ear is so used to hearing in one way, suddenly hearing it in a different, in a different way. Um, it wouldn't be enough to do an illustration now of this last song. That would be it would have been really no, really silly. No, I think this is, the... it could be a, 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 a snowstorm, an ice storm, a, a solitude, whatever. But the solitude is is so intense of this last song because there's this movement in the um, uh, fr from you. This makes the solitude feel much much more uh, much more existential in a way. If you have nothing against it, we could go on with paper music because in yes, paper I think music so. we have these great examples and uh, I'm sorry but i have to leave now because the rehearsal be begins uh, yes. i just wanted i just wanted to thank a lot and and say i saw in basel paper music and i was fascinated it was really fantastic thank you
Thank you I, very much for joining us. Maybe I could just come in on an uh, interesting point that both Marcus and uh, William has discussed with regard to this last song, the final song, is that because the piano in that song is the engine and it is repetitive in, in, you know, in simplicity and it has a regularity, it perhaps isn't so far from the piece of music that I wrote for the end of time, for refusal of time, because in a sense, it has a similar kind of quality of a procession, both whether it is a single drum beat or whether it is a cluster, or, well, not a cluster, but a sequence of notes, uh, which of course is repeated. It's the kind of motif. And I think there's something interesting in that grammar because that is the grammar that we go back to and we speak about an engine, a sound engine, and the left hand of of the piano part in this Winterizer song, in this final song, is perhaps the, it is a kind of drum, it's an engine. Yeah. And, and it's the freeing of the voice of the singer, of course, that then can hover and play between it. And that's perhaps even in Refusal the Hour, there are so many other things, but that constant beat of that drum, that's the wonderful, uh, percussionist Charlie and Henny plays. Um, I just, I suppose I'm just interested because I think it's perhaps got as far as one, mm -hmm. one can believe when you listen to it, there's these two different pieces of music. There's, mm -hmm. there's something in common. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So which uh, clip would you like to show us now? Which example from paper music could you say something yeah. to it? Um, perhaps we could look at the tango for page turning. And if I could just yeah, mention this is with Joanna Dudley, a frequent collaborator with William, myself. Um, she's performing this piece. I would like to, to, to underline this. Joanna Dudley is, uh, in my point of view, one of the biggest singer performers uh, I can think of. She's just fabulous. And especially in this piece, which we are going to see uh, I'm really a big fan. This, 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 fragile me under, under, under the stars. Be, be, chill, 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 You plucked, plucked, plucked beside and then dance. You brought about and about and about. Kings may mess. Kings may mess. No, now closed. Where I wrote here, alabaster me, 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 me. Why, why to be envied? Those eyelids, eyelids, eyelids. Perfume is old. The power to arose my dead death with with without ghost of Me, 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 me
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, the first thing I would like uh, to mention is that it is Robert Burton, the book. The first one seems to be an encyclopedia. Anatomy of Melancholy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The, the first bestseller concerning depression and burnout and all kinds of melancholy. So I think this music you wrote, Philip, is perfectly fitting to this wonderful piece of film. Um, I've seen your lecture, William, in, in Chicago, where you tried out this, this movie um, combination in combination with other with kinds of music. And I find this one extremely beautiful, I must say. It is a very, very beautiful piece of music. And you know, each time I hear it, I do yes. love what Philip and Joanna did there. And was it Vinnie the pianist? No, it actually was me. And I was slightly feeling self-conscious about it because of course it got performed live by Vincenzo with a much more subtle, um, you know, performance. Uh, so I'm, uh, I have to admit it's me, not Vincenzo. Okay, good, well. <laughs> been played uh, many times with your version, <laughs> many, many times. I mean, maybe I, I could say I, I, why I chose this film, because I suppose it, it touches on so many things in my process and my making process. And firstly, um, I suppose here's a very kind of uh, homage. Also, well, certainly it's a way which I think both I have grown to work with William and William has done this in many times is to work with cut-ups. So it's a kind of sonic version of the William Burroughs cut-up. So in this particular instance, I was, you know, my quotation is from Berlioz's Spectre de la Rose, which I then cut up and then his, his lyrics, the, the text as well. And here was an example where I literally took from a, a lecture with William's Refuse, uh, refusal of time, or one of his Norden lectures, rather, the putting the paper in the hat and shaking the hat and throwing the paper out. And in that instance, I remember sitting with Joanne, we did this together and we cut up things. We literally took it and we cut up bits of score and we cut up bits of text and we put it in a hat and we threw it out and we started to work from that. So that was a kind of very much a kind of very conscious decision to work with cut up and montage. And that's how we built the piece up. Presumably that wasn't the end point, just the cut up pieces. That was the beginning point. That was the beginning point. Doing with Joanna. Correct. I yes. think that's a big, a big yeah. difference. It's a strategy for beginning. I think one of the things that Philip does that's so interesting are different strategies of finding the music with the performers. There are very often a large number of pieces which are developed with the specific performers who will perform them. Mm -hmm. you what they bring and what you are bringing yeah. to them. Joanna is a yeah. prime example where a lot of the work we do is yeah. partly written, partly pulled out of her. Yeah. I mean, I was thinking um, perhaps, you know, this, the, the title of paper music is interesting because I tend not to write, I never start with paper, writing music on paper. And I think there's something interesting in that because by not having a score initially, now, starting with the score, written transcribed score, this is also a way of liberating the performers and the collaborators from the tyranny sometimes of a score of being held. So I think there's something interesting that it's often not a paper score that begins at all. But I think also just to give it a local context in South Africa, a lot of the musicians, a lot of the fantastic musicians that Philip and I have worked with would not have coped with the paper score in a way that a classically trained musician would yes. and to say well the starting point has to be being at ease with a complex score would immediately cut out a large number of really wonderful musicians yeah. to work with so it works in different ways that also are there for the I mean you've written a lot of music which was written on scores for a string quartet that mm -hmm. could play it as a string quartet but there's a whole other way of working with musicians that has been partly demanded by the circumstances of South Africa. Mm. Did I um, 
Um, Dara Masilo is the dancer, the, the great uh, South African dancer. Was she the model for the dancer in this? Completely, completely, because also this piece was originally played as part of a concert performance of uh, Refuse the Hour. And she was the dancer in that. So when this song is being performed, you have a pianist on one side of the stage playing, you have Joanna Dudley at the front of the stage with the microphone singing the song. You have the projection of this book and the pages turning on the screen at the back. And right in the middle of the stage, you have Dada Masilo doing a dance in counterpoint to it. Well, in the end, we may even take that away. And she's sitting next to the, but she's mm -hmm. present on stage. Sometimes we had her actually dancing. Sometimes it was stronger. We felt that she was there almost just looking at the audience while they were watching her both in live and in the projection. So for you, the dance um, of Dara can also be the beginning of a working process? Is it is, it is. There are, I mean, we've had, we've worked on several projects together, um, particularly one notes towards a model opera, um, in which she's this, the, the key performer. Yeah. And in uh, Refuse the Hour, she and I did a kind of duet. It was the closest I could get to taking part in a dance performance. So she would lift her leg up to the ceiling and I could lift my arm that would be parallel to her leg. And that was kind of as close as we got to, I, I could get to, to dancing. In the same way, the closest I can get to conducting or being a musician are the conversations with Marcus or the conversations with Philip mm -hmm. or the working with the singers in an opera. Um, we, Philip once did a series of, of a piece of music, which was really, I think, named for me, which was, I think it was called either Songs or Music for Those Who Should Know Better. Nice. So, Philip, you have prepared another piece. We can listen yeah. and watch. Sure. This is a, a piece called Ebook, and it is with uh, also one of my most long-standing collaborators, and Williams as well. Her name is Anne Messina, and of course, again, the wonderful Joda, Joe Dudley. Ich 
Isn't it great? Isn't this a wonderful performance by these two ladies? Uh, I admire that a lot. And um, of course, you think immediately, you ask yourself immediately, what was first? The, the, the hen or the egg? Uh, <laughs> the, the drawing or the music? How, how did this develop? How did this come up? Uh, this is my memory, and you set your memory in your head, and we'll see if they coincide. Phil. Yeah. Years before, we'd spoken about doing a Johannesburg song cycle, and one of the things we remembered was children's games. We'd go ching chum, and you'd show either paper or scissors, or scissors or a rock, and it had a pum pum pa, pum pum pa was kind of the, and we tried it there, and then it didn't ever go anywhere. It didn't ever. It was kind of abandoned, but it must have sat in Philip's head because maybe it was five years later or six years yeah. later, I don't know how many years later. Yes. You presented me with the music and I'd completely forgotten about the other thing. Yes. And so I think in this case, there was a rhythm and a call and response that was there. Yeah. And then we started, I started doing the pages and then the pages were put down to the music and then at a certain point, uh, the tree was painted and you developed, I don't know, that's my memory. No, I mean, you're absolutely right, William, and I forgot that, the ching, the game, completely right, um, which is always interesting because one of them is paper, and you, to, again, you don't think of these things now, but the one game was you, had, you, could, you could win if you had the scissors to cut the paper, which <laughs> is a nice thought. But anyway, um, I think what's interesting was also that what happened was I started to work on a small chamber opera around mining. And you were also looking at registers of mine. So we were both sort of, there was a sort of parallel thing happening. And I found in an old bookshop, a, a dictionary of Fanegalore, and perhaps I should explain what that was. Um, and Fanegalore is a sort of polyglot of, what we'd call the Nguni languages of Southern Africa. So a mixture of both Isizulu, Xhosa, a bit of Afrikaans, English, uh, Shona, because it goes up into Zimbabwe. And it was used primarily, firstly, on the mines um, as a kind of language for people of different mother tongues to sort of understand each other. But it also had a very strong um, let's call it, uh, uh, it, it came out of apartheid, it came out of the, the mining structures of power where the, um, this allowed 
mine bosses, managers, people in, in charge of authority to speak to mine workers. So it's a very, um, a very difficult actually now to look at it. It's, it's, it's a hard language. It's a hard, it's sort of, it's, let's call it a sort of pigeon language. I use that in inverted commas. It's a language that is, carries a lot of power, pain, because it is really a language that was then also used domestically between maybe a housewife um, or it doesn't have to be, a, a, let's say uh, uh, it was used between servants and their um, bosses. It's like it also worked in a domestic situation. So as it has a very particularly, um, yeah, uh, a, a very resonant thing with apartheid, time of apartheid, this language. And where I worked with the song, and it was something that I thought about, um, I wanted to invert, because there's also, it was a dictionary that normally, um, I, I was curious about how we could switch the dictionary around and allow Anne to really teach Joanna. And here we are using, you know, the, the question of Anne being a black South African with her home language as Isizulu and, and Joe being the white madam again and playing with the power relationship that this language uses and inverting it. I'm not sure if I've been that eloquent in trying to explain it. No, I understand a lot. Thank you very much for this explanation that uh, gives us a background of the whole. Thank you very much. But yeah, but there was a lot of fun to it as you can see as well. So I've, I've sort of given you both, there's a con, and the fun was in the playing with, they have fun as you can see, they have tremendous fun. It's part of also, that Anne can sort of take up her authority against Joe and sort of throw these words as William throws these pens and the, you know, all these fantastic images that get sort of thrown up. She does it to Anne and, and you know, it becomes a sort of almost like a, a match, tennis match. Yeah, for so, us who, who do not know about the background, it's, uh, it's all about energy. It's, it's, it's this anthem, this uh, Wechselgesang, uh, which is accelerating all the time and, and bursting in the end. So it's, it, it works yeah. on different yeah. levels and uh, pff, yeah. wonderful. I mean, it's interesting because that was the first time it was performed, hence the sort of relief from the singers at the end, where there's almost a, a moment almost of corpsing. But um, in, in, it was sung in, in Bargello in Flor Florence at the festival. That, and of course, most people would not know if you, unless you were South African, of what this language is about. And that's great, you know, that's also fantastic. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and, and it works on different levels, yeah. William, do, you, would you like no, to I add? I think it's a, it's a great song and they're a great duo. And it, again, it's a piece that is developed with the two singers playing with it again. And it could now be performed by other players. It's, exists as a score, as a conventional piece of music that could be performed by other people, but that it's, I mean, it's been a great privilege that so many of the pieces of music have been performed by people who've developed them, both with the music of Philip, but also, for example, in Winterreiser, that Marcus was there both in terms of the talking about it, the developing it, but then also the performer. So he was both a kind of musical dramaturg, but then also the performer. And that's, that feels a a piece of great good fortune. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To um, have that sense all the way through. I wonder, I have here on my list a question concerning opera and your yes. being attracted by opera, which um, might seem strange because um, the opera is a world of rules and regulation and precision. And as far as I know, you also like, um, appreciate working with chance and with imperfection. Uh, uh, um, how does this go together? I think that the two answers, the one is that the having worked and working in opera gives so many new ideas for other projects which are not a strict opera in an opera house, like The Head and the Load, which is an opera in all other senses. It's musically driven. It has a mixture of word and text and set and things you're watching. But I think, you know, and I like to think of the operas that I do in 
different. You can either think, okay, I'm the director, I'm hired to do this libretto with this piece of music and that's my job and thank you, then it's done. I think of it in a different way. I think I'm this extremely fortunate artist and somebody says, here is a canvas or a sheet of paper that is 17 meters wide, 12 meters high, and you can do what you, you like on it. Not only that, but we will throw in an orchestra of 80 people to play for you. And not only that, we will find you the best singers in the world. We will find you a great set designer, a great costume designer. You can make this four-dimensional, two-hour-long drawing across in the space. We will find an audience that comes to watch it. Um, here is the, you know, it then has, so that's the, the freedom and the openness. Then come the two constraints. These are the words, and this is the music. So there has to be something in any opera that I do of some theme that expands beyond the specifics of that. So in, um, in Magic Flute, it had to do with the nature of the enlightenment. In Lulu, it has to do with the instability of objects of desire. With uh, the nose, it has to do with the absurd and the division of the self. So there has to be some thought that will expand outside of it, which can be examined using that music and using that text. So that's the, that's the kind of the, the way it seems to me an extraordinarily generous offering by the intendants of the opera houses that invite me to do a project there. And it obviously has to do, be something that works for them in terms of their shaping of their programs but it also has to work in that way for, for me and the team. Um, and yes, I think that there are, there are times when you're pushing against the edges of a specific libretto or times when you, oh, if only we could stop the music and expand it and let this moment, I mean, it drives me crazy that Albenberg left out half of the child story in Wozzeck. Mm -hmm. I almost said, okay, can we stop it there and just tell the full child story that is so wonderful? And Murray only tells a third of it, I think, and then it's... Um, but, and there may be context in which that is possible to, as it were, stretch or contract or play with the music, a bit as we did in Ulisse, in the larger operas, by and large, um, we've stuck pretty closely to the, certainly to all the notes of the music and mostly to the texts as they are in the libretto. Let's talk uh, a little bit about Wozzeck. Markus Hinterhauser, how did this project come into being? Did you um, invite William? Uh, so Remember, Marcus, uh, yeah. uh, sorry, no, William, please. No, no, no. You, um, I'd done a production of, of uh, Wozzeck, oh. which a handspring of the puppet company, one of the first productions we did in, they were then a Johannesburg-based company, in which we transformed, we'd taken the Buchner script, but we'd set it entirely in South Africa. It worked very well transposing a uh, private in the army into an unemployed man in Johannesburg, whose girl is taken over by a person who's got a regular job, who's much more elegant, who's much stronger. And it had to do with the desperation and violence of poverty which is uh, obviously one of the key themes of Wozzeck. And when, for many years, when people said, why don't you do a Wozzeck? I said, I've done a Wozzeck. I can't imagine doing another one. And then we did the Albenberg Lulu, which is really hard work. It's very, very long. It's enormous. And when re-listening to the Berg Wozzeck, you suddenly thought every note is kind of perfect. It's so pared mm. down, even though it's a huge orchestra the actual progression of the scenes is. And so when Marcus came saying, let's do a Wozzeck, it was a fantastic opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, and in this case, it shifted obviously from being set in South Africa and the South African production, we working with South African performers here when you were going to be working with, uh, it was in Europe, it was going to be in Austria. And the First World War became a kind of a natural setting for it both in its militarism, but also in the time in which Albenberg was writing the, the opera. And uh, there are so many points of affinity in the play written by Buchner 60 years before to that period, the sense of this image of explosions tearing the world and the sky apart, 
which were pure aberrations in 1830, but were descriptions of those huge explosions in the, in the trenches and the mines and in the um, tunnels of the, of the First World War. So in that sense, and then the question of the doctors, there's a wonderful Karl Krauss novel play, the Lester Tagen von den Menschheit, The Last Days of Mankind, in which there are a lot of descriptions of officers and captains and doctors. And then reading that, I suddenly thought, but this is so close to what Buchner is writing, this description of that world of the First World War to Buchner. So that was the, that was the origin of, for me, of that particular mm -hmm. project. Sorry, Marcus, hey. that was a long answer. No, but it's, uh, it's, uh, that's, that's it. <laughs> I, I, got to know, I got to know William and we, we were in Vienna and uh, it was in 2014. Mm. And uh, I had the courage to ask him. I, I explained to him that it's, it would be very likely that I get the job at Salzburg. And if, I, if they asked me to be, to, to be the director of the Salzburg Festival, I was very brave and I said, you have to promise me that you have to come to Salzburg. And I, I, knew, the, I knew the Wozzeck production, uh, William did. And, and uh, I mean, for different reasons, I thought it should be, should be of interest for, for Kentridge to, to approach the opera from Berg. Um, and apparently, I was right. <laughs> yeah. and it, was, it was a fantastic, fantastic result. I mean, this is really, it was so impressive. Um, I was, uh, as the director, I have the privilege to, to, to be at the, at the rehearsals and see how, to, how, how these things go together and, and develop. And you said about imperfection. This is, um, I've never seen, never seen a director who is so perfectly organized. Uh, as Ketridge and his team. I mean, this is absolutely, it's, it's uncomparable. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So there is, there is a, a, a totally defined, defined plan. And then, of course, in, in, in the process of rehearsing also regarding the, the capacities of the talents of actors and the, 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 there, are, there are, of course, um, interventions from, from it, but but the, the entire thing is, uh, am I wrong, William, correct me, but the entire thing is, yeah. is, is there. I mean, this is, this is of an incredible power and of incredible preciseness. Then the actual, the actual staging, work on, 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 on acting, work on, on, on expressions, work on timing with the actors, entrances, uh, and all these things, which are, which are also decisive in, in the staging of an opera, they, they are developed then in, the, in these six weeks of rehearsing. I mean, let it be said, it was our most uh, comfortable way of ever working because to have four weeks on stage, which is possible at a festival if you're at the beginning of a festival, which would be impossible in the big repertory houses where mm. you'd have a few days and then you'd be in a small rehearsal room and then shift. So that, that, that helped a lot, Marcus. Yeah, that was really a very privileged situation, I must say. Yeah. But we can't provide that all the time. <laughs> I know that. I know that. <laughs> Some practical uh, question. Do you bring your team? Do you have a big team you, you uh, worked with, your own I have team? a key team. So I have a, a video constructor, Catherine Myberg, who worked on a lot of things. Worked with Urs Schonebaum as a lighting designer in the operas. Uh, Sabine Tjernison as the scenic designer. And Greta Goyris as the costume designer, and usually with Luke DeWitt as a kind of assistant director or co-director um, who works with. So there's a team of about, and the video operator who keeps the images in sync with the music, which is a vital role. So we must be about eight people, that seven or eight people that are involved and would come for the rehearsal period. Now I look at the clock, at the watch. Uh, we um, must go, I'm, yes, I'm uh, afraid we must all leave. And I, I would like to ask one last question, maybe for Markus. Um, how did this uh, visual world of William Kentridge change your impression or change the Alban Berg music? This is this is very hard. Uh, this is very hard to answer. Um, I know I know Wozzeck very very well, and um, um, I could I could 
this is so complex this work uh, and and the grammar is is very very um, sometimes very demanding um, in general in general i think that that the visual information in Wozzeck was very very if i may say helpful for for the listener because the the whole i mean the plot is very clear in Wozzeck. Uh, the length is very comfortable for the listener i mean it's not it's not uh, exaggerating it's it's very it's, it's, uh, it's very very well made um but the grammar is is demanding yeah and you know sometimes sometimes you are you are left alone in a way uh when you see a staging which is maybe not what you what you think it should be or you, you're left alone with the music you're left alone with moments you try to to get into contact with in a way but the whole the whole set the idea of 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 Wozzeck in in Kentridge's view and Kentridge's way the costumes the the films I mean they they give I think they, they, it's very, I don't know, it's very difficult to explain, but they had also a quality of, of, the, of a sh sheltering quality, if I may say. Yeah? Um, so you were absolutely in this universe, uh, but it's the universe as, uh, it's the universe with, with tells you a lot and also gives you a lot of freedom, a lot of uh, freedom to think and to reflect also during the performance. Question is, uh, is always, I mean, music, uh, and when I, I know what I'm speaking about, when I when I propose stagings and some people say, yeah, it was it was wonderful, but I didn't understand it, <laughs> and this is something where, which leaves me always a little bit embarrassed because understanding is something so incredibly uh, subjective and personal. I mean, there is there is a there is, might be an might be a knowledge, might be an information uh, through a, through the program or through a kind of lecture we give before an opera. But still, there is there is a um, there is a sense. I mean, at, at a certain point, you are alone in a concert, and the magic moment. And this is the most beautiful thing a, a director can can achieve or can provide. And this was the case in Botzik. The magical moment is when the whole audience, the whole venue, the whole audience becomes one one ear and one eye. I mean, so and this is what I said because there is a kind of also forgive me with a sheltering quality with this with this uh, information with this. You, you're not you're not alone in this moment. I mean, you are so involved in this in this universe and this sometimes, um, um, as I said before, with Winterreise, it's sometimes nearly a parallel composition, which in a miraculous way uh, never, never leaves the, the essence of a piece, never, never, ever. And this is something which is very, very uh, seldom. But this is something which also if the one or the other listener might be a little bit, yeah, intimidated by this by this setting, but at a certain point you are you are into this into this world, and and you can't you can't leave it, you can't, and and this is the experience. I I had a lot of conversations after the Wozzeck here in Salzburg, and a lot of reactions also. Uh, very enthusiastic reactions, uh, very uh, interesting reactions also. I mean, you don't have, usually you don't have interesting reactions in, in, on that level when you, when you propose, uh, when you propose a staging, you have, you have uh, very, um, most of the time you have very predictable reactions. And what I experienced with, with Wozzeck and Salzburg uh, for the audience was very unpredictable. And this is, uh, I think, a great quality. Unpredictable, unpredictable, but never, never loses the the essence, the the center of um, of what it is about in this in the in Büchner's in Büchner's Wozzeck and Berg's Wozzeck. Now we all want to see it, <laughs> but it's yeah. not on stage anywhere, isn't it? So, oh, William, uh, will you come to Hamburg, yeah. please, and uh, yes. do something with George? Currently, the exhibition reopens very soon. It is already. 
you can see it, it already. Now. And okay. we are very much hoping that many, many, many people can see it until August now. Yes. So I will win it when I can, most probably in May, I will make my way to Europe. If Europe will accept anyone from South Africa with our COVID variant, that yeah. is the, it's the only thing that's holding me back is the, um, the unwillingness of many countries in Europe to allow us to travel. But I will certainly be coming to Hamburg. And is Thank you all very much. On the progr program, anything planned? There's a, there's a film uh, which accompanies the Shostakovich Symphony that's under construction at the moment. And there are early conversations about new operas. But Wozzeck will be performed. I think it gets performed. I'm not supposed to, I don't know yet if it's announced or not announced, but there are other opera houses that are going to take the production. So it will be viewable again. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you very, very much for thank joining us, much. for your thank big you. art. It's a present for us. So, and, and everybody who watches this, thank you for your interest and thank you for joining us. This part of our symposium gives the audience the privilege to visit the studio of William Kentridge in Johannesburg. The artist himself takes us on a tour and gives us insights into his studio and his access in art making. For Cantrell, the studio is a space for experimentation which allows for doubt and uncertainty. It has always been the center of Cantrell's artistic practice. The studio is a place for images to separate into different mediums and merge into one another. Etchings, lithographs, silk screen prints, painted bronze sculptures, drawings, experiments in three-dimensional drawing, preliminary work for different projects or models, for upcoming exhibitions, productions or installations. In the form of thoughts, reports, photographs, images, books, the outside world is invited into this safe space. The studio constitutes a machine for thinking. So let's take a look around the cosmos of William Kentridge. I'm extremely happy and very grateful, dear William, that you open your doors for us and invite us into your studio. It is a very special pleasure to follow you on this tour. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. This is William Kentridge in my studio in Johannesburg. I'm really sorry that it's not possible to be in Hamburg and that it's not possible at the moment for you to be in your own museum at the Dachterhallen. But this talk, I hope, will do something to explain some of the work that I make and the context we are in. It's filmed in my studio in Johannesburg, which is in the garden of my house. And I've been working here for the last 20 years or so. Yesterday marked the start or marked the anniversary of the COVID lockdown in South Africa, more or less the same time as most lockdowns in, in Europe. And it's, for all of us, been an extraordinary year um, in many different ways. It's the year that my father turned 98, a new granddaughter was born uh, to us, who is now nearly one, a real COVID baby. It's been a period in which travel around the world to exhibitions, to performances has been impossible, so, which is paradoxical. On the one hand, many of the projects I do are performance-based, and I'm acutely aware for all my, of, that all my colleagues who are performers, dancers, actors, it's been a calamitous year without the possibility of an income, but also without the possibility of practicing their métier, being in their studios, being able to do performances. Whereas for me, it's been a kind of blessing. I've had a year unbroken in my studio, which is the first time I've had this for 45 years. Um, and it's been possible to do projects that could not have been started really under the normal run of things. The main lockdown project I've been working on for the last year and which will continue toward, to, towards the end of this year is a series of films about what happens in the studio, 
Each film is about 40 minutes long. And it's been a period of me to interrogate what the studio means. This is where I've spent the year. And what are the things one can learn from the studio, from being in the studio. So there will be nine episodes, or eight or nine episodes, and five of them are finished, and the sixth one is nearly done. And the first one talks about the studio as a kind of expanded head. The metaphor is the studio as a head. So it talks about instead of ideas in one's head moving the two or three centimeters from one part of the brain to another, from a memory section to active processing parts, instead of that movement, in the studio we have the walk from one wall to the other, from the front to the back, and instead of the thoughts and memories in different parts of one's brain, there are different drawings and reference material um, in the studio. Um, and so the, the walk across the studio from a drawing which was done a month ago to a project which is underway now to something that I'm still beginning to conceive becomes a kind of... I would not say a philosophical walk, but a walk in which there is both the peripheral vision of things that you see through the corner of one's eyes, but also allied to that a kind of peripheral thinking. So that there are things at the edges of ideas, ideas from previous projects, from emails, from photostats, from newspaper headlines, that float at the edge of consciousness and one relies on this, or I rely on these, to consolidate themselves into different images or projects. And so the studio is both a physical space and a metaphoric space. It's the physical space of making, of, of charcoal, the materials I work with, or collage, or paper, wood, all these different materials. But it's also a metaphoric space of making meaning and of thinking in material. In other words, there's an impulse at the start of a project always, there's some thought, but then that thought gets elaborated in the physical process of making. So that there's something in what your hand does with the piece of charcoal as it gets manipulated and moved that actually changes the idea. Because a drawing is always a conversation between an impulse, a first thought, and then what actually happens on the paper. And that conversation of what you thought you've done, but what you've actually done, what the drawing needs, what you think you need, takes ideas on a different route, and often things that are at the periphery, at the edges of what you're thinking about, come into the center and become the heart of the project. So that was the first, uh, the first episode of these, of these series of films called Studio Life. The second episode was about memory and landscape. So it's about the physical making of a landscape such as the, the drawing over here with its different, uh, the hole in the ground, the text and the text there breathe and hold and tarry are obviously phrases that are going through one's head at this time, particularly that the word breathe became an important marker for me, an important phrase, because it's, it both refers to the Black Lives Matter moment, the man who's suffocated by having a policeman's knee on his neck, but also to the disease of COVID itself, of people who are drowning in their lung, drowning through not being able to, to breathe. And thirdly, I guess, through the sense that we are in now of the need of the earth to breathe and the choking we're doing of the earth itself. So that comes in as one of the phrases in the, in the drawing. And the landscape becomes, it's both the drawing of the landscape around Johannesburg. <coughs> Could you get me some water, Chris? I'm assisted here in this lecture by Chris Waldo de Vett, who is operating cameras and now <coughs> getting me a sip of water. We'll pause. Thank you. So, 
landscape and memory. It's both about a physical landscape, but it's also about the way in which a landscape is connected to our thoughts about memory. Connected to it in the sense that we're aware of the fickleness of our memory, that we ought to remember things, but somehow they fade away. An emotion felt extremely strongly, a few years later can be remembered, but not felt in the same way. And you have to work to retrieve that emotion in the way that a landscape where something has happened, over years overgrows it, erodes it, and the event starts to disappear. So there's a connection between <coughs> what it is to think about landscape and to think about memory. So landscapes becomes a medium, landscape drawing becomes a medium of thinking about memory. And the fact that you can do this easy erasure of charcoal, that your drawing can change, that you can film the changes and it becomes an animated film, also in a way is both about a physical change in a landscape, but it's also about the ephemerality of memory. The fact that we want to hold something and we can't. And the whole question of drawings that change, of animation, which is one of the main ways I've worked in the last 30 years, through a process of making a drawing and altering the drawing and refilming it and re-altering and refilming it, has made me come to understand or to feel the world much more as process than fact. So you have a fact of this table, for example, a solid table here that I'm sitting at. And one can think of the fact of a table. I don't deny that there is a table here in front of me. I'm not claiming that it only exists as a category or as a concept. It's not that sense of it, not believing in it. I believe in the table, but I believe more in the process of the table, in the moment of the table. And moment's a category we'll come back to. Because you can think of this as just a table, as a photograph would be, but if you're doing an animated drawing, it's possible to think of the table and to run the table backwards into its planks and the planks backwards into the tree and the tree back into a sapling into the ground or forward from this table eventually being carried out of the studio, cut up into pieces, put into a bonfire and ending up as smoke and ashes. So all of those are contained within the table and what the animation, the process or the heart of animation, which is a process of showing transformation that one can understand in the making of the animation, of the change from a drawing from one state to another, the sense of the world as in process. And that all moments of solidity or clarity are moments. Anyway, that was the second episode. The third episode concerned fate and one's relationship to one's own mortality. And in this, there somehow seemed to be a lot of drawings of trees and of leaves. And this came from a story about the Sibyl who would write your fate on a leaf, and you would go to find your leaf from the Sibyl, but a wind would blow the leaves around, and you never knew if you were getting your fate or someone else's fate. So it was about mortality and fate, but it was examined through a series of performances and drawings of trees and swirling, swirling leaves. There's a way in which, in the studio, although it's not a direct ostensible subject, there's a connection to the openness that a studio has to have and the openness that has to exist in the psychoanalytic process. So it's certainly not that the studio is analyzing me or that I'm hoping for a solution to neurotic symptoms through the process of working in the studio. But there's things that we learn from psychoanalysis. In the relationship between the analyst and the patient, there has to be an open space in which free association can take place, in which a patient can say whatever comes into their mind, and through that, different elements and phrases and ideas will start to emerge. In the same way in the studio, there needs to be an open space for experimentation, 
for giving the image the benefit of the doubt and seeing what emerges from the work. The fourth episode was about the self-portrait, which is to say about the self, about the division of the self. And in the studio, this is, is very easy and very clear. You have, on the one hand, a self who is busy making a drawing. And on the other hand, you have a self who looks at the one who's made the drawing and is usually very critical of what's been made and gives instructions to the first self to improve it. And the first self who may take the advice from the artist as viewer and change the drawing. But there's always a tension between the making and the viewing, the making and the assessing of what has been made. That was the fourth episode. The fifth episode was about translation, about what it is to translate something from one form, from one medium into another medium, from sound into image, from word into image, from movement into color. All the different kinds of transformations, which are not literal translations, but which involve a new energy being given to an original idea by the new form in which it is expressed. In the same way that when you translate from one language to another, it's not so much if you're translating from German into Zulu that you want to find the German inside the Zulu, rather you hope that in the act of translation, the Zulu will give you a new insight and revive the German. It's an inversion of the way one normally thinks about um, translation. And in the studio, the translation is always about learning something new, finding something new, not simply finding an equivalent. So we made translations of dances into a movement. Um, of, we made translations of language into language. Uh, for example, into the Ursonata of Kurt Schwitters, written a great poem of sounds written between 1922 and 32 that he then recited at different events throughout the rest of his life. But it's a language of sounds hovering at the end of sense, so like Fums bovata tsau bogif. And so on. It's not that it's just a joke of language. It shows us, I suppose, the limits of where meaning resides in, in language. In the same way, the limits of where meaning resides in this ostensible image drawn. When you draw a tree, Yes, it is a tree, but there are so many other associations that spread out from the tree. So let's think about what it is to draw the tree. On the one hand, we have a tree which might be in my garden, might be somewhere in the bushveld outside Johannesburg. And you can say, yes, it's a Camille Dürrenbaum, or it's a white stinkwood, or whatever the tree is. But as you start to recognize the trunk and the branches, and what's in the tree. Out of that spread so many other associations. It's images of other trees you've seen, whether they're of Jacques Calon, people hanging from the tree in the 400, 500 years ago, or whether it's more southern fruit hanging from southern trees in America, or in a Mbinda cemetery in which broken pottery vessels would be put below a tree to mark a gravesite or whether it's the tree you remember climbing as a child. All of these things are in your head. Each person has their own individual vocabulary of different trees. And so when you see the image of the tree, the tree comes towards you, the image of the tree, but onto the image of the tree come all your projections, all your memories, all your associations. And so the tree, as it enters you, is always a negotiation between yourself, the edges of yourself, and what's outside you in the world. And that's what I'm interested in drawing a tree. Not that it's only the associations, not that it's purely the tree, but that it opens up a space for this understanding of where the world ends and we begin. 
there's a there's both a statistical term and a neurological term called a Markov blanket. And Markov was, I think, a statistician in the 19th century, early 20th century, who worked out that if random numbers or objects gather, they make a kind of protective barrier around themselves, which is sensitive to what is outside them, but knows their edge. And that's obviously what we have as human beings. We are we are in ourselves, we, have a, we are able to sense what's outside us. It's cold, it's too hot, but we are aware of what our edge is. And this conversation with outside is what keeps us alive, is what enables us to fight entropy, to say, I'm hungry, there's something in me that needs to eat to support the body. It's too hot, I take off a jersey. It's too cold, I put a jersey on. So the sense of what is this edge of who we are and what the rest of the outside world is. And in a way, a drawing, it's not a Markov blanket, but it refers to the similar edge of what we understand and who we are. That's gone a long way from the episodic series, but it's, it's one of the ideas. And the sixth one, the episode that I'm working on at the moment, is called As If. And this is an episode which is about provisional meaning which is an expansion of what I was talking about earlier. It's about coherence coming to an image or to an object for a moment and then disappearing. So all the different facts we have about history can be put into a line so that we understand that history. But if we pass that, suddenly a whole new series of thoughts are there and we have to reconstruct another provisional coherence. So in the long term, it's an argument against certainty. And this is both an aesthetic question, but it's an ethical and also a political question. That we understand certainty in politics has always been very connected to authoritarianism, to insisting on one way of understanding the world, rather than understanding that's one possible construction of the world. So these are the ideas that have been in my head working on the episodic series. And there are different um, images at the moment. As I said, I'm working on episode six. And so it has to do with many different things. It has to do with a kind of anamorphosis in which we understand how we construct the world. Normally one thinks that we receive the world and there's information there to be there's information there to be found and absorbed. But what the animal focus does, which is a distorted image which is corrected through one technique or another, in this case it's corrected by a cylindrical mirror, what the animal focus does is it shows us that the act of making coherence is something that we do we have agency in making sense of the world. So one starts with a very distorted, incomprehensible drawing. And in the mirror, this drawing gets a coherence, it gets condensed, curved lines become straight lines, and in the mirror we see a coherence. But we are aware that that is only in our vision. Only in our eyesight do the lines come together to correct the distortion. And we are aware, therefore, of our, the activity we have in making coherence, not simply receiving coherence. It's the same with a, with a stereoscope, where I... I have a stereoscope and I look through it and I'm completely aware that there are two flat images, two two-dimensional images. But when I look through it, those two images start off separated and blurred and as I allow my eyes to relax, 
They suddenly fit into one image and we have the illusion of depth. And that's an extraordinary moment because it's a moment in which you suddenly become aware of your brain as a muscle. That it's done the work of pulling these two images in and creating only in your head the sense of depth. So normally when we go through the world we say, yes, we're seeing depth, this is the depth in the world. When in fact we know we're seeing a flat image on the retina of one eye and a flat image on the retina of the other and our brain combines them and gives them a sense of depth. So what happens in the studio is that this invisible natural process becomes demonstrable. So that's another moment of a kind of provisional coherence. There would be other ones when you might start with a, an image that has the appearance of a leaf, but as you turn it, it changes form. So this is, there's a kind of a pleasure in what the sculpture actually is. This is a piece of cardboard and paper, but it may yet become turned into sheet metal or steel or even into a kind of thin bronze to play with it. And what it's, obviously you see it once as a leaf and you can see it once as the ampersand, but it's always at its most interesting when it's out of alignment. When you can see in it the image working towards a comprehensibility, working towards being understood. And there are a number of sculptures which have to do with chaos which finds a coherence at a, at a certain point. There's also a working this week on a, on a drawing of a tree. And it both has to do with associations with the with the tree, with thoughts which are going through my head at the moment. But in this particular case, I'm interested in thinking of the appearance of the tree in a slightly different way. I was talking to uh, a friend and asked him what he was doing. And he said he was making a tree search. And I thought, I don't know what a tree search is. And then immediately I thought, oh, yes, of course, a tree search, it's an internet term. It's a, it's a way of looking up a subject, doing investigations into a subject. You have a trunk of the main subject and subsidiary branches that uh, grow out, that give you detailed information on sub-subjects of the main thing you're investigating and finer branches that connect across so you can make a link from one thought to another and the leaves are like dialogue boxes. All of this is, of course, obviously a tree search. And then at the end of the conversation, I said to him, so what are you, what are you researching? And he said, what do you mean what am I researching? And I said, you said you were making a tree search. And he said, no, I didn't. I said I was making a t-shirt. So, the question is, what happened to me in that moment? Firstly, there was the sense of being stupid. I didn't know what a tree search was. And obviously, there was an anxiety and a panic about this. And then in that moment, generated by that anxiety, by that panic about being ignorant or stupid, all psychic energy came together to construct this possible meaning, this possible coherence of what was being said. In this case, this tree search. And so the drawing, in a way, is trying to see how does one have a sense of that idea coming into being? And it's a question of, is it a quick animation? Does the whole thing dissolve? So the question turns from this sensation I had in the story I've told you to a formal one of what speed should the animation be? Is the dissolve four frames? Is the dissolve six frames, ten frames between images? And that's something that I'm in the middle of this week. So we're still editing it. We still will discover how it works within the, within the film.
Um, also this week there's a project, and maybe here you can switch on the other camera, Chris, as well. And this is just to give a sense of the, of the week, of reworking and working on some tapestry designs. So a design like this, which is a collage of this figure based on a figure from uh, an orator from an Italian factory in the 1950s and a map of China will be woven by a tapestry studio outside Johannesburg. And it's one of several. So they start as a collage of this size and they will end up as a tapestry of three meters by three meters, something of that, of that nature. There's a, a larger one that will be, you must probably make this about six meters by three meters. Um, it's a mixture of a map, and I love a map because of the found color, the particular quality of these Chinese maps, which are bus maps from the 1960s, the acid pink and yellow, or these other maps which have a different period in their colors. And this is an image of refugees, I suppose, on the Mediterranean, and it's a mixture of a Roman quinquireme, or or trireme of different layers of oarsmen rowing it and of contemporary refugees trying to cross the Mediterranean. It's based on a drawing that was done on the walls of the Tiber River in a project that I did maybe five or six years ago, but it will have a new life as this, as this tapestry. And this making of collages is obviously a very natural way to work with, with tapestry for me usually collages of maps and other images. And the glue in this case that holds these fragments together gets eradicated by the continuous thread of the tapestry. And tapestries are interesting because on the one hand it's a very ancient technique, a way of having movable murals to warm freezing castles in Europe. They were the most valuable art objects of their era because they were so labor intensive in making them. A tapestry was much more valuable than any painting. But they also become kind of movable murals, something that can fill a wall but then be rolled up and taken away. And that's very much a contemporary phenomenon with what projection has become, where you can have a film that fills a wall and then it's switched off and shown somewhere else. And also, they're very digital in the sense there's a decision on each row and line of threads. And the tapestry, in effect, is made up by thousands of pixels of individual decisions of where a color will end and new color will begin. It's nothing like the smudge of oil paint or even of charcoal, which is why the hard edgedness of, of collage seems to me appropriate. This is another one which we will be working on, which are three widows from Lampedusa, also relating to the refugees crossing to Europe and attempting to cross to Europe in the last five or ten years. So that's one of the other, these all need to be reworked and rethought slightly. That's one of the projects for the week ahead. And the, the last project that I'll talk about, which is also a project that's ongoing at the moment, um, in which I'm most involved with, is a project of a film connected to a Shostakovich symphony, the 10th symphony, which was finished in 1953, which is to say a few months after the death of Stalin. And so it's a film, although it's a film to accompany a symphony, which will very much take as its language and its area of thinking questions of that whole history of what happened from the death of Stalin backwards, I guess, to the beginning of the revolution in Russia. So the main characters would be, of course, Lenin and Mayakovsky, the great poet, and Lily Brick, Mayakovsky's lover, and Stalin and Trotsky, <coughs> as two other star-crossed lovers, and to Shostakovich and Stalin, as I've said. But it's a way of working, it's a new way of thinking for me, it's a way of working with small cardboard models of a kind of abandoned museum, I suppose, through which either a cell phone camera moves or another GoPro tiny camera will move through the model to make the model appear enormous. 
and we will then populate it with performances that are either done by puppets, you know, kind of very simple puppets, or other puppets, trying to create kind of the world of Mayakovsky, which is the starting point for me of a world in which a character can just be a pair of feet or just a pair of trousers, and to see how we operate and how we put these into how we will put these into the model. So it's both a thinking, in this case, in physical material. The puppets that we have are made by the costume designer that I work with, Greta Goiris. So if we have a... These are both puppets of this scale, but they also become thoughts about full-size costumes for actors to wear. What would it be to make a paper puppet, or paper flat puppet, and then to enlarge that to human scale and have someone inside it, someone playing Lenin inside a paper costume, someone playing Mayakovsky inside a paper costume. And so for this we're also thinking, if you have a paper costume, what do you do with the head? And then I'm thinking, do we make big cardboard heads that somebody wears in front of them, or do we work with photographic uh, images or collages which we can digitally impose on, on a puppet? So you might start with, these are all just collages underway at the moment, thinking of different ways of representing, in this case, Mayakovsky, the poet, whether it's a mixture of the photographic, or something more abstract. There's a kindness of, there's a kind of openness of thinking of what might be possible. And it's in a way allowing the hands to do the thinking of seeing what these different pieces can do. That may be an interesting, and we can shift between a photographic image to a to the abstract as the puppet moves. So it becomes a new way of thinking both about how to make a portrait, new ways of thinking about what constitutes a head or a face, as well as what will the movement be and what will the what will the puppets be in the piece. And it's it's an interesting one because the Provocation is not a piece of theatre, but a piece of music. You will see, an audience will see the symphony orchestra playing the symphony, and behind the symphony will be the film projected. So it has to be a film that can fit within the logic of the music. That is to say, not a narrative, but something with a structure and an arc. So my sense at the moment is of going past different rooms in this model museum, and catching glimpses of different people or things inside those rooms, a pair of feet in one room, a strange music stand pup in another room. There's no script, there won't be a script or a storyboard written in advance. We'll have elements of the cardboard models, we'll have some of the puppets, we'll have some costumes for actors to work in that will get placed inside the model, and then we'll gradually discover the structure and the form 
of the piece without necessarily knowing it in advance. This is the, the shape of the week's work and the current work in the, in the studio. Chris will kindly shoot some close-ups of some of the other images to give you a better sense and then do the good work of putting together what I've been saying with some of these images. And I hope this has given you, in a rushed way, a sense of the way in which the studio becomes a machine for thinking, both for playing, certainly, but the connection between play and thought, uh, as Gadamer taught us, is very, is very important, to be open to the Tumorplatz, the place of jousting, of experimentation, of finding, and through that arriving at something which has a, a weight, if not a coherence. Or if it has a coherence, it does not have a definitive meaning. And that's the, both the hope and the work of the studio. It's now uh, 2 p.m. It's time for me to cook for the large family dinner we will have tonight to mark the Jewish Passover. My job is to make the dessert. But meringues will take a while, so I need to leave off and go and do that. But to thank you very much for your attention, those of you who stayed on your screens to the end, to thank you for your persistence. And for the others who saw fragments of it, to thank you for seeing the fragments. Fragments are always good because then you can imagine what the rest that you didn't see might have been. Thank you all.